What if Naruto was neglected by his family hated everything part 1? Naruto Uzumaki had spent six years of his life being neglected and slowly being forgotten by his parents. It used to be small things, such as forgetting to call him for dinner, ignoring his suggestions when going out, and never tucking him into bed at night. Eventually however, the neglect had gotten worse. His parents began to forget him more and more and eventually even forgot his birthday. The people in the village seemed to forget he was even the son of their Hokage and ignore him like any other faceless orphan child of the village. After his forgotten fifth birthday he began to truly raise himself. He cooked his own meals at odd hours to not interact with his family and started to read books on ninja basics. He studied the basics relentlessly to prepare for the academy at age 8. He knew he couldn't count on his parents for training, if he couldn't trust them to remember his birthday how could he trust them to train him? He knew that they had already started training Shio at age 5. When he asked them to help him train they simply glanced at him and told him he would be trained at the academy and Shio needed extra help to control the Kyubi. It was at that point he lost all faith in his parents and he started to not even call them that in his head. He eventually started to leave the estate and train on his own. He soon learned he had a knack for chakra control as he mastered the basic leaf sticking exercise on his fourth try. He eventually got so good at the exercise he could stick more than 10 leafs to his body at a time. However he knew he would need more instruction than just basic scrolls. He soon started sneaking into Minato's library and stole numerous scrolls on the basics. As he completed more of the chakra control exercises he learned that unlike his mother and sister he did not have too much chakra. He still had an above average level for his age, as expected of any Uzumaki, but not enough for it to be unmanageable. He was reading a specific exercise called tree walking. There were no trees large enough in the estate to really learn the exercise so he excited the gate and went to the surrounding forest of the Uzumaki estate. He packed a backpack full of items that he would need, a change of clothes, some food, some kanai, shuriken, a bedroll, and some jutsu scrolls from Minato's private library. He was planning on sleeping outside tonight and get away from the estate, it's not like they would remember him anyway. He reached his usual training clearing and prepared to get to work. He had stolen some useful jutsu from Minato. He had stolen the instructions for Cage Bushin no Jutsu, Cage Shuriken no Jutsu, Water Walking, Tree Walking, Kawamari no Jutsu, Henge no Jutsu, Bushin no Jutsu, and a stolen Suna scroll on how to create chakra strings. He had also managed to find some of Tsunade's training scrolls on medical jutsu. He assumed that it was a gift to Minato that he never used. He knew that some of the jutsu were beyond him at the moment. He barely had enough chakra to create one cage bushin. But he figured out with just one cage bushin he could train twice as fast and increase his reserves at the same time. He already knew what he wants to focus on in his ninja career. Whatever Minato and Kashina were bad at he would specialize in. He knows that Minato and Kashina are really bad at medical arts, genjutsu, and poisons. He only wished that Tsunade hadn't left the village after she healed Kashina from the extraction of the Kyubi. Though he was doubtful that Tsunade would want to teach him, most likely she would just focus on Shio like Jiraiya and Kakashi. He quickly got to work on tree climbing. He knows that theoretically if he masters tree climbing he can master any jutsu or at least that's what it says in the description. After several tries he found that tree climbing was not that hard. He did not know if it was because of the level of difficulty of the exercise or if he just had good control of his chakra. He trained with tree walking for several hours, slowly being able to walk up the tree without much focus. After his 50th repetition of the exercise he was quite exhausted. He knew it was thanks to his inherited Uzumaki stamina that he had managed to last for so long. As he drank some water he decided to visit the library, a place of solace for him when the neglect gets too much. He wanted to read some medical textbooks to try and get an early start on his medical education. He wanted to at least be able to patch up basic wounds by the time he enters the academy. He enters the library and smiles at the old librarian. The librarian, Yui Haruka, is a retired chunin of the village, with graying brownish hair, large thick glasses, she looked like every other common grandmother. She had been a friend of Naruto since he had started coming here at age 5. She was one of the only villagers who actually pays attention to him. He walked silently to the medical section. Many of the more advanced books were safely stored at the hospital, however there were many books that explained basic medical practices left in the library for aspiring students. 
The library also had a wide selection of anatomy, botany, biology, and science textbooks for civilian students. Naruto proved his prodigious intellect as he understood the medical texts. After recovering enough chakra he had already made a cage bushin and had it read a book on the human anatomy while he read the basics of medical chakra. The book described medical chakra as purified spiritual energy. This purified spiritual energy enters the dead or dying cells of the target and reactivates them, quickly healing the target. However one must have great chakra control and mental focus to use these techniques because an overflux of medical chakra could kill the cells instead of healing them. The book mentioned some famous applications of healing chakra, such as Tsunade's legendary strength by separating her chakra into spiritual and physical energy. He decided that one of his goals would be to eventually recreate Tsunade's strength. He looked out the window and sat that it was getting rather late, the library would be closing soon. He released his clone and closed his eyes to absorb the information from his doppelganger. It appeared that the clone discovered all of the pressure points of the body, the seven critical spots of the body, and what the chakra system looks like in the human body. It was quite fascinating. He returned to his spot in the woods and after eating a light meal of bread and cheese, went to sleep. The next day 6 a.m. village forest. Naruto woke up to see it was very dark and cloudy today. It was probably going to rain. He quickly packed all of his belongings in his pack and quickly ran back to the estate, hoping to miss the rain. As he was about to open the gate he noticed something wrong right when he tried to open it. It would not open. Growing slightly desperate he tugged harder on the gate. It remained firmly closed. He tried to think of why the gate wouldn't open and his eyes widened. Today was October 1st. Minato always redrew the seals on the estate by the end of each month. One of the seals identified who was allowed into the estate by their chakra signature. Minato must have forgotten to input him into the defenses. He knew that Minato would already be in his office, and that Kashina would be making breakfast for Shio soon. He stood there for a few minutes silently as it started to rain. He looked up at the sky and saw it was starting to pour, drenching him. He knew he was finally fully forgotten by the Namikaze family. He wondered why this information hurt him as much as it did. He knew this day would occur eventually. Ever since his fifth birthday he had been preparing for the day his parents abandoned him. He had stocked enough non-perishable food at a cave near the glade he trains in to last him at least two years. As he stood there in the rain his anger and hatred grew for the family. He would not beg or yell at that man to let him back into the house. He didn't care that he had no resources or backing from any family anymore. He decided to get revenge on his former family. He knew that this goal would be nearly impossible. The Namikaze Uzumaki family was loved throughout the land of fire. Minato was loved by the daimyo and would never hear a bad word against him. He also knew that when Shio entered the academy no one would say anything bad to her. However he didn't care, he would gain revenge in any way he could. The only possible method to do so in his eyes was to be better than Shio. If he was better than Shio he could prove to everyone in the village he didn't deserve to be forgotten. That he was just as important than the princess of Kohona. He started to walk back to the forest knowing he had to find shelter from the rain. He knew of a cave near the glade he was in that he can take shelter in. After the rain passes he could figure out what to do. Hidden Cave 7 AM. As he rested inside the cave he used some chakra control exercises to dry his clothes and body from the rain. He had rarely entered this cave never finding much need to. The cave was the perfect hideout. The natural formation of the trees and shrubbery effectively hid the entrance while a rock formation around the cave hide it from view even further. But now it was his home for the foreseeable future and he decided to explore it. As he walked down the cave he noticed that the floor was gradually getting smoother and the walls more box shape as he slowly walked deeper into the cave. Eventually he arrived at a steel door, slightly rusted with age. He tried to open the door but it was locked. He used a trick he discovered from breaking into Minato's library so often. He formed a small chakra string and inserted it into the lock. He started to pump chakra into the string and it expanded into the shape of the key. Slowly turning it he heard a click and the door opened inward. The room inside looked like an abandoned laboratory, filled with jars of animal parts, preserved plants, and many other unknown objects. He looked around a bit more and found a desk next to a distilling station with a journal resting on it. He started to read some of the first pages. January 5th. I recently found a cave that will be perfect for my poison and medical studies. Here I will be able to start my path to power. 
The snake Sanin, Orochimaru. January 10th. I have begun testing on small animals my snakes have brought to me. Many of my poisons are still too messy. I have begun to experiment with different venoms and plants to create the perfect poison. February 2nd. I have done it. I have made the perfect poison. After several minutes of applying the poison it remains completely undetectable for several hours before the animals die of a heart attack. I cannot be sure if the result will have the same effects on humans. I do not wish to be discovered by bringing local bandits to this laboratory. Perhaps some of the children of the civilians of the village can assist me in my projects. Naruto nearly dropped the journal in shock, he had found one of Orochimaru's hidden laboratories. He knew who the snake Sanin was through Minato's library. He had read about the monstrosities this man had committed against the citizens of Kohona. However, as he stared at the journal he knew this could be the key in giving him an edge over Shio. He knows that Shio will be getting tutoring from at least four cage level ninjas. By the time Shio graduates she will probably be high chunin level, even more so if she proves to be a prodigy like her father. He knows to be better than her he would need a serious edge. An edge that could be gained from this laboratory. But could he lower himself to accept tutoring, even indirectly, from one of the most monstrous missing nin in the elemental nations? He looked at more of the passages in the journal, all describing horrific experiments and poisons that could kill anyone. He contemplated on how far he would be willing to go for his revenge. He looked around the lab seeing all of the tools available to him if he accepted this dark path. He started remember all of the times his family had forgotten him. He remembered when his family went to the Kayubi festival forgetting him at the house. He remembered watching his family eating dinner, all laughing together as a family. He remembered watching from his window as Minato and Kashina began Shio's training, forgetting him entirely. He finally remembered him standing out in the rain, completely forgotten and abandoned. Naruto looked around the lab once more, seeing instructions for high-level poison making, high-level medical techniques, chemistry sets, gas masks, syringes, and then looked to the far wall where three practice dummies were kept and imagined the faces of his family on them, never looking at him and treating him like a stranger and he felt his hatred grow further. He looked at the journal in his hand and accepted the fact that he was going to walk down this dark path. He walked to the door and closed it, locking it from the inside. And when he exited the laboratory, he would be a changed person. Hidden Laboratory, Konoha, five months after the start of training. Naruto was obsessed. He had learned much in the five months he had begun studying in the laboratory. He had learned almost all of the basic poisons from the ingredients he was able to locate from the surrounding forest. He had relentless LT worked on his chakra control with the tree walking and water walking exercises. He now was able to summon three shadow clones to train alongside of him. One shadow clone would work on chakra control while the other two continued their medical and poison studies. He had finished reading Orochimaru's journal. He was absolutely disgusted by some of the experiments conducted by Orochimaru. Apparently he would experiment on humans and catalog their reactions to his poisons. He learned to prevent queasiness after the first chapter. However, he kept telling himself that he needs to continue this path to continue his dream of revenge. After the first few months of studying Orochimaru's poisons he was almost glad that Orochimaru had finished his experiments before he was forced out of Konoha. His effort is his benefit. His poisons seem to have more uses than just killing. He seemed to divide his poisons into three categories, fatal, non-fatal, and other use. His fatal poisons were among the most numerous, ranging from poisons that would kill you upon injection to poisons that could remain docile for days before killing the target. His non-fatal poisons were very wide-ranged. The effects ranged from sleeping drafts to bottled madness, think the berserker poison from AC. Some of the poisons even did the reverse of poisons and seemed to heal the drinker. He wondered if those poisons would be better classified as elixirs. The section that really interested him was the other effects. The section seemed to be dedicated to enhancing the body through poisoning oneself. However some of the poisons had strong side effects. One even turned the body into a mummified husk after the effects wore off. He decided to not try any of these poisons until he had a much stronger body, mind, and much more chakra control. The journal mentioned that if one constantly poisoned oneself with minor venoms it could help negate poisoning oneself. His indirect sensei wrote that it would help build up the immune system. He soon found however that most minor poisons had almost no effect on him. 
He assumed this was due to being a half Uzumaki. Abusing this genetic trait he constantly poisoned himself with minor to medium level poisons, gradually increasing his resistance to different venoms. He had also found several books on sealing in the laboratory. He contemplated learning the art a long time, since it was Minato's speciality. However as he reviewed some of Orochimaru's greatest works he realized he would need a good foundation in sealing to accomplish them. Such as the legendary curse seals that were briefly mentioned in the journal. Before he knew it five months had already gone by in the laboratory. He had mastered most of the basics of being a ninja. His chakra control was high genin level. His medical skills were enough to be able to patch up most minor wounds. He had learned to create many of the basic to medium poisons listed in the several texts that Orochimaru left behind. However he knows that the basics were not enough and that he needed to learn more advanced techniques to defeat his sister. Namikaze Uzumaki Estate. Konoha, five months after Naruto left, Shio POV. Shio had learned much from her four tutors. She was already starting the basics of Kenjutsu, chakra control, hand seals, and sealing. Despite all of the positive attention from the villagers and her parents she was not spoiled. Her Ka-san would murder her if she acted like a spoiled clan heiress. However, she still acted arrogant around other children. She deserved to act arrogant because she was better than them. Her two san had introduced her to a new chakra control exercise yesterday, the tree walking exercise. She was having a lot of difficulty completing it. Her two san always told her that it was because of her large chakra reserves. But she had already gotten halfway up the tree. She bet no one has been able to complete this exercise faster. She knows she will be super strong by the time she is ready for the academy. She would beat down all of the other students and make her way to becoming Hokage. Dadbeo. Forest of Death. Konoha, one year and five months after the start of training, Naruto POV. It had been one year since Naruto had mastered the basics. He had grown a little and was now age seven and a half. He had changed greatly over the year. Due to lack of sleep and from being around so many poisons his eyes had lost their pupils, I have no idea if this is possible but so many Naruto characters don't have pupils so I assume that is the cause, and his hair had gone from a sunny blonde to an almost white color. Due to careful combing his hair had gradually lost its signature spikiness and he had grown his hair in two long bangs on the side of his face with a short ponytail. He was now wearing a hooded fur-lined coat, black shinobi pants, black medical wrap around his arms, and dark green shinobi sandals. He carried a satchel lines with storage seals to carry all of his supplies, it's a satchel not a purse. He also wore a gas mask loose around his neck, almost acting as a face mask as it covered half his face. Thanks to injecting himself with so many poisons, his blood was very toxic. He had discovered this when he had accidentally cut himself and it fell on a rat he was experimenting with. The rat had suddenly started to convulse until it died several minutes later. He had also discovered that due to the toxins in his blood, it was now a pure black color. He had created a new identity in the village. He put himself down as an orphan named Menma. He had also signed up for the academy. He had contemplated just leaving the village but he had nowhere else to go. Iwa would rather kill him than let him join their village. Kumo would put him into a breeding program. Suna was allied with the leaf. And he didn't even want to think about Kiri with their civil war going on. Besides, how could he gain his revenge against the Namikaze family if he was in a different village? In the present, however, he was searching for rare plants that were required for his latest poison in the Forest of Death. The Forest of Death was named this for a reason, however due to the toxin in his blood most predators left him alone because they could smell he was dangerous and inedible. As he continued to walk into a clearing full of nightshade, a beautiful purple plant that looks like lavender, just ten times more deadly, he jumped back as a kanai flew past him into the ground. He drew a scalpel and injected a little medical chakra into it to allow it to cut easier. As he was preparing for a fight he heard a female voice laugh mockingly, Hehehehe. Does the ikal gaki want to play with me? The little gaki is not supposed to be here. Naruto looked around cautiously, trying to pinpoint the voice and spoke in his usual monotone voice, who are you, the gate was open when I arrived at this forest so I assumed it was allowed. It was true, the side gate to the forest was wide open when he was trying to break into the forest. From her hiding spot in the trees, Enko Mitarashi sweat dropped as she had forgotten to lock the gate before she had entered the forest. But she wasn't going to let any gaki talk back to her. 
She quickly shushined right behind the gaki and pointed a kanai at his cheek, going for full creepiness factor 10. She spoke seductively, menacingly in his ear and said, Well gaki my name is Mitarashi Anko and you better remember it. Now why don't you tell me who you are and why you are in this forest when it is usually restricted to chunins and janins? Naruto's eyes widen a bit, Mitarashi Anko is the name of Orochimaru's apprentice in the village. If he played his cards right this could go very good or very bad. He decided to be at least partially truthful, my name is Menma, and I am searching for rare plants to continue my studies. Anko deadpans at the seven-year-old and goes to creepiness factor 11 and uses her favorite jutsu to summon a snake to scare the kid and chuckled, you're telling me that some brat like you goes into the forest of death to find some plants for a science project. Naruto's eyes narrow a bit and started to explain what he was looking for, I'm searching for some nightshade to mix with the venom of the poisonous tree leaves often found in this forest. Anko whistled at the potency of that venom and commented, and what would a gaki like you want with a poison that could kill a grown man in a few seconds? He smiled slightly and said, it's for my fighting style, I am training myself in poisons and medical jutsu. Anko's eyes widened a bit at that information. He was teaching himself poisons and medical judas. Those two fields were some of the most underestimated fields of being a ninja. Most people just liked flashy ninjutsu or fancy taijutsu. Her eyes gleamed a bit as she looked at the young prodigy. Her creepiness factor was increasing to level 12 as she licked her lips as she stared at Naruto like a predator. He was starting to get a bit nervous as he looked at the gleam in Anko's eyes. He had heard her reputation around the village for being a bit crazy. He started backing away slowly and smiled nervously, W well I'll go. As he started to walk away he felt a hand clamp down on his head and he gulped nervously. Standing behind him is a shadowed Anko giggling creepily, he 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 well gaki if you want to be a poison user you can't find a better sensei than me. What most people did not realize about Anko is that she always wanted a student to teach her arts to. She wanted to give a student the chance to suck that Orochimaru stole from her when he abandoned her with the curse mark. So prepare yourself Gaki you will be under the supervision of the great and sexy Mitarashi Anko until you graduate from the academy. She dragged him back into the forest laughing the entire way. Naruto's only thought about the situation was, how did getting caught in the forest of death lead to this? The academy, Konoha, initiation ceremony for all new and returning students. Training with Anko sensei was a torture, ka interesting experience. He had thought he had trained hard before but Anko's training took the cake. She played games in the form of training with him. Outrun the giant snake before it eats you, identify the hidden poison in all of your food, dodge the kanai, and her personal favorite of hide and don't get caught or you will be stabbed. He can't argue with the results though. His situational awareness level had increased exponentially. He could now be aware of his situation at all times even if he was asleep. In addition Anko helped him with his toxic blood problem. She had told him it was a side effect of trying to build up one's immune system too fast. She towed him a jutsu that would detoxify his blood when not in battle, and would increase its potency during battle. She also taught him the hubby style of combat which went excellently with his chakra scalpels and poisons. The hubby style was similar to the Hyuga's gentle fist except that instead of injecting chakra to one's opponent the user injects poison through the user's attacks. The style also towed him to be extremely flexible to get into one's guard. Despite the harsh training they eventually became good friends. Near the end of their training he told Anko his true heritage. First flashback. It was the final day of training and they were both relaxing in one of the large branches in the forest of death. Anko had brought some sake and dango for them to share, one stick of dango for Naruto and the rest for Anko. Naruto was contemplating whether or not to tell Anko his heritage. She had earned his broken trust during their training and he felt slightly guilty for lying to her. He sighed and began to explain to Anko, Hey Anko, I wanted to tell you before our training ends that I haven't been exactly truthful, I am actually the forgotten son of Minato Namikaze and Kashina Uzumaki. Anko looked at Menma, his fake name, and laughed, Ha 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 yeah good one gaki. She laughed for a bit until she saw his serious face and frowned, Wait you're serious. Menma, Naruto nodded and started to tell her his life story, of being forgotten by his parents, finding the laboratory he did not say who last owned it to the present. She was stunned at first and became thoughtful for a second, I just don't get it, I've seen the Hokage's family and they act like the perfect family. 
I am a master of psychology and even I know that parents don't just abandon one kid over the other for a small thing like training one sibling. Menma frowned, he did read some psychology books and his parents did not behave as normal parents would. He pushed those thoughts to the sides and focused back on his ideas of revenge and commented bitterly, I guess they are the exception and they just didn't want a son. Anko patted Menma's shoulder comfortingly and commented, well it seems we both had sucky childhoods then, well our training is at an end for now, the academy is starting soon. I know you don't need it but good luck Gaki. She poofed away in a shushin, taking the remaining dango with her. End of flashback. He sighed and started to walk into the entrance to the academy, ready to finally prove to his family that he is not worthless. Konoha Academy, Menma's POV. The opening ceremony for the academy is an honored tradition amongst the shinobi and civilian families. It was a time to meet the teachers, scout potential talent, and hear the Hokage's speech. The adults usually congregated around the teachers, asking questions and reviewing the curriculum for their children. The older students would congregate in their already made groups while the younger ones met new people and formed new friendships. Menma looked around the festivities, feeling slightly bored. He was not here to make friends or mingle with other students. If coming to the ceremony wasn't mandatory for all new students he wouldn't have bothered to come. Soon 10 a.m. was approaching and everyone took their seats to hear the Hokage talk. Menma glared at Minato as he took the stage, he barely looked different in the two years since he last saw him. As Minato rambled on with his speech of the will of fire and protecting the village he looked around at the rest of his classmates. It appeared as if at least one of each major clan was attending. He even saw the elusive Kurama clan heiress among the people attending. He had heard of the girl, apparently she had awakened a special bloodline that turned her illusions real, at the cost of creating a separate personality. Though thanks to the quick actions of Kashina and Minato the alternate personality was sealed and she could become a shinobi. He sighed as Minato's speech ended and they all were called in for the first day of the academy. As they took their seats the teacher started rambling on about the will of fire and the grand history of Kohona. He sighed, this was going to be a long four years. Academy. Konoha, four years after Menma started the academy. It had been four long years since Menma had started the academy. It had proved to be a wonderful waste of time for the majority of the day. However he didn't complain. He knows that the academy was necessary to join the ninja ranks. He had not changed his outfit much in the last four years. He now wore a tan-colored trench coat, a gift from Anko, his gas mask on his neck, a black muscle shirt and Anbu-style pants along with regular shinobi sandals. He was the rookie of the year for all four years, much to the chagrin to all of the clan children. People were sometimes comparing him to Minato, who was an orphaned rookie of the year as well. He had not shown all of his abilities during the academy, instead demonstrated himself as a rising prodigy as a med nin and poison specialist. He had revealed Anko's training as a way to cover up the skills he did demonstrate. Right behind his spot is Neji Hayuga, a boy who kept telling him that his success is fate and that he was destined to be rookie of the year. Yeah he didn't make friends with Neji. However he surprisingly did make a few friends during his time at the academy. He had made friends with Yukumo Kurama and Rock Lee. Kurama was the Kunoichi of the year and Rock Lee was the dead last. He had already figured out that these were to be his future teammates by reviewing the previous graduating classes. Every year the rookie of the year and the Kunoichi of the year team up with the dead last. He supposed they balanced each other out, a taijutsu specialist, a genjutsu specialist, and a medical poison expert. What he did not know is that in the Hokage's office they were having a meeting about the teams right now. Hokage's office, Minato's POV. All of the potential Jonin senseis were in the room along with the Hokage and Academy teachers as they reviewed the graduates of the year. Minato cleared his throat and began the meeting, we have 30 potential graduates this year, I am glad the Academy curriculum has managed to produce so many potential ninjas. The Academy professors glowed with pride that they were able to teach the next generation. Now let's start with Team 1, they discussed the teams briefly and matched personalities until they arrived at Team 9, now we have the team of the Rookie of the Year, the Kunoichi of the Year and the Dead Last. The teachers nodded and Aruka Yumino stepped forward with the bios and information from the three students, first the Dead Last, Rock Lee is a very dedicated student but has no ability to wield chakra to produce major ninjutsu or genjutsu. He is able to do the basic three academy jutsu and reinforce his body with chakra but that's about all he can do. 
However he is a very dedicated student and a budding taijutsu master under the tutelage of Meita Gai, who has been training the boy since the second year of the academy. He turned the page on his folder, the kunoichi of the year, Yukumo Kurama is a prodigy in genjutsu almost on the level of the missing Nini Tachi Uchiha. She is rather weak in taijutsu but is excellent in ranged weaponry especially when combined with her illusions. He flipped to the final page, and finally the rookie of the year Menma, an orphan but has proved to be a prodigy in poisons and medical ability. He has worked part-time at the hospital during his academy years and the only thing preventing him from being an active medic is his age and lack of chunin status. He is also incredibly skilled in taijutsu with Anko-san's fighting style. He has told me he has had private training with Anko in the past. Everyone shivered at that information except the kunoichi in question, poor kid. Baruka put down the folder at the Hokage's desk and Minato perused the information on the three students. He found Menma interesting. As an orphan himself he knew how hard it was to make it to Rookie of the Year without any help. However it seems like he had a similar relationship with Anko as he had with Jiraiya. He looked up as the team senseis ended their discussion on who would be best as their sensei. Anko stepped forward along with Guy and Anko spoke seriously, I would like to be sensei of this team, they would make an excellent assassination and escort team with Menma's poison skills, Lee's taijutsu skills, and Yukumo's genjutsu abilities. She stepped back a bit and Guy started to speak, I would like to be allowed to continue to tutor Rock Lee privately in taijutsu. I do not question Anko's ability to teach him, but he already has a firm foundation in the strong fist fighting style. Minato processed this information, it was a good idea, Anko already had experience with Menma while the other two could benefit from Anko as well. Rock Lee would not be neglected due to Guy's insistence on training him. He nodded and pressed his seal of approval on the team, accepted, Team 9 will be composed of Menma, Rock Lee, and Yukumo Kurama. The sensei of the team will be Anko Mitarashi. All of the teachers and future senseis nodded and left the room. Minato frowned and looked down upon Menma's page. He was curious about Menma, what were the chances an orphan would be named after a ramen ingredient like his daughter, Shio? And why did he feel a pang of guilt every time he looked at the face of Menma? What no one else knew is that behind the bars of a large cage in a sewer, a large fox chuckled to himself as he watched through Shio Uzumaki's eyes and waited to see the result of its interference. Kohona Academy, Menma's POV. Menma was seated alongside Yukumo and Lee as they waited for the teacher to announce the teams. Soon Uruka Yumino came into the room and took out a sheet of paper and started to list the teams. 1 to 8 unimportant. Team 9 will be Rock Lee, Kurama Yukumo, and Menma. Your sensei will be Mitarashi Anko. Menma smiled slightly as Yukumo and Lee cheered. Team 10 will be Neji Hayuga, Tenten, and Mito Gekko. Your sensei will be Hayate Gekko. Uruka set down his papers and smiled at all of the graduates, I have been very glad to be your sensei for these past few years. I hope everyone's dreams come true and that everyone's will of fire will never diminish. Dot quote. Uruka was about to continue before a canopy smashed through the window and attached two kanais to the blackboard. On the canopy read, the sexy and single Mitarashi Anko, sensei of Team 9. At the bottom of the canopy stood Anko in a dramatic pose, all right all you gakis I want to see Team 9 up on the roof in five minutes. She poofed into smoke soon after the announcement leaving the entire room stunned for a few seconds before Team 9 stood up and made their way up to the roof. Academy Roof, Menma POV. The trio arrived at the roof to see Anko munching on some dango as she grinned at them, all right you three, name your names, likes, dislikes, hobbies, dreams for the future, that sort of thing. Yukumo looked at Anko's outfit a bit scandalized but spoke in a respectful tone. Shouldn't you introduce yourself first sensei? Anko grinned again and swallowed the rest of the dango and started her introduction, I am the sexy Mitarashi Anko. My likes are poisons, torture, blood, tea ceremonies, and my cute little gakis. My dislikes are a certain snake, bad dango, bad sake, and arrogant assholes. My hobbies are working at the T&I division and hanging out in the forest of death. My dream is to kill a certain snake. Now it's your turn gaki one. Yukumo looked a little affronted by the nickname but continued anyway, my name is Yukumo Kurama. My likes are genjutsu, painting, and rice balls. I dislike my alternate personality Ido, and a certain person. My hobbies are painting and studying genjutsu. My dream for the future is to be the best genjutsu user in the elemental nations. Anko looked at Lee, alright and you big brows. 
Li jumped excitedly and spoke quickly, Yash. My name is Rock Li. I like Taijutsu, Gai Sensei, training, and curry. I do not have many things I hate but I dislike natural born prodigies. My hobbies are training and making curry and my dream for the future is to surpass Gai Sensei as a Taijutsu specialist. Enko nodded at that information and turned to Menma, and finally you gas -kun. Naruto scowled slightly at the nickname but said calmly, my name is Menma, no last name. My likes include poisons, gardening, ramen, and books. My dislikes include a certain family, people who look down on medic nin, and arrogant people. My hobbies are gardening, training, and studying different poisons and their effects. I do not have a dream for the future but more of an ambition, I plan on becoming the greatest medic nin and poison user in the elemental nations. Enko smiled widely at their introductions and gave them their first instructions, all right then my cute little gakis tomorrow we will have the true genin test at training field 9. Lee looked confused, true genin test sensei. Enko smirked at Lee, of course, you didn't think to become full-fledged genin you just needed to just pass a written test and some basic jutsu did you? Meet me at the field at 8am and if you're late it's straight back to the academy. With those words she shushined away in a whirlwind of leaves. Naruto looked at the jutsu and thought to himself, I really have to learn that jutsu. Naruto looked at his potential teammates, we should be well rested for tomorrow so make sure you go to bed early and eat a good breakfast, knowing Anko sensei this test will not be easy. Yukumo and Lee nodded and they walked off in different directions, each thinking and preparing for the test the next day. Training Ground 9 Kohona, Menma's POV. Training Ground 9 was traditional for the Genin Team 9 to practice in. It was a basic training field surrounded by dense forests and an open field in the center that featured as the training ground. It was nearing 6.40 in the morning when Yukumo, Lee, and Naruto arrived at the training ground. They had each come a bit early to plan for the true genin test. Naruto started off the planning, all right, I have known Sensei for quite a while. She is an all-round fighter who uses primarily stealth attacks to kill or injure her opponents. She has the ability to summon snakes to aid her in battle. She is also one of the few poison specialists in the village besides myself. Both Yukumo and Lee nodded at the information and Yukumo commented, I suggest with the information we have on Sensei is to use a distraction. Lee will distract Sensei while I layer illusions while Menma finishes her off. Menma nodded at the sound plan, it probably would not work against a Jonin like Anko but it was the best they had. Lee raised his fist to the sky and shouted, Yosh. With the power of youth there is no way we cannot pass this test. Yukumo and Menma sweat dropped, it was clear that he had already been corrupted from Guy. Suddenly he felt a chill as if someone was walking on his grave. He quickly knocked back his teammates and deflected the incoming kanai with a scalpel. Scowling a bit he sighed and spoke out loud to the woods, Oi, sensei do you have to throw kanai every time we get together? Anko shushined in front of the group grinning widely, well Gaki it's good to see you haven't lost your touch in the time we have been away from each other. If you had I would have to beat those skills back into you. Menma shivered a bit knowing she was being completely serious, what is our test today sensei? Anko grew serious and began to explain the test, I was going to do a special test for you Gakis. However, it is tradition for the two rookies of the year and the dead last take the bell test. Anko took out two bells and attached them to her waist, the purpose of this test is to take these bells from me, the person who does not have any part of a bell will return to the academy. All three students tensed, it went without saying that there were only two bells. Anko grinned evilly at them, you have until noon which is in three hours, you may begin. All three students jumped into the surrounding forest. Anko looked around the forest and smirked, she may not be a sensor like Kakashi but. A green garden snake was staring at Menma from behind. A black snake was staring at Yukumo. A blue snake stared at Lee from the bushes. They can't escape her snakes. Training ground 9 surrounding forest, Menma Pav, 3 hours until test is over. He knew there has to be some sort of trick to this test. He had reviewed the previous team rosters from the Hokage's personal library. There had never been a three-member team unless it was for a double apprenticeship, which rarely ever happens. He thought back to Anko's words, any part of a bell, and he smirked clever sensei but not clever enough. He jumped through the forest searching for his teammates. Training ground 9 open field, Li Pav, 2.45 hours until test is over. I jumped into the field to confront our sensei. 
I would not fail Guy Sensei and will get a bell or I will do 500 laps around Konoha on my hands. I arrived at the field and took my stance in front of Anko Sensei and smiled widely, greeting Sensei I will take one of those bells now. Anko sweat dropped at his loud entrance, you're not very smart are you Gaki? Not answering Lee dashed at his sensei at high chunin speeds and jumped in the air in a spinning kick, leaf whirlwind. Anko easily dodged the kick and kicked Lee's side as he passed, breaking his spin and tossing him away. Lee jumped up and ran at Anko and was about to punch her when she was replaced by a log. Kawamari, he though as he looked around for his sensei. However, as soon as he turned around the log poofed and was replaced by Anko who kicked him in the back into the woods. She quietly chuckled to herself, she never thought that any idiot would confuse Kawamari for Henge in another dimension Naruto sneezed. She looked down at a snake in the grass and it whispered information to her. Her grin widened, she knew her favorite Gaki would understand the test. Now they just had to get a bell from her. Training Ground 9. Surrounding Forest Menmapav, 2 hours till test is over. He had quickly found Yukumo hiding near his location and told her his theory about the test. She had believed him and they quickly went to find Lee. They found him getting his ass kicked by Anko sensei It was a good thing that she was going easy on him. Last time he made a stupid mistake like that she had copied Kakashi's 100 years of pain with a kunai and explosive tags. They quickly gathered Lee and explained the situation to him. He was quick to agree that they needed to work together and they started to hash out a plan. Menma brought out two ceiling tags and handed them to his teammates, we don't have time to make you too immune to my poisons so wear those on your chest, they will filter out the air and prevent poison from entering your lungs. Yukumo took one of the tags and looked at Menma's gas mask, why do you wear that if you have these tags and when did you learn sealing? Menma didn't even look sheepish as he stated seriously, it looks more badass than wearing a sealing tag. Plus those tags do not last forever, these will last around 2 hours max. I learned some sealing from Anko Sensei, a lie but they didn't need to know that. These anti-poison seals are mandatory for any poison user to carry. They both nodded and they started their plan. Training Ground 9. Open field Anko's Pav, 1 hour until test is over. Anko was standing in the center of the field when three syringes flew from the surrounding forest. She quickly dodged them but noticed three explosive notes wrapped around them. Shit. She cursed as they exploded. As the smoke cleared a broken log was on the ground. Menma rushed out into the field with his chakra scalpels activates and rushed at the now revealed Anko in a taijutsu match. He thrust a glowing palm at Anko as she dodged the thrust and retaliated with a high kick to the head. He ducked backwards beneath the kick and sprang up from the ground in a backwards cartwheel kicking Anko in the chin in the process. As he landed on his feet he jabbed at Anko's exposed throat with his scalpel. However before he could get near her throat she kneed him in the stomach then kicked him away from her. She quickly spun around and backhanded Lee who was about to punch her in the back. Soon she was countering a barrage of taijutsu from Lee and Menma. She smirked a bit and caught both Lee and Menma's fists and spun around throwing them in opposite directions. Not bad gakis but you're 100 years too early to beat me in close combat. As Menma and Lee were falling their pained grimaces turned into smirks as a small smoke bomb near Anko's feet exploded. The field suddenly got filled with purple smoke. Anko who was in the middle of the blast started coughing a bit and felt her limbs starting to become heavier. As she was coughing, that damn gaki made a paralyzing poison that can affect me. Exclamation mark quote. She quickly went through hand signs and used a wind jutsu to push the poison away from her. As soon as she could see again Menma was in front of her, a syringe on each finger covered in chakra scalpels. She took out a kunai and channeled chakra into it to deflect the jabs and slashes of Menma's needles. She had to duck as Lee proceeded to do another leaf whirlwind at her back and jumped out of the way as Menma slashed at her with his scalpels. Suddenly she felt a shift in the air as she fluxed her chakra and her two students disappeared and Lee's kick was about to contact to her face while Menma was nowhere to be seen. She bent down unnaturally to dodge Lee's kick and caught a small dart in her hand that was about to enter her neck from behind. Menma emerged from the woods again, his gas mask was on his face and a blowpipe sticking out of a section of the mouthpiece that was previously hidden behind his gas mask. Anko grinned at her two students, not bad gakis but not enough to take me down. Lee was about to charge her again when she pointed her arm at him and yelled, Sunejishu, and snakes wrapped around Lee and she dragged him to crash him into Menma who was charged at her from behind. 
She shuckled a bit before her eyes widened, her perception had switched, it felt as if she was doing a handstand and looking up at the sky. She smirked a bit, what a nice genjutsu. She closed her eyes and with sound deflected and blocked the attacks from her two students as she continued to flux her chakra to get rid of the genjutsu. Suddenly she opened her eyes as she dispelled the genjutsu and dodged the attacks of her students before kicking them away from her. She smirked a bit as she saw them struggling to get up. What she was not prepared for was when Naruto suddenly shouted, Now! In the forest Yukumo had just finished a painting of Anko locked a bind of steel beams and injected chakra into the painting. In the middle of the field Anko suddenly froze as she saw steel beams wrapped around her body. Both Menma and Lee rushed to the bells. Anko, unable to free herself from the real illusion could not react as both bells were taken from her. She smirked as all three of her students stood in front of her, all smiling while Lee and Menma had the bells. She looked at all three of her students, all right you gakis, Lee and Menma have a bell, so it looks like Yukumo is going back to the academy. Menma smirked a bit and used his chakra scalpel to cut his bell in half and gave it to Yukumo, you never said we could not split the bell sensei. And besides, this test is not about getting the bells but working together. Anko started laughing loudly, ha ha ha, I can't wait to see Kakashi's face when he learns that my students passed his precious bell test. You were right Menma, the point of this test was teamwork. I am proud of all of you my cute little students. But for now I need to report the results to the Hokage. Why don't you all treat yourself to something nice for lunch while I do that? She poofed away in a shunshin. All three Genin members grinned at each other. Lee was shouting about youth and how he made Guy Sensei proud. Yukumo was glowing with happiness that she proved her old Sensei Kuranai wrong and became a Genin. Menma smirked to himself as he took off his gas mask, he was now a Genin one year before his sister. He could not wait to finally show his former parents what he could do by defeating his sister. Menma turned to his teammates and smiled a bit, why don't we go out for some sushi, if we all pitch in we can get some of the good stuff. They all smiled to each other again and walked to his favorite sushi bar. Hokage meeting. Konoha, one hour after the successful Genin test. All of the Janin senseis that had already tested their students came into the room to discuss their results to their Hokage. Soon when all of the senseis were gathered they announced their results. Team 1, failed. Team 2, failed. Team 3, failed. Team 4, failed. Team 5, failed. Team 6, failed. Team 7, Inaku Yamanaka, Choju Akamichi, and Shiori Nara passed. Team 8, Pakura Abarame, Hibiki Izunaka, and Tojiro passed. Now it was Anko's turn. Team 9, Rock Lee, Kurama Yukumo, and Menma passed. Finally Hayato walked forward and said, Team 10, Mito Gekko, Neji Hayuga, and Tenten passed. Minato nodded smiling, four teams had passed this year, which is one more than the usual amount of students to graduate. He also noticed that Team 9 had passed. He knew the team had been given the bell test and he was curious to see how they did, thank you everyone for your hard work. I will be seeing the senseis of the past teams here tomorrow for your first D rank assignments. I would like Anko to stay behind for a few seconds please. Everyone nodded and looked at Anko confused as they left the room. Minato picked out the files of team 9, I wanted to hear your opinion of this team. It is rare that a bell test is passed. The bell test was notorious for having the highest number of failures. It was for this reason that it was reserved for only for the team with the rookie and kunoichi of the year. Anko nodded, yes Hokage-sama, I believe that this team can be a very strong fighting force in the future. Lee and Menma were keeping me on my toes with their taijutsu and poisons while Yukumo kept me cornered with their genjutsu. If I was Haichunin or even Lo Janin I may have lost the battle, not just the bells. Minato looked a bit surprised, after all it's rare to see a genin team have so much potential. He looked at the folders and couldn't help feeling pride for Menma, but he was not sure why. He looked back at Anko and smiled, thank you Anko-san, I will see you tomorrow to hand out your first D-ranks. Anko smiled evilly and laughed, can't wait to see the looks on the Gaki's faces then they first do D-ranks. She continued to chuckle evilly out the building, scaring to death the people she passed through the building. Hokage's office, Konoha, one day after the Genin test, Menma POV. Team 9 and their sensei were waiting for their first mission as a team. They were all excited for their first mission. They were standing in front of the Chunin who gave out D and C rank missions. 
The Chunin sorted through the D-rank scrolls until he pulled out a mission. Team 9, the Daimo's wife's cat Tora has gone missing, it is your job to retrieve it. All of the Genins on Team 9, even Lee, deadpanned at the Chunin. Menma sighed, already expecting this from seeing all of the Genin teams do meaningless tasks around the village. After several hours of chasing the damn cat they returned to the office, heavily battle-wounded by the smug-looking cat in Yakumo's arms. The Chunin chuckled a little bit after they completed the mission and took a look at the remaining scrolls, well the only missions we have left for the day are weeding Miss Haruka's garden, repainting an elder's house, outside the room they could hear a commotion and a woman's voice yelling shrilly, no. Tora. The Chunin sighed, and catching Tora again. Team 9 sighed as one as they accepted another D rank. Training Field 9 Konoha, one month after Team 9's first D-Rank. It was an entire month of hell for Team 9. In the morning they would constantly train with Anko and then do boring D-Rank missions for the rest of the day. It was not until after their 40th D-Rank mission that Anko had them gather at Training Ground 9. Anko faced her team, All right Gakis, tomorrow we are going on our first C-Rank mission. I want all of you to get a good night's sleep tonight and be well prepared for the mission. We will probably not be back for a week or two. The three genins looked excited and nodded as they left to prepare for their first real mission. Menma arrived at his apartment that he had bought with his money from the D-rank missions. He looked at the mirror for a bit before wiping the makeup off his cheeks, revealing three whisker-like marks. He did not know why he was gaining these marks. Only his sister had these marks and she was the Kyubi container. However until he figured out what was happening he would keep these marks hidden. He sighed, only two more months until the Chunin exams. He knows he can't partake in the exams. He knows that Minato would never let his daughter not partake in the first Chunin exams after she graduates. He was in luck, the next Chunin exams was in Kumo. He could make an easy argument not to take the exams this time. He also figured out that Neji's team would not participate because of the history between the Hyugas and Kumo. He smiled grimly. It was just a matter of time before he faces against his sister. And at the end of it, he would be the one standing over her, and gaining his revenge by humiliating that man's daughter in front of the entire world. Inside Menma's mindscape, Menma's mindscape had taken the form of a large pond surrounded by trees. In the center of the water two glowing red eyes appeared, slowly taking shape from the water. Finally a small fox with one tail emerged from the water and smirked, the chakra he had injected into the kid had finally managed to allow his consciousness in was finally large enough. Before he was sealed in the brat Shio he had injected some of his chakra into the other kid, Naruto something. He had used that little chakra to place a genjutsu around anyone of his blood to ignore him. This allowed his plan to suck eat. Without his consciousness in the seal, the jubi could never be revived unless both his consciousness and chakra were in the ghetto Mazo statue. It was just an added bonus that he could gain his revenge against all the years chained to a giant moon in Kashina's mindscape. He looked at his small body in disdain, he would grow fast from the excess chakra in his new host's body. However he would not be at full strength until Naruto reaches the age of 16. He slightly regretted making the kid's life so bad, but in order to defeat Madara the deception was necessary. However, the kid had grown strong away from his parents and with his chakra they could train to defeat Madara while Shio will be the bait. He knew that Naruto would be a better host because only he knew that he was the reincarnation of Asura, not Shio. He chuckled and delved back into the pond, knowing that it wasn't time to reveal himself to Naruto, no Menma yet. Moritomo Sushi Bar, Konoha, 6.30 AM, Menma POV. Menma was sitting with Lee and Yukumo at their favorite sushi bar as they discussed their first C-rank. Menma finished a fatty tuna shishimi before he spoke, the mission will most likely along the lines of escort or assassination, Anko already told us that's what our team was built towards. Yukumo gulped a bit, I can't believe we will really have to kill already. I know we have learned about it during the academy but the actual knowledge that you're about to do it, it's scary. Lee nodded solemnly, Yes it will be harsh blow to our youthfulness, but it is required to become stronger as ninja. Menma chewed a bit more before looking around, I wonder why our sensei called us here, our C rank isn't for another 4 hours. Anko arrived at their booth and sat down, stealing a salmon shishime from Menma, well Gaki, we are here for a very important mission that could be critical to our survival in the future. All three genins gulped a bit as they heard that, Anko suddenly tied Lee up, we are getting rid of this spandex and getting you a real ninja outfit. 
All of the Jennings and some of the other diners at the restaurant sweat dropped. Lee suddenly started stuttering, BB but Anko sensei, guy said that this outfit will increase my youthfulness and unlock my full potential. Anko started dragging Lee out of the restaurant chuckling a little bit, the only thing that outfit will increase if your changes of death on an assassination mission. Menma and Yukumo quickly paid for their meal and ran after his sensei and unfortunate teammate. They found the master and unfortunate student at a popular clothing store for shinobi where Lee was still tied up crying crocodile tears as Anko picked out an outfit. Soon she picked out an outfit and Sparta kicked Lee into the room after untying him and gave him the outfit for him to wear. Soon he came out of the dressing room and everyone gaped at Lee. He was wearing a dark green tight latex sleeveless muscle shirt with black shinobi pants, combat boots, and arm guards with latex fingerless gloves underneath. Think Lancer's clothing from Fate Zero. Anko grinned smugly as her choice in outfit was definitely the right one. Anko grabbed Lee and rushed out of the store while yelling, now to the barber shop. Menma and Yukumo chased after the rapidly disappearing duo. Soon they arrived at the Konoha barber shop and entered to see Lee tied to one of the chairs and surrounded by evilly chuckling barbers. Menma deadpanned at his sensei, what is going on here? Anko grinned down at Menma, well it seems that they have been wanting to destroy that horrid bowl cut and eyebrows of his ever since they saw him on the streets a few times. They said he was on their head hunting board, she pointed to a wall where there were a bunch of photos of different men. On top of the wall said, targets. Some of the most predominantly displayed were Kakashi Hataki, Jiraiya of the Sanin, and made a guy. Underneath guy there was a picture of Rock Lee crossed out with a red marker. After 30 minutes a new Lee was revealed. They had trimmed his eyebrows so his eyes did not look so white anymore. His hairstyle was now wavy in places with one strand of hair going down his forehead, Lancer's hairstyle. Both Menma and Yukumo gaped at Lee, where had the weirdo green beast go? Lee looked forlornly at his green spandex suit in his hands and looked at Anko, Sensei, are you sure this will allow me to become a better ninja and expand my youthfulness? Anko grinned at Lee, sure kid, that outfit will definitely help you become a ninja. Suddenly Lee's face brightened and he shouted, yes sensei, I will become a strong ninja with this new look, if I don't I will do 1000 laps around Konoha. Menma smirked a bit, there he is. Hokage's office. Konoha, Menma POV. Team 9 were standing in front of the Hokage's desk. Minato sat behind the desk along with two Chunin helpers and was looking at a few scrolls in a box labeled C rank. However, before he could pull out a mission Anko stepped forward, Hokage-sama, I would like to request a hunt. A hunt was a group of missions set aside to allow genin teams used to killing. These missions usually involved destroying bandit camps around the land of fire. Minato raised his eyebrows and looked over at the determined team, he saw no hesitation among the genin inside, he always hated this part of being Hokage, forcing young kids to make their first kill. He looked at team 9, all right then, your mission will be to destroy the bandit camp that was reported outside of the small town of Shishiong near the border of the land of earth. Do not worry about Iwa Shinobi, we have a peace agreement with them so if you encounter any they are unlikely to engage. The mission should take around two weeks to complete. Team 9 nodded and excited the room to prepare for their first C rank. Menma's apartment, Konoha. Menma finished packing his supplies, he was bringing two changes of clothes, food in preservation seals, around 100 different vials of poison with labeled effects, his medical equipment, kanai, shuriken, sinban, darts, and some small arrows for his latest weapon. He rolled the sleeve of his trench coat a bit and looked at the device Anko had gifted him with. Flashback two weeks ago, Menma POV. Menma was practicing a water ninjutsu exercise given to them by Anko sensei. She had tested their affinities and Lee had lightning, Yukumo had earth, and he had water. Anko had commented that despite not being able to do jutsu, Lee could still produce nature chakura and could eventually infuse his punches and kicks with lightning chakra similar to the rakage. Anko had Yukumo practicing some defensive earth style ninjutsu. She had informed him that his water attacks could be a good combination with his poisons. Many poisons can become more toxic when exposed to water or evaporate in the air when upon contact to it. She had him practicing the water gun shot technique, which was the opposite of the fireball jutsu and water prison jutsu. Both were basic C rank water ninjutsu but could be used very effectively with his poisons. However before any of them could use the jutsu effectively they needed to train in their elements. 
She gave Lee a leaf and told him when it was crumpled into a small ball he would be given the next step. Yukumo had to turn her leaf completely into ash while he had to extract all of the water from the leaf. He was around the midway point of extracting the water before the leaf crumpled, proof that he messed up again. He sighed and looked up as Anko walked up to them carrying three scrolls. Team 9 stopped their training exercise and approached Anko. Sensei gave one scroll to each of us and explained, well Gaki's good news. Your wonderful and sexy sensei has decided to gift all of you with a weapon. For Lee I asked Guy to give you one of their nunchucks. Lee's eyes widened, the Maida family was famous for their nunchuck wielders. It was said that Maida Bruce was able to go head to head with the second Hokage with nothing but a pair of his nunchucks. Lee unsealed the two nunchucks and span them around a bit before grinning widely. For Yukumo this is a joint project between Menma and I. She unsealed a Tonto and handed it to Yukumo. This dagger is imbued with a mix of several different poisons that will kill a grown man in around a minute with a scratch. And finally for Menma. She unsealed a very odd crossbow. It was small and attached to a fingerless glove. The glove seemed to have a reloading device that would automatically reload the crossbow. Anko grinned a bit. This little beauty is an item I found a few years ago at a random shop in the land of snow. The bolts loaded into it are unpoisoned but she handed him a quiver of small arrows, you can poison whatever you want on these which you can load manually. Menma nodded and put on the contraption. He looked around and noticed a target a few meters away. He pointed the arm-mounted crossbow and fired rapidly at the target, each hitting in the inner circle. He gave a small smile and thanked his sensei, thanks sensei, this is great. Anko saw the small smile and smirked, it was hard to get that kid to smile. End flashback. At 1 p.m. all the members of Team 9 arrived at the gate and greeted each other. Soon their sensei arrived and they jumped into the forest at high speeds, each mentally preparing for what they're about to do. Forest surrounding Shishiong. 12 p.m. Northern Land of Fire, three days since Team 9 set out from Konoha, Menma POV. Team 9 was hiding in the trees looking over the bandit camp. The camp was hidden in a clearing surrounded by trees north of Shishiong. They were discussing their plan to wipe out the bandits. Anko began to tell them the plan, alright, I want Yukumo to maintain a genjutsu around the camp to prevent their escape and to remain undetected. Menma, spread your poison gas around the camp. Lee, when Yukumo and Menma complete their tasks I want you to go in and start killing the guards. Then we will all enter at the three entrances to the camp to kill the rest of the bandits. Everyone nodded. Yukumo's POV. I got into position at the east entrance and quickly began to go through some hand seals and whispered, Temple of Nirvana. Soon all of the guards around the camp saw feathers in front of their eyes and fell asleep. Menma POV. He crouched upon the largest tree at the southern entrance and manually inserted a syringe into his crossbow and fired them to critical spots around the bandit camp. Soon the camp was littered with syringes. Lee's POV. Lee arrived at the west entrance to the bandit camp and took out his nunchucks and breathed deeply before activating a seal on his tongue to filter out the air from the poison. Anko's POV. She stood silently away from the camp observing their progress and was impressed. These gakis were doing pretty well on their first time. She frowned and looked a bit to the north. Her snakes had picked up a large man approaching the camp they were about to attack and she was worried. Menma's POV. Menma frummed a hand seal and whispered, Katsu. And all of the syringes he launched into the camp exploded with a noxious purple gas throughout the camp. He quickly put on his gas mask before running into the camp to help Lee who was already battling some of the coughing bandits. He rolled under a wild swing by a bandit and shot him with a crossbow bolt before peppering the bandits around Lee with arrows. Not to waste arrows he quickly activated his chakra scalpels and started to kill more bandits. Lee's POV. Spinning his nunchucks around at startling speeds he broke bones and necks of bandits around him as he entered the camp like a whirlwind, striking at any bandit he could see and avoiding any of the wild strikes of the bandits coughing from the poison in the air. Yukumo POV. Grabbing the tanto from the sheath on her left shoulder she quickly entered the camp, cutting any bandit that got too close to her as she started to seal any supplies and stolen goods the bandits had. She would return all of the stolen items to the village after this was over. Menma POV. Soon no bandits remained and bodies were littered around the camp. He closed his eyes a bit as he heard Lee and Yukumo throw up in the forest after their first skills. He knew he should feel worse about killing for the first time. But a part of his humanity died a long time ago when he first picked up Orochimaru's journal. 
He wished he felt worse about killing the bandits. But all he felt inside was a hollowness that he couldn't describe. He felt a hand on his shoulder and he flinched before opening his eyes and saw Anko with a hand on his shoulder, you okay Menma? In the back of his mind he realized this was the first time she had called him by his name instead of Brad or Gaki. He nodded slowly, I will be fine, it will just take a bit to get used to. Anko nodded, understanding. However before they could leave back to Konoha Anko suddenly grabbed us and sushioned out of the way as one of the largest men that he had ever seen slammed a huge mace on the ground cracking it heavily and kicking up a bunch of dust. When the dust settled the man was revealed to Team 9. He was a giant of a man at 7 feet tall and was heavily muscled. He had scraggly dark brown hair and a large beard. He carried a large two-handed mace with an anvil-sized head. On his forehead was the symbol of Iowa with a slash crossing it. He chuckled deeply at their ready stances, so four tree huggers think they can beat me. Anko narrowed her eyes, Rogan the Butcher, a rank missing nin known for slaughtering entire towns in the land of fire during the last war. Went rogue a couple of years ago since he Suchikage signed the peace treaty. What are you doing in this area? Behind her back she made a few hand signs to her team. Rogan grinned darkly, I was just about to have fun in the town nearby. I heard there was a bunch of scum living there and I wanted to clean it up. But here I am with a bunch of newborn genin ninjas and a whore Konoha Kunoichi. This will be fun. With those words he lifted his mace and quickly swung it at me. I jumped away from the mace firing bolts from my crossbow at high speed but most of the arrows were deflected as he spun his mace around. We all charged at Rogan but he simply grinned again and started spinning around with his mace forcing us all to get back before we were clubbed. He stopped spinning suddenly and kicked Yukumo away from him into the woods harshly. Lee yelled, Yukumo, before having to dodge a fast swing by Rogan but ended up getting back handed by him straight into a tree and was knocked out. I quickly went through some hand seals and used one of the few ninjutsu he learned from Orochimaru's notes he cupped his hands together and converted some of his chakra into poison and a small black ball appeared between his hands and he shouted, Dokujin no jutsu and a large blast of black smoke appeared from his hand straight at the butcher. Rogan saw the cloud and quickly went through some hand seals and clapped his hands together. A wall of earth separated him from the poison cloud. As the cloud hit the wall the wall started to dissolve. Rogan quickly charged at Menma with his anvil. Menma activated his chakra scalpels and Anko drew two longer than normal kunai and they engaged him in taijutsu. They were locked in combat for around two minutes before Rogan slammed the handle of his mace into Anko's stomach before knocking her out with another hit from his mace. Seeing his sensei fall made something snap inside of Menma. He unsealed a syringe from a seal on his wrist and injected it into his arm. Rogan was confused as Menma injected something into himself. Time seemed to slow and all Menma could hear was a heartbeat steadily speeding up. He started frothing at the mouth a bit and his eyes turned pure white. Rogan looked a bit alarmed at this development and charged at Menma preparing to strike him down before he finished whatever he was doing. However as he struck the genin his mace hit blackened skin and his mace was stopped dead. Soon this darkness was spreading all across Menma until he was completely covered except his eyes and a jagged smile played across the thing's mouth. The poison that he injected himself with was one of Orochimaru's more brilliant creations. He took the venom of the chakra eater. A special type of mosquito that inject its poison into its victim that absorbs its chakra. He took a syringe full of it and injected it with the chakra of several bestial creatures from the forest of death. He also mixed it with the venom of the fossilized snake, a snake that hardens the chakra system with its venom when it bites an opponent. When injected into a human, the results are what is displayed. The venom causes chakra to harden in the chakra pathways and allows the human body to become invulnerable and have the senses and fighting instinct of a predator. In exchange one has no control over their body until the effect wears off. Rogan was hard pressed to do anything against the bestialized Menma as he constantly guarded the clawed attacks of Menma. Soon several cuts and scrapes dotted the butcher. Menma fought like a beast constantly scratching, cutting, and biting at Rogan until eventually the man's mace missed and he cut the missing nin's throat open. Rogan spluttered a bit and died looking at the roaring in victory face of his killer. Soon the effects of the enhancer wore off and Menma fell to the ground, exhausted. He looked at his skin and noticed it was not purple. He had read that a side effect of the enhancer was that the last test subject, some guy called Mundo, was purple for a month after the poison was injected into him. He looked at his sensei and crawled to her and his hand started to glow green, 
he healed her to the best of his ability then passed out from chakra exhaustion. Inside Menma's mindscape, Kayubi looked through Menma's eyes he fought Rogan. He was impressed despite himself as he saw the boy fight a Janan. As a reward for the kid he decided to use a little of his corrosive chakra to prevent any negative side effects of the stuff he injected himself with. He looked around the pond a bit and looked at an hourglass on the shore of the lake. His illusion over the Namikaze family would not last for much longer than a year. He sighed a bit and prepared to meet his new container at the end of the year. He hoped the kid would forgive him for his deception. Shishiong, Land of Fire, one day after the battle, Menma POV. It was a bright morning when Menma slowly opened his eyes. He winced at the bright light hitting his eyes from the window as he sat up in bed, warily looking around him. He was in a modest but comfortable hotel room. Soon after he woke up Anko entered the room with a tray of breakfast. He saw the food and his stomach growled, he realized he was very hungry. Anko sat down near him and he asked through eating his eggs, what happened? Are Yukumo and Lee all right? Anko nodded. Yes Yukumo was lucky, she fell into some mud and it cushioned her fall a bit. As for Lee he woke up a few hours before you did, seeing how he is currently running around the village he appears to be fine. I woke up around 30 minutes of being unconscious, you shouldn't use your chakra so recklessly to heal me brat. You were suffering from severe chakra exhaustion. I'm surprised you're up already. But, Anko suddenly turns deadly serious making Menma gulp a bit. What the hell was that poison you took? I found the needle sticking out of your arm and found Rogan looking as if an animal attacked him. Menma looked away from Anko, it was a steroid that I created. Anko looked a bit angry, bullshit. I know what we have worked on together and that steroid was way to advance for a rookie genin to completely demolish one of the highest ranked A ranked missing nin in the bingo book. The only reason that man was not S rank is because he is only wanted in Konoha and Iowa. A little known fact about becoming S rank in the bingo book is that you need to be wanted at A rank by three different ninja villages. Menma sighed a bit contemplating what to do. He knew this may make her hate him but he owed her the truth. He unzipped his trench coat and pulled down his shirt to show a seal on his heart and unsealed Orochimaru's journal. He handed it to Anko. Anko took the journal and started flipping through it, getting angrier as she continued to read the experiments that her former mentor conducted. She looked up, more angry than he had ever seen her, what the hell Gaki, where did you find this? This is one of Orochi fucking Maru's personal journals. Menma winced a bit at her tone. When I was locked out of the Namikaze estate I found one of Orochimaru's hidden laboratories near a training ground I used. I had just decided to get revenge on my former family but I had no one to train me. I had no resources, no mentor, and no allies so I decided to learn from his journals. Anko's angry expression softened a bit, Menma, you can't just live your life for revenge. I have seen people, including my former mentor walk that path. All of them either ended up dead or a worse monster than the person they wished revenge on. Anko hugged Menma as a mother would, Menma. No Naruto, you do not need to become a monster like my former sensei. A good friend of mine once told me that in order to become truly strong, you need something precious to fight for. Revenge isn't something precious to you. It is just an empty emotion of hatred that will continue to corrupt you. When your revenge is complete you're left with nothing but more hatred. Mentally she was thanking the third Hokage for telling her this after she was abandoned by Orochimaru or she would have no clue what to say to this kid. For the first time since he was five Naruto felt tears running down his face as he was hugged for the first time in his memory. He thought back to all the times he was forgotten by his family and how they doted on Shio. He still felt the burning hatred for his former family. But he then thought of Lee, Yukumo, and Anko and he felt happy for the first time in a long time. He smiled, a true warm smile, he would be the best of both worlds, he would prove to his former family that he was better than Shio, but he would not do it Orochimaru's way, he would become powerful and protect his precious people. He wrapped his arms around Anko and said softly, thank you, Ka-san. Anko smiled a bit, no problem brat. Exit of Shishiong, Land of Fire, Menma's POV. Team 9 was preparing to leave Shishiong when 4 Iwa Shinobi jumped down in front of them. Team 9 quickly got into fighting stances but the leader raised his hand, hold, we are not here to fight. Anko didn't loosen her guard and spoke, what are you doing here then? The leader of the Iowa group stepped forward a bit, he was a tall man with a rather large nose. He was dressed in the formal Iowa Junin outfit. 
He stopped a good distance from their group. My name is Kitsuchi, Jonan of Iwagakur with my Genin team, Kuritsuchi, Akatsuchi, and Suzumbaki Kamazuro. We had heard that Rogan the Butcher was in the area and came to take him out, but it seems that we were too late. Enko nodded and relaxed a bit. Yes my Genin team and I defeated Rogan. Kitsuchi looked a little impressed as he observed the three Genin. Yes and I would like to thank you on behalf of Iwa for his death. However, we would like to request that you return the hammer of the first Tsuchikage to us. Rogan had stolen it before he went rogue. Enko looked surprised. The hammer of the first Tsuchikage. The diamond helm. We did not know that he was carrying such a renowned weapon. I would have thought he would have used some of its abilities. Kitsuchi nodded. The hammer has seals to prevent the unworthy of using it. You may keep the body of Rogan, he is rightfully yours to cash in the bounty. Enko took out the scroll they had sealed the hammer in and handed it to Kitsuchi. The Iwa Janan unsealed the mason inspected it a bit before nodding and sealing it back into the scroll. He looked at the group, the Tsuchikage will hear of this, it will definitely help ease some of the tensions after the peace treaty to hear that a Konoha team returned one of our greatest relics of the first Tsuchikage. Enko nodded. The Iowa team departed but Menma noticed the girl Kuritsuchi look at him speculatively before jumping away with the rest of her team. Enko sighed in relief, that was Kitsuchi the Great Earth Shaker. He is an S-class ninja of Iowa and slated to become the next Tsuchikage. During the last war he was famous for remodeling an entire forest into an earthen terrain for his allies. We were lucky they weren't hostile or we would have stood no chance. The Genins shivered, for their usually unflappable sensei to be wary spoke volumes of that man's skill. Menma looked at the sun which was approaching noon, well, we need to report this to the Hokage so let's head back as quickly as possible. Everyone nodded and they jumped into the forest heading at full speed back to Konoha. Hokage's office. Konoha, three days after the events at Shishiong, Minato's POV. Minato deadpanned at the report in his hands. How did AC rank turn into an encounter with a high A rank missing nin and then an encounter with the S class Iwa John and Kitsuchi? He sighed, well, I am glad that no one was injured during this mission. I am also proud that you three defeated Rogan the Butcher, the bounty on his head will be split among the four of you. He smiled a bit, I also want to thank you for returning that weapon back to Iwa. I have already been sent a message from the Tsuchikage with a thank you and the information that he is sending a genin team to the next chunin exams in Konoha. This is the first time Iwa has participated in a chunin exam sponsored by the village since the system was made. Enko grinned, all in a day's work Hokage-sama. He deadpanned at the Janin sensei I hope it isn't a daily thing, you were very lucky this time. However due to the unforeseen variables in this mission I bumped it up to A rank and you will earn the appropriate pay alongside the bounty of Rogan. Congratulations. Yukumo and Lee cheered while Menma smirked, the pay of an A rank mission would cover his living expenses for the next year. Konoha Streets, six months later, Menma's POV. The information that a genin team had killed the infamous Rogan the butcher spread like wildfire throughout the village. Rogan was one of the most hated Iowa shinobi from the last war. To hear that a genin team managed to kill him made them pretty well known throughout the village. Soon they got into the habit of training with Anko, doing some D ranks and the occasional C rank. However, none of their C ranks were as exciting as their first one. They had skipped the Chunin exams in Kumo along with Team 10. They heard that Team 7 and 8 disbanded due to two deaths and some promotions, leaving the spots open for this year's graduating class. Currently, he was spying on this year's graduating class. He wanted to scout out the competition and potential allies of the next generation. He also wanted to see the progress of his former sister. He noticed a few potential threats in the class. Uchiha Sasuke was the shinobi of the year at the moment while his sister, Uzumaki Namikaze Shio was the rookie and Kunoichi of the year. The dead last of their generation was an Inazaka member named Kiba, the younger brother to the clan heiress. Today for their class it seemed as if they were demonstrating ninjutsu. Sasuke did a fireball jutsu, as expected of an Uchiha member, it was their calling card after all. Kiba did his clan jutsu fang over fang. Most of the academy students did simple henges or bushin no jutsus. When it was finally Shio's turn she went through some hand seals and bit her thumb and yelled, Kuchio's no jutsu. And she appeared standing on a large frog. He froze, staring at the sight of the frog. He had known that Shio would eventually summon frogs but he had figured that she would not be given the contract until she was Chunin at least. 
He frowned angrily. He could not beat his sister if she had an entire clan of toads to back her up. Minato had held down the Kyubi with the boss summon of the toad clan, he would stand no chance. He dashed to his hidden training grounds thinking deeply. He needed a summoning contract, that was for sure. However the only contracts that he knew of in Konoha were the Nara clan's deer summoning contract, the Akamichi's butterfly contract, the tortoise contract of the Meita clan, and the toad contract belonging to his former family in Jiraiya of the Sanin. He frowned again, trying to summon without a contract is incredibly dangerous. However if one managed to gain a summoning contract through this method they're bound to get stronger. Many famous shinobi who had passed the test of their most naturally aligned clans became extremely famous ninjas. The best examples of this would be the three Sanin, each now S-ranked ninjas. He knew he would not stand a chance against the Toad clan, even if he was more powerful than their summoner. Feeling a steely resolve settle over him he left to find his sensei. Anko's apartment. Knocking on the door Menma waited for Anko. His sensei opened the door and looked at him annoyed. What do you want Gaki? There is no training for this week. He nodded. I know sensei I just wanted to inform you I am going to do some solo survival training in the forest of death for the next week and I will not be in contact. Anko nodded. Be careful Gaki. The tigers are a bit frisky since it's close to mating season. Menma nodded before running to the forest. When he was far enough in he breathed in a bit to calm himself. Summoning without a contract is not illegal but he would be the first unsponsored orphan to attempt this. All of the past people to summon animals without a contract either had special training from a clan or a high-ranking janin. He went through the hand seals he had memorized from Shio and bit his thumb before saying quietly, Kuchio's no jutsu. With that he disappeared in a plume of smoke. Uncount forest, Menma POV. Menma crouched down on the ground as he arrived looking around the area cautiously. The area he had landed on seemed to be pretty similar to the forest of death. He assumed he had summoned himself into a land creature's domain so that removed sea creatures or any type of bird. The area also did not look like a swamp so that removed reptiles. He looked around a bit more, expecting to see some overly large animal appear from the forest, but he could see nothing. What he did not know is that he is being watched at the moment. All around the forest tiny eyes peered at him as they considered the latest potential summoner. They had not had a potential contract holder for centuries. Menma continued to walk down the only path in the forest. He still did not see any potential summoning animal. He saw several insects, small animals, but none that seemed to be summonable. He pulled his larger crossbow from his back. He had bought this weapon from the latest shipment of weapons from the land of snow. The weapon ran on chakra and could reload arrows extremely quickly. He had made the weapon even more deadly by poisoning all of the arrows. Eventually he reached a clearing with an extremely large spider web. The web was constructed to look like a small city and was crawling with hundreds upon hundreds of spiders in different sizes. Some were as large as trucks while others the size of his fingernail. He put on his gas mask and cautiously approached the nest, wary of any potential attack. As he passed many of the spiders turned to look at him curiously, or at least he thought it was curiously. It was hard to tell their emotions. Soon he arrived the center of the nest where a large throne was erected. He was confused, why would a throne be here that was meant for a humanoid person? Before he could walk further hundreds of spiders converged on the throne, seemingly merging into a human. Soon the blob of spiders gained color and the person was revealed. She was a tall woman with flowing black hair, eyes that instead of a pupil had a classic spider web pattern. She wore a black dress with spider web pattern straps, arachne, soul eater. The lady smiled motherly at Menma and put a black fan in front of her mouth as she spoke, it has been so long since a human has entered this realm. We have been waiting so long for a true summoner of our race. He stared at the being in front of him, who are you? I doubt you are human if you are here. The women didn't seem offended, no I am not. My name is Arachne, the collective consciousness of all the spiders of this realm. He felt his eyes widened, so you are the hive mind of all of these spiders. Arish nodded, yes, only a few of the spiders here have true awareness like other summoning creatures. However an advantage of this is that I can control any spider, not only of this realm. For example I know that your family abandoned you. I know where each member of your family is. I even know that your mentor, Anko, burned her dinner last night and was forced to eat out. He gapped at such an information gathering ability. 
If what she was saying is true she had the power to see through the eyes of every spider on earth. That would outstrip any sensing ability he had ever heard of from anyone. He gulped a bit before becoming serious, what is your challenge to becoming a summoner of the spider clan? The women tapped her chin in thought, the spider clan had never had a test for their summoner because no one had ever wanted her contract. She looked at the young man before her, she knew everything about him that she saw through her spiders. She knew he was a driven young man that would become very powerful in the future. She licked her lips a bit and spoke, I know almost your entire life Menma, or should I say Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze. I know how powerful you can be in the future. Your fighting style is very similar to ours as well. I will give you the summoning contract. I wanted to gape at how easy that was but I retained control over my emotions this time. I thank you Queen Arish, could you please explain the abilities of your contract? Arish nodded, the spider contract is not one of the most powerful contracts in terms of open combat, but in terms of subversion, intelligence gathering, and assassination we are unparalleled. We are able to locate and listen to any conversation where a spider can access. Finally, we can teach you our brand of senjutsu. I couldn't help but widen my eyes at the last bit of information. Senjutsu was only from the most rare of contracts. Each clan had their own brand of senjutsu. From what he read from Minato's notes is that the Toad clan boosts one's abilities by a factor of 10. He looked at Arish seriously, what is the purpose of your senjutsu? Arish smiled her motherly smile and explained, our last summoner, Elise, was able to turn into a rather impressively large black widow spider. She gained the ability to access the collective consciousness of the spiders like I am able to. Finally, she gained the ability to use acid-based attacks. I believe she called it acid release. He thought of the possibilities of those powers. By being able to turn into a large spider would be extremely useful in combat. By entering the consciousness of every spider his sensory ability would be unparalleled. However, the acid release drew his attention the most, that ability would go perfectly with his fighting style. He looked at Arachne, how does one learn your style of senjutsu? Arish frowned a bit, other clans require you to absorb the air and nature chakra in the air. We use a special type of toxin to give you our abilities. However this toxin is extremely deadly and requires thorough training in resisting poisons. He smirked a bit at that, I have trained myself for six years in resisting poisons. I will be able to handle it. Arish smirked a bit, what a convenient summoner, Elise required years of poison resistance training before she was able to undergo the Vilma toxin. She took out an ancient looking vial from a spider and approached Menma. She cut herself with a knife and black blood flowed into a wooden goblet, filling it halfway. She then poured the crystal clear concoction from the vial into the cup, filling it to nearly the brim. She handed the cup to Menma and spoke seriously, this will hurt you more than anything that has happened in your life. It will feel as if every cell in your body is melting and every nerve cell will hurt horribly. We will wrap you in one of our healing cocoons until the process is complete. The Vilma toxin will take three days to fully integrate with your body. After that, if you live, it will take around a week for you to heal. Menma nodded and mentally prepared himself as he drank deeply from the goblet. As soon as he finished the drink spiders immediately started wrapping him in a cocoon. He barely acknowledged the spider silk around him as he felt an enormous amount of pain spreading through his body. The pain was worse than the time he overdosed on black window venom to immunize himself. As he started to pass out he thought of his friends, Lee's encouraging thumbs up and a sunny smile. Yukumo's soft smile, hands clasped behind her back as she encouraged him on. Anko's smirk as she told him to survive or she would find a way to make his afterlife hell. He smiled a bit in the cocoon. The pain seemed to dull a bit as he continued to think of his friend's encouragements. His precious people were waiting for him to return. Yeah, he would not die here. Forbidden Forest. Spider Realm 10 days after Vilma Venom was injected Menma POV. Menma slowly opened his eyes and looked around. He was laying on a hammock made out of spider silk in one of the cocoon-looking houses the spiders lived in. He got up from the hammock and rubbed his eyes a bit. His entire body felt sore from the senjutsu process. Though he could already tell some of the benefits of senjutsu. He could sense some spiders skittering around the forest. He could also tell that he had about 20% more chakra than normal. He sighed a bit before looking around the room, and saw a mirror and stepped in front of it. His eyes widened a bit. His once light blonde, almost white hair had turned midnight black. 
His bangs were longer, now hanging a bit past his chin, Medusa's hairstyle after absorbing arachne. Under his right eye there was a half spider web pattern. He sighed a bit looking at his face, Anko would flip out. Not only had he been gone for three days longer than he had told her but his change in appearance would also spark her rage. He sighed again before looking down and noticing his lack of cloths and he blushed. He looked around and saw some clothes laid out for him. There was a black sleeveless hoodie with two silver spider web patterns on the hood, baggy shinobi style black pants, and shinobi style black sandals. His gas mask laid on top of the clothes. He sighed a bit and put on the outfit and found them very comfortable. They felt like silk but seemed to be very durable. He left the cocoon home and found Arachne still sitting on her throne drinking some wine, or at least he hoped it was wine. She turned to him and smiled warmly, Ah, so you survived, good, your human friends have been worrying. I would return soon so you can calm them. He winced a bit at the reminder that his friends were most likely worried. He nodded to Arachne, Thank you for your help and the chance to become a summoner for this clan. I will make sure to honor the spider clan. Arachne chuckled a bit and waved her fan, no need to be so formal, it has been a long time since we have had a summoner and I so hope you bring some interest to this boring lifestyle of mine. Come back soon for some training in the art of our senjutsu. Also if you wished to summon me just do the normal summoning just su but also call out my name, I will come, ta ta. She snapped her fingers and Menma disappeared in a poof of smoke and she smirked a bit, what an interesting boy. Forest of Death Front Entrance, Konoha. As soon as he appeared in a poof of smoke he sweat dropped as he saw Anko at the front entrance, looking murderously at him. She marched up to him and hit him on the side of his head, hard, you little idiot. Do you know how worried I was when you did not come back the seventh day? No, of course you didn't you were off gallivanting with the spider clan. He looked at her wide eyes, how did she know he had interacted with the spider clan? Anko glared at him and continued, I know you signed the spider contract because every allied summoning clan knows when a new summoning bond is formed. You're lucky that the snakes have been allied with the spiders for generations and told me you were the one who accepted the contract or I would have alerted the village that you were missing. Menma sighed a bit at this, at least he would not have to explain to Anko the change of his appearance. He looked to the still furious face of Anko and spoke calmly, I needed an edge against Shio's toad so I took a calculated risk to get my own summoning contract. Anko whacked him upside the head again, you should have at least told me what you were attempting. I could have helped prepare you for the more unfriendly summoning clans. If you had been transported to the shark or alligator clan you would have had to prove yourself in combat against the son of their boss summon. They're famous for killing all potential summoners but the strongest. He winced a bit at that information, he really was lucky to get the spiders. Though he wondered what they would have done if Arachne had not approved of him and he shivered a bit. Anko seemed a bit calmer than before, we need to see the Hokage Gaki, he has called us in Team 10 for something. Hokage's office, Konoha. Soon Teams 9 and 10 were gathered in the Hokage's office waiting for him to speak. He looked at the teams, pausing on Menma to look at his new style and web markings before continuing his observations. Minato looked up from their files, Team 9 and 10 I have read your files and have been impressed by your two teams progress. However, as you know the next Chunin exams will be hosted in Konoha in 8 months. For the first time since the first Shinobi War all 5 nations will be competing. Both teams eyes widened, every nation would be competing in this Chunin exams. Menma stepped forward a bit, Hokage-sama, why is Kumo participating in this tournament? I thought the tensions were high between our two villages. Minato nodded, yes, we have not had the best relations with Kumo ever since the Hyuga incident. However, since four of the five nations were participating they decided to send a team as well. It is for this reason that I am not sending both your teams on any more C ranks until the Chunin exams. Everyone wanted to protest a bit but a look from the Hokage stopped them, I know it is a bit unfair but you will be receiving pensions for your lost earnings. I do not want any of you to be injured or potentially assassinated by competing countries while you are out of the village. You may be allowed to do D ranks but I want you all to train and do your best to prove your worth to the other nations in the next exams. Now everyone but Anko and Menma please leave, we still have one more thing to discuss. Everyone nodded and everyone but Anko and Menma left the room. Minato looked at Menma, I noticed you dyed your hair and got a tattoo, unfortunately you will have to retake your shinobi license photo. I wish you luck in the upcoming Chunin exams. 
Anko and Menma nodded and left to retake his shinobi license. Training Ground 9 Konoha, one hour after the Hokage meeting. All of the members of Team 9 were at their usual training ground. Lee and Yakumo were pestering Menma on the reason for his sudden change in look. He sighed a bit. I changed my look because I gained a summoning contract. Yukumo and Lee's eyes widened. Lee's eyes suddenly seemed to catch fire. Yush. That is so youthful Menma. With your comrades we will be able to increase our teamwork and our youth. Yukumo deadpanned a bit at Lee's usual behavior and turned to Menma. Congratulations Menma with your new summoning contract. With the web markings I'm guessing you are able to summon spiders. They would fit you. He nodded. Yes I have been accepted as their summoner. These changes are due to a process they did to make me more compatible with their techniques. After discussing the spider clan a bit more they began team training by including spiders of various sizes into their exercises. After three hours of this Lee had to go train with Guy for his afternoon practice and Yukumo had clan training. Anko went to hang out with Kuranai. Soon Menma was standing alone in the training field, contemplating what to do. He thought for a bit longer before running through some hand seals and bidding his thumb, Kuchio's no jutsu, arachne. The spider queen appeared and looked around a bit before smiling at Menma, it has been a while since I left the spider realm. However I did not expect to be summoned this early by you. What did you need? He looked at arachne seriously, I have eight months to prepare for the chunin exams, I would like you to train me in some of the skills the spider clan has access to. Arachne frowned a bit, Tapping her chin, in that amount of time you can learn the acid release and some of the less known techniques the spider clan utilizes with chakra strings. It takes years to learn the spider transformation and learning my sensory technique. He nodded, expecting that information, I would be willing to learn the acid release and could you explain some of the other skills you could teach me with chakra strings. Arachne nodded. Our chakra string techniques are the foundation of our spider silk techniques, we spread our chakra in a web formation to guide where we send our silk. However we discovered that we can use this chakra web to sense, ensnare, and kill our opponents. We adapted this technique for future summoners. Menma nodded, preparing for the training with Arachne. Konoha Academy, graduating day, six months after training with Arachne. During the six months that Arachne tutored him was quite enjoyable. He learned that Arachne, despite comprising all the knowledge and sentience of most of the spiders in the world had her own personality. She was a nice woman if a bit skewed morally wise. She viewed any spider as her son or daughter and had taken to calling him Egling. She had taught him a great deal in these six months. He had gotten acid release to a basic level and could use them like water ninjutis. He had also learned to form chakra strings from any tenkutsu of his body to form a web around him. This web can be used to detect people similar to the Byakugan. He could also channel his acid release through the web and cause various effects on his enemies. He could not inject too many lethal poisons into his chakra yet but he has managed to spread his acid release in a paralyzing mixture. He was spying on the graduating class again, leaning against the outer wall as he observed the graduates. Today was the day they would take their final exams to become genin. He spotted his former family some village nobles, and shinobi clans congratulating their children for graduating. Soon he spotted a head of blonde hair and focused on his former sister. She had changed from a little brat the last time he saw her to a young woman. She had a hairstyle similar to Minato's but had a spiky pony tail similar to Jiraiya of the Sanin. She wore a dark blue turtleneck and forest green shinobi pants with dark green shinobi style sandals. On the back of her shirt the Uzumaki swirl was imprinted. He felt the hatred he held for his sister and his former family rise to the surface but he kept it in check from showing on his face. He knew he would get his revenge in two months when they fought in the Chunin exams. He turned away and walked away, pulling up his hood as he did so. Shio's POV. Shio was having one of the best days of her life. She had woke up to see the smiling faces of her family and had rushed to get ready for the exams. When she had arrived at the classroom she met her friends and they talked for a bit before Aruka entered the room and handed out their tests. After the exams she was extremely proud of herself. She was finally a genin of Konoha. She would soon surpass her two san and become Hokage. Datbeo. She was basking in the happiness radiating from her parents. What she hadn't told her parents is she had the ability to sense emotions. This ability had emerged a year ago and she could not understand how she got it. However she had abused this ability to tell what other people thought of her. 
It came as a surprise to her when she felt a deep hatred being directed at her and her parents. She looked around and saw a boy leaning near the wall of the academy. He wore a leaf headband around his arm so he was a shinobi. He was probably one of the oddest people she had seen. He had black hair with front bangs that stretched down past his chin and spiked hair in the back. He had pupillous blue eyes with a spider web tattoo under his right eye. What caught her attention however was that he was radiating so much hatred. However, under the deep hatred she felt she could sense emotions such as sadness, envy, and loneliness. She turned to her Tu San and pointed at the boy who was walking away, Tu San who is that boy? Minato turned to the back of the boy she pointed to and said, that is Menma, he was the rookie of the year last year. He surprised many by beating several clan members for the top spot. Why? She looked at the retreating boy again thoughtfully, no reason Tu San. Hidden training ground, later that night, Menma POV. Menma was training in his chakra webs when he detected someone heading his way at Chunin speeds. He turned to look at the man approaching and saw the academy teacher Mizuki. He was holding a large scroll on his back that he recognized immediately, the forbidden scroll where he stole many of his techniques as a child. He went through some hand seals and used one of his latest techniques, acid release, sticky binding web no jutsu. This jutsu was one of the most simple acid release techniques. It allowed for an untoxic sap-like substance to travel along the web and quickly hardening while maintaining its stickiness. Soon the chakra strings around him became visible and Mizuki stuck to some of his web. He called out to his former sensei, Mizuki-san, I would ask that you surrender and return the forbidden scroll before I kill you. He took out his crossbow from the holster on his back to increase his threat. Mizuki looked enraged that he was being talked down to by a genin, as if I am going to surrender to you, I am an elite chunin while you're just a genin. He took off one of his two giant shurikens to cut the sticky rope binding him and threw it at Menma. Menma felt a truly twisted smile stretch across his face, this is the first true battle he had since Rogan and he was itching to test out some of his new abilities. He easily dodged the shuriken and went through some hand signs. His chest expanded a bit and he spoke, acid release, acid shot. Small balls of acid shot from his mouth in a gun-like fashion at Mizuki. He dodged and the balls of acid started to eat through the trees they hit. Mizuki looked at the damage wide-eyed, what the hell are you? You should only be a weak genin. He looked at the raging man and spoke, it's not that I'm too strong, it's just that you are too weak. With those words he took out his crossbow and channeled his chakra through it and started firing at the rapidly dodging Mizuki. Soon arrows could be seen sticking throughout the tree line in an intricate formation. What Mizuki could not see are the chakra strings connecting the arrows. His twisted smirk widened a bit and went through some hand signs again, acid release, paralytic scattering dew. Soon the web of chakra lines above them started to grow damp with acid and the lines started to rapidly vibrate, dripping almost like rainfall on their location, each blob of water a potent paralyzing solution designed to mimic morning dew. Soon Mizuki was drenched from the paralyzing rain. He started to walk up to Mizuki, a chakra scalpel forming in his hands. However he was distracted when his former sister Shio burst into the clearing, Mizuki. Return the forbidden scroll. She paused as she observed the situation. Mizuki was seemingly passed out on the ground and Menma was standing above him with glowing hands. She felt the sickening emotions of Mizuki and the cold feelings she felt from Menma earlier, what the hell happened here? Dadbeo. Menma smirked a bit at his former sister, I defeated the traitor Mizuki, your Anbu guard should be here to take him away soon. As soon as he said that two masked Anbu members dropped to the ground and took Mizuki somewhere. The two genin stood in silence for a bit before Menma turned and picked up the forbidden scroll and looked at Shio, come on, we should report this to the Hokage. Shio felt the bitter emotions when he spoke of the Hokage but didn't mention them, she was curious to why he seemed to hate her family so much. From what she could tell from his emotions he seemed to be using the hatred he felt for them to hide his sadness. They walked together a bit in silence before jumping on the rooftops the rest of the way to the Hokage's office. Hokage's office, Menma's POV. When they arrived at the office Menma put the forbidden scroll on the Hokage's desk and stepped back a bit. Minato opened the scroll to check the contents and nodded a bit, thank you Menma and Shio for retrieving this. I was in a meeting the council discussing team placements when he snuck into the office for the scroll. Shio scratched the back of her head a bit, erm, um, Tu-san I didn't really do anything, it was Menma who apprehended Mizuki. 
she felt the surprise radiating from Menma, did he think that she would take credit for something that she didn't do? Minato also seemed a bit surprised and turned to Menma, then thank you Menma for apprehending Mizuki. The penalty for stealing the Forbidden Scroll is death, and AB rank missing Nin status if he had managed to escape the village. You will earn the bounty on his head when he is put to death. Menma nodded, thank you Hokage-sama. Minato put the Forbidden Scroll in a hidden drawer in his desk and spoke, thank you again you two for returning this, I will see you later Shio, and good night Menma-san. They both nodded at the dismissal and left the room. Konoha Streets, 8 p.m., Shio's POV. They walked out of the Hokage building and stood apart from each other awkwardly. She cleared her throat, well, I hope to see you again, and find out why you seem to have so much buried pain against my family. Menma nodded and started to walk away. She frowned a bit at his back before turning around for home. Uzumaki Residence, Kashina's POV. Kashina was flipping through a picture album of her daughter. She was so proud that her little girl was a shinobi. However as she flipped through the pages and eventually arrived at a four-year-old Shio, she felt something snap inside her head. She gasped and dropped the book, running out of the house. The book lay where it fell, open showing the picture of Naruto's smiling face for the world to see. Menma's Mindscape A fox with two tails sat on top of the pond in Naruto's mindscape as he watched the hourglass shatter and sighed. It was almost time to reveal himself to his uncounting host. He hoped that he would understand his reasons for separating him from his family. He settled down on all fours and stewed in his guilt for causing another family to suffer because of the Uchiha. Hokage's office, Konoha, Kashina's Pav, one month before Chunin exams. Kashina was running through the streets of Konoha, her mind a mess. The skies seemed to reflect her mood as the clouds were dark gray with thunder in the distance. How could she have forgotten her own son? However, she was not hysterical enough not to notice the feel of a genjutsu lifting. If the genjutsu had any relation to why she had forgotten her Sochi then he or she would burn. She ran into the Hokage building and kicked open Minato's door. Minato looked up startled at his wife's sudden entry, Kashina. What is going? His words died off as he saw her teary face. Kashina looked at Minato teary-eyed, our son Minato. We forgot about our son. Earlier I was looking through a photo album and I saw a picture of him. Minato felt something shatter in his mind and immediately memories of Naruto flooded into his head. He sorted through a few of them and felt sickened as he put a hand over his forehead, why could I not remember my son? That felt like a genjutsu had been broken from my mind. Kashina brushed aside her tears, we need to find him Minato, who knows where he could have gone. He could be living on the streets. Minato rubbed his forehead thinking over the situation logically, he was devastated by this revelation. As an orphan himself he knew the pain of growing up without parents. But to have parents and seemingly have been abandoned by them, even unintentionally, he would feel hatred for his former parents and wish to get revenge. He looked at Kashina, we can't just announce to the whole village that our son is missing. With the Chunin exams coming up a scandal this huge of a Hokage abandoning their child could ruin the village in front of all the clients. Kashina looked angry, then we do what? Do nothing while my Sochi is out there somewhere. Minato shook his head, I never said that. I will gather every Anbu member and John in the village and tell them to search for Naruto discreetly. I will also send notes to the hospital to test the blood of all non-clan genin to see if any of them match our DNA. Kashina nodded whipping tears from her eyes as she looked fiercely at Minato, I do not care if our son hates us for our neglect, even if it was under the force of a genjutsu. It is probably too late to be his mother but I will be damned if I do not make sure that he is safe and offer our home to him again. Minato nodded with a pained expression on his face. She left the Hokage's tower with a determined expression on her face, she would search the records of the orphanages first before looking at the academy records to see if she could find anything on Naruto. Minato's office, Konoha, Minato's POV. As soon as Kashina left he buried his face into his hands. How could this have happened? He thought back to all the times in his life he could have been affected by Genjutsu to ignore his son. The only time he could think of someone having enough skill to cast a Genjutsu on him is the masked man from that night. He pulled out the files of all the genin from last year. He discarded the sheets of the clan heirs and children with alibis. Soon he was down to one candidate that could be Naruto. The folder showed the black-haired and blue-eyed Genin Menma. He discarded the difference in hair color and lack of pupil. Both could be results from dyeing one's hair and overtraining. 
His pupilous blue eyes also matched in color to his own. He opened the folder to the boy's history and discovered that he applied for orphan status at age 6 and said that he did not know his heritage. The boy applied for the academy at age 8 the next day and was rarely seen around the village until he entered the academy. He stood up. He needed to find Menma. Uzumaki Estate. Konoha, Shio's Pav, immediately after the wave mission. Shio and the rest of Team 7 had just returned from their sea turned A rank in the Land of Waves. It was a long mission and she was anxious to get home. Kakashi Sensei had told them they would report their mission tomorrow and they had the rest of the day off. She entered the estate and entered the house calling, I'm home. She looked around. That's strange, Kashina is usually at home by now, did Ka San go out? She entered the living room and saw a photo album laying open on the floor. She picked the book up and saw the picture of Naruto and felt a breaking sensation in her head and memories of her older brother came rushing to her head. She gasped and dropped the book in shock. Where was her Oni-san? She clasped her hands together as if in prayer and expanded her senses. She had been practicing Senjutsu with the Toads for over a month now and was able to grasp the basics of it. She created a shadow clone and had it meditate with her. Soon a red pigment surrounded her eyes and they snapped open revealing toad-like pupils. She stood up and left the clone meditating and went to where a faint presence of her brother's chakra could be felt. She entered one of their spare bedrooms they never really entered and saw a sparse room. There was a single bed, a desk stacked with books and notes, and a bookshelf. She went where she sensed the chakra and found a sealing tag on the desk. It was a beginner's seal that stored chakra like a battery for people who are learning fuinjutsu. She memorized her brother's chakra signature and sat down in a lotus position again and expanded her senses. She had never been able to sense that far before but she ignored that problem and kept expanding her sensing range until she was covering the entire village and the training grounds beyond. She opened her eyes and dashed out the window as she felt her brother's chakra signature at training ground 26. Training ground 26 Konoha, Menma's POV. Training ground 26 is a unique training ground in Konoha. Instead of a forested terrain the training ground is one large lake that has several large cliffs surrounding it. There were plenty of small islands on the lake and several waterfalls cascading down the cliff surfaces. This is the perfect training ground for training for underwater fighting, water ninjutsu, or water walking. Currently Menma was practicing the final step of water mastery training, reversing the flow of a waterfall. He wanted to complete this exercise before the Chunin exams. He was about to continue his training when he felt a presence behind him. He was surprised when he saw Shio standing there looking at him with an unreadable expression. He tried to control the hate he felt for the girl but as always it came bubbling up to the surface whenever she was near. He glared lightly, what do you want, I do not want you to interrupt my training. Shio frowned a bit and spoke, Naruto Oni-san. He froze when he heard his former sister speak that name. His eyes narrowed in hate as he stared at her. I do not know what you are talking about. I am not your brother. Shio did not flinch but her hands balled into fists, I know your chakra signature, I do not know why I forgot you for so long but I remember now. I know without a doubt that you are Naruto my brother. Please come back home and we can be a family again. Menma scowled a bit, even if I was your brother I am not now. Your pathetic parents never had time for the lesser siblings so why should I even think of returning to that home? He felt his anger grow a bit more as the web marking under his eye seemed to expand a bit down his cheek. Shio seemed to be getting angry and shouted, I do not know why they would forget about you but I know my parents. They would never leave any child of theirs behind. The Uzumaki family never abandoned their own. Naruto glowered at Shio and shouted back, You may believe in your parents but I gave them many opportunities to notice me. I shouted at them, begged them, prayed for them to notice me but they always shoved me away to focus on you. He felt his hatred grow as he felt the toxicity of his blood increase in response to his anger. Shio seemed to steal herself, if you refuse to come home. She unsealed her nodashi. The sword was as tall as she was and had a plain black grip with an ornate steel guard. She got into her stand with the blade pointed behind her in a crouched stance and sprinted forward while shouting, then I will force you. Shio used her wind manipulation around her blade and twisted around in a graceful arc before swinging her sword, sending a strong slash of wind at Menma while shouting, majestic slash of the heavenly breeze. He scowled a bit before activating his chakra scalpel and cut through the wind slash, cutting the strike in two pieces that slammed into the cliff behind him, deeply scaring it. 
He knew close combat against Shio would be suicide, her wind manipulation and sword skills were almost unrivaled in the village. His arrows would be useless against her wind but he had one advantage over her. They were on water. He sped through some hand seals before shouting, acid style, water spider bombs. Out of the water bubbled medium-sized spiders made out of water with a red dot in the center. They all dashed at Shio with medium speeds. Shio quickly spun around in a pirouette causing a cyclone of wind and water to come up around her as the water spiders jumped at her, exploding violently as they came in contact with the wall of wind and water. Soon the water wall was cut in half as another blade of wind cut through it at him. He ran through four hand seals before calling out, water style, hardened water wall. The lake surged underneath them as a hardened wall of water blocked the wind blade. He channeled chakra through his hands again and went through three more hand seals, acid style, giant spider bomb no jutsu. From the large wall of water a huge spider with a glowing red core emerged and pounced on Shio and exploded on her. He stood there still on guard, he doubted that spider would have killed her. Soon out of the spray of water from the bomb he could hear a slightly whirling of wind and widened his eyes at the sight before him. Around Shio there were four large fan-like blades spinning around her forming a shield. He inspected the blades a bit, so this is the famed chakra manipulation of the Namikaze Uzumaki family. Many people speculated what Minato could do with Kashina's ability to harden her chakra outside of her body. I guess this is the result. Shio nodded, yes this is my true sword style, dance of the five blades. Please surrender Naruto, you will not be able to defeat me. He narrowed his eyes. He knew he had no chance against her in melee combat, normally. He formed his chakra scalpels around his hands but this time used pure acid release chakra instead of medical chakra and acid began to drip off his hands as they turned black. He spread out a chakra web around his body to increase his sensory and also began to use senjutsu. His eyes gained the same spider web insignia that Arachne had and the whites of his eyes turned black. He glared at Shio with his new eyes and spoke, I will not surrender to you, I dedicated my life to defeat you and I will prove myself to be stronger than you. With those words he went through several hand seals with his poison palms and shouted, Acid release, Dokukiri no Jutsu. Soon most of the entire battlefield was filled with a purple mist. Shio stood inside the mist, her blades of chakra circling around her forming a ball of pure air to prevent the poison from affecting her. Soon out of the mist Menma appeared, with his chakra scalpels about to cut her. Before he could reach her however his shoulder was stabbed by one of the floating blades of chakra. Menma widened his eye before smirking as he dissolved into acid. Shio scowled. Those clones were incredibly dangerous, if she killed one of them close to her body they would cover her in acid. She went through some hand seals before inhaling some air, wind style, great breakthrough. And a huge gust of air was unleashed from her mouth and the poison mist was blown away. Once the mist dissipated she was surrounded by ten Naruto's. She glanced around trying to tell which one was real. She scowled a bit, one wrong move would have her covered in acid. She spun around and unleashed a circular slash around her that bisected all of the clones and raised a wall of wind around her to prevent the resulting explosions of acid from reaching her. She stood tense for a few seconds before she felt glowing hands clamp around her ankles, she screamed as she felt her tendons were cut and Menma rose out of the water behind her, chakra scalpels glowing around his hands. He sneered at her, end of the line, he raised his hands in a cross fashion, presumably to decapitate her when she went through some hand seals and bit her thumb, summoning no jutsu. He jumped away just in time for a huge red toad to appear in a puff of smoke. Shio panted a bit from the summoning cost of Gamabunta and felt the Kayubi's chakra healing her cut tendons and stood up. Gamabunta looked annoyed as he stared up at Shio, why did you call me up here Gaki? Shio looked at the huge frog underneath her and said, I am fighting my lost brother, we need to knock him out and return him home so dad and mom can explain what is happening. Gamabunta looked increasingly annoyed, and don't you think summoning me is a bit over, he would have continued but he heard a shout of, summoning no jutsu, interrupted him and in a large burst of smoke a spider almost as large as Gamabunta appeared. Menma was standing on the head of the beast and spoke calmly, Aragog let us fight together against this toad. He felt the spider under him shift a bit and it spoke in a deep voice, yes summoner, this toad will feed our clan for a long time. Shio gaped at the sight of the spider, how did he brother get his hands on the spider summoning contract? Gamabunta under her shifted a bit as he gripped his giant tonto, 
I had heard rumors of a new spider summoner but I didn't believe them, however I've always enjoyed fried spider legs. Soon the two titans were battling, reshaping the training ground as their attacks broke the cliff sides around them. Their summoners offering assistance with elemental attacks and alerting their summon to dangers. Aragog seemed to rely on trapping Gamabunta in webs while the toad kept slicing through the webs and dodging the pincer attacks. After a few minutes of intense combat between the two animals they were both on their last legs. Gamabunta looked up at Shio and spoke, Ha 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 I am only good for around one more attack Gaki, let's make it count. Shio looked down at Gamabunta and nodded. Gamabunta's mouth swelled with oil and he spat it out in torrents at Aragog while Shio used the fireball jutsu to light the oil on fire, making a huge gout of flames at the spider. Aragog quickly formed a large web in front of him while Menma went through hand signs and combined the web with his water chakra to create a huge wall of water that blocked the large sea of flames. As the steam cleared from the amount of flames hitting the cold water both Menma and Shio were panting as they gazed at each other from opposite sides of two cliff faces. Shio lifted her head and back inside her room at the estate her shadow clone poofed into smoke. Nature chakra surged into Shio and she went into sage mode. As she entered sage mode she remembered a warning from Pa about sage mode. Flashback. Shio and Pa Toad were sitting across from one another, Shio in sage mode as Pa observed. After a few minutes of sage mode she began to feel herself lose control of the energy before she felt a harsh smack of a stick on her head. Pa looked proud of Shio, well Shio Chan it looks like you are able to stay in sage mode for around 5 minutes before you begin to lose control of the energy. If you are forced to use Senjutsu before you finish your training, make sure to only stay in the mode for 5 minutes only. End flashback. Menma scowled as he felt the nature chakra enter Shio. He barely had any chakra left after blocking Gamabunta's flame toad bullet. He was thinking of his next action when he remembered something that Arachne told him. Flashback. Arachne was standing in front of Menma as he practiced acid release, Naruto, come here. Naruto looked over curiously and walked closer to Arachne. She smiled at him with her usual sleepy expression and spoke, I wanted to speak to you about learning partial spider transformation. This form usually takes around a year and a half to master. However there is another way to use it. Naruto looked interested, how can I use the transformation without training for its sensei? Arachne spoke seriously, if you summoned me in battle, we could merge and I could force the transformation for a short period of time, around 5 minutes max in battle. Naruto looked thoughtful, I will remember that sensei, thank you. End flashback. Menma went through some hand seals, summoning jutsu, Arachne. Soon in a puff of smoke Arachne appeared. She smiled at him and nodded, already knowing what they wanted. She reached down and kissed him on the lips, merged with him. Soon power exploded off of Naruto as the spider web pattern in his eyes seemed to glow and expand across his eyes and four pincer-like claws exploded from his back and he felt fangs growing from his mouth. He also felt his muscles grow denser as he finished merging, the form is a male version of Elise from Law. Naruto and Shio stared at each other for a bit before dashing at each other and slammed their fists against one another and a shockwave blew the water away around them as they engaged in fierce taijutsu battle. Shio had the advantage of her frog kata and increased physical ability while Naruto had four extra appendages to fight with and his own increased strength. They jumped around the battlefield, both sides never yielding as they continued to fight fiercely against one another. As they fought they started to feel the other's reason for fighting. Naruto felt Shio's regret and determination to remove him of his hatred. Shio felt Naruto's anger and sadness from being abandoned, but also his determination to prove himself stronger than her. Soon after five minutes they both were facing each other, panting heavily, the extra features of Senjutsu gone as they stared at each other. Shio panted as she spoke, I only have enough chakra for one more jutsu and I'm sure it is the same for you, let's end this. She lifted her hand a green Rasengan formed in it, spiraling fiercely as it started to rain and thunder around them. She jumped forward and yelled, Rasengan. Naruto stretched both arms out, one gripping the other as a ball of incredibly toxic venom formed a sphere in his hands that had six legs and a dark red core Arachne's soul. He jumped to meet Shio shouting, Queen Venom Bomb. The attacks collided in a large blast of energy, the toxic bomb meeting the maelstrom of the Rasengan. The two attacks fought against each other for dominance. Soon however both techniques exploded causing a massive implosion of the wind-saturated chakra meeting the highly toxic acid. 
When the explosion died down both Naruto and Shio were knocked unconscious on some fallen rubble side by side. The rain continued to fall on their forms as they ended the titanic battle. Soon Minato jumped down near them staring sadly at their two forms. He felt great sadness that they had to fight in such a titanic battle. They should be living happily together, not trying to kill each other. He felt tears roll down his cheeks as he felt like a failure. What was the point of being the strongest ninja alive today if he couldn't even protect his family? He looked up at the rain in pain before he made a shadow clone to carry Naruto and Shio to the hospital. Inside Naruto's mindscape, Naruto opened his eyes to find himself laying on a large pond surrounded by forest. Around the pond were large torii. He looked around and spotted a small fox with two tails sitting in front of him. The fox seemed to be looking at him with understanding and pity as it spoke, let us talk Naruto Uzumaki. Naruto's mindscape, area unknown, Naruto's POV. Naruto looked around the landscape before focusing back on the two-tailed Kitsune, who are you, and where is this? The Kitsune looked a bit amused before it spoke, I am the former nine-tailed fox, the great Kyubi no Kitsune and we are in your mindscape. He felt his eyes widen, why are you here when you should be sealed within my sister? The Kyubi chuckled, yes, I should be sealed within your sister if I had not inserted a tiny portion of my chakra into you before I was sealed. As you grew so did the yokai chakra inside of you, allowing it to hold my consciousness. Naruto glared suspiciously at the Kyubi, why would you escape from Shio's seal just to seal yourself into me? Without a seal holding you back you could escape from my body easily. The fox nodded, yes, I could escape from your body at any time, however I have no wish to do so. I gave up most of my chakra to move to your body so I am much weaker than before. Your body gave me anonymity from my enemies as well as a safe haven to restore my former strength. Naruto nodded, understanding the logic, and what happens when you recover your strength, will you attack Konoha again? The Kyubi shook his head, no, I have no interest in Konoha or its people. I was forced to attack Konoha by Madara Uchiha. He narrowed his eyes, Madara Uchiha died years ago in the battle against the first Hokage. The Kyubi's eyes glowed angrily, that is a lie. Madara Uchiha is alive and forced me to attack Konoha. He also used his eternal Mangeku Sharingan eyes to force your parents to abandon you. Naruto's eyes widened and remembered what Anko once told him. Flashback. Anko looked at Menma seriously, no parents just spontaneously forgets and neglects their children. Even if they focused more on their sister they would never have forgotten you. It is not in human nature. End flashback. He had ignored her advice then too caught up in his desire to revenge to give it much thought. But it did make sense. However he remembered from reading about the Shinto religion that Kitsunes were master manipulators. He looked at the Kyubi, how do I know you're not just twisting the truth for your own benefit? I know that Kitsunes are masters of illusions and manipulation, how do I know that you weren't the one who cast the Genjutsu on my parents? He almost missed it but the Kyubi's eyes flickered a bit with guilt before returning to his regular calm expression, that's it isn't it, you were the one who cast the genjutsu on my parents when you injected me with your yokai. Afterwards you would tell me it was Madara Uchiha to spark my rage towards him. The Kyubi sighed deeply, you are smarter than I gave you credit for ninjin. Yes, I used an illusion to force your parents to ignore your existence. In a flash Naruto had a chakra scalpel out and tried to cut the Kyubi but nine balls of an ethereal flame stopped him. The Kyubi had not even flinched, do not tempt me ninjin, despite only having a fraction of my former power I am more than enough to deal with you easily. Naruto scowled at the reason for his abandonment in hatred, then why would you do it, why would you force my parents to abandon me? For your own sick amusement, answer me. The Kyubi was silent for a few seconds before sighing heavily. If nothing else the boy in front of him deserved the truth, very well ninjin, but know this. To understand my reasons for manipulating your life, we must go to the very beginning, the world around them shifted until Naruto saw two giants, one male and one female, fighting each other. The male had an aged face with long white hair and wore a simple monk's robes with prayer beads adorning it. The woman was beautiful with dark black hair and wore a beautiful white kimono. Their fight was on the level of gods, reshaping the earth, destroying continents, and obliterating anything caught in the crossfire. The Kyubi appeared next to him and explained, in the very first stages of our world, Azanagi fought his wife, Izanami. The argument was whether or not to share their powers with the humans of the world. 
Azanagi wished to share his power with the humans and spread peace while Izanami wished to rule over all humans with an iron fist and keep them weak and helpless. The battle shaped the world to how it is today. At the very end of the battle, Azanagi reigned victorious over his former wife. The scene depicted the man stab a sword through the woman's heart. As she fell to the ground she glared up at her husband and issued a prophecy, One day my husband, I will return to this world in one form or the other. You have only delayed my plans. Azanagi looked at his wife sadly before speaking, You shall never walk amongst the land of the living my beloved, I banish you to Yami for the rest of eternity. You shall be the seal that protects this world from the realms beyond. Azanagi lifted a monk's staff and a black void engulfed Izanami. Kayubi continued his explanation, however uncount to Azanagi at the time, is that Izanami had one last trump card. The seed of the Ashinju tree. The Shinju is a sentient tree that grows in the deepest regions of Yami. Anyone who eats the fruit of Ashinju will be terribly cursed, but gain tremendous power. Izanami injected a small piece of her power into the seed and buried it before she was sealed away. The scene shifted again to show numerous wars and bloodshed until a great tree emerged from the blood of the fallen warriors and grew to a huge height, a fruit that looked like a peach at the very top. The Kayubi looked upon the scene sadly before continuing, eventually the Shinju tree grew from the blood of fallen warriors, producing its tainted fruit. It stayed there for many years before a princess, tired of the war and bloodshed ate the fruit and gained its power to end the wars in the world. The scene showed a black-haired girl climbing to the top of the Shinju before gorging herself on the fruit. After it was eaten she fell to the ground in pain. Her hair and eyes turned white. She grew a third eye and horns and the rabbit goddess Kagaya was born. With the power of the Shinju she ruled the world fairly for a time. However, eventually the energies of Izanami began to twist Kagaya. Soon Kagaya became a tyrant and demon, enforcing her rule on the world with a heavy fist. With Izanami whispering in her ear she began to use the Shinju to drain the life force of her subjects, increasing her own power. Azanagi, finally stepping in to stop Kagaya, bestowed upon her son's two gifts, to the older brother he gave the Rinnegan. To the younger brother he gave the Byakugan and the power to manipulate his body. When Kagaya learned of this she merged with the Shinju to create a terrible beast known as the Jubi. The scene showed a monstrous beast with ten tails battling two men. The battle continued for many days until the older brother Hagoromo sealed the Jubi's chakra inside himself while his brother sealed the Jubi's body and in the moon and casted it out to space. After the battle both brothers were considered mortal gods. Hagoromo became known as the sage of the six paths while his brother was hidden in obscurity. Eventually both brothers found wives and started families. These children eventually started the Uchiha, Senju, Hayuga, and Kagaya clans. Nearly a hundred years later on his deathbed, Hagoromo gathered nine animal spirits he had befriended and gifted each of them a piece of the Jubi's chakra, creating the nine biju. I received the largest portion of the chakra. With his last breaths he told us to never let the Shinju be revived or it would drain all life on the planet, allowing Kagaya to escape from her prison. However, he also made his younger son, Asura his heir. This caused the feud between the Senju and Uchiha to fester for centuries. Eventually after years of fighting, the heir of the Uchiha and Senju clans, Madara and Hiroshima made a truce to create a ninja village. Years later Madara found a tablet left behind by Hagoromo that spoke of the Jubi and its power. Corrupted by this knowledge he began to plan to become the Jinchuriki of the Jubi like his ancestor. This led him to fake his death in his battle between Hiroshima and himself. In the shadows he began to make plans to gather the nine biju. I had been sealed in Mito Uzumaki during the battle and that gave him the idea of Jinchuriki. Gathering the nine biju by himself would be suicide, but kidnapping their sealed containers would be child's play. He manipulated the budding villages at the time to seal the biju inside of humans and use them as weapons of war. While the nations battled each other he started to form his own organization, the Akatsuki. Now he hopes to revive the jubi to become its Jinchuriki, becoming a mortal god like Hagoromo so long ago. What he does not know, however, is that the Jubi contains Kagaya and a bit of Izanami's essence, which would recreate the Shinju and absorb him, and all life in the elemental nations, weakening the seal on Izanami enough so she can escape, dooming all life on the planet. Naruto was wide-eyed at this information, he had just learned the origin of the ninja world. He glared at the Kayubi again, who are you? A normal animal spirit would not know of all of this. 
The Kayubi chuckled and a spirit outline of a white fox with nine tails surrounded the Kayubi, you are correct young mortal, I was not just a fox spirit but the god of foxes, Inari Okami. I befriended Hagoromo and he sealed the largest piece of the jubi into me for safekeeping. Naruto felt a bit confused, are you saying a god was able to be subjugated by Madara to do as he wished? Inari winced, an unforeseen complication. The jubi chakra contained within me allowed him to control me. I assume Hagoromo knew this but thought that the Sharingan could be used to stop us if we went on a rampage. Instead it was used to enslave the biju. It was for this reason I gave up my chakra to enter you. I am now free from the Jubi's chakra and restored to my previous position as the fox god, Inari Okami. The god bowed its head in shame, however, I was very weak. Any opponent that killed you would have taken me with you. So I had to give you the one gift that would have protected you, anonymity. As the son of Minato Namikaze, you would have been exposed to assassination attempts and much more enemies than a nameless orphan. This gave me enough time to gather enough strength to protect myself. Naruto understood the reasons why Inari would do what he did, that does not mean that he had to like it. So you're telling me that you made my life hell just so I could be some pawn in the god's game of life. Inari seemed to look at him in pity, yes, from the moment you were born you were chosen to be one of the three prophecy children to save this world from the resurrection of Izanami. The mindscape seemed to shift and revert back to the pond and a door appeared behind Naruto. Inari stood in the middle of the lake and spoke, you may hate me Naruto, but I did what is necessary. If Izanami no Okami is revived, the world is doomed. Naruto looked back at the fox before turning around and walked through the door. Konoha Hospital, Minato's POV. Minato sighed as he gazed at the unconscious figure of his estranged son. He had run a blood test on Menma and found out that he is Naruto Uzumaki. However what worried him is the other DNA found in his blood. The doctors reported it seems as if someone or something took a chunk out of Naruto's DNA and replaced it. The medic nin who did the blood test theorized that the extra DNA is the reason for his changed appearance. Shio had woken up several hours after the battle and received a severe tongue lashing and grounding for being so reckless. When she had described the battle they were amazed at their former son's skills. Minato assumed that Naruto was the new spider summoner that the toads had been hearing rumors about. When he had heard that Shio had used rudimentary senjutsu against Naruto he almost flipped. Senjutsu is an incredibly dangerous skill. If one is not old enough to contain the energies they could turn to stone. However he was surprised when he heard that Naruto merged with some summoned woman and entered a form of sage mode himself. He assumed it was similar to when Ma or Pa would merge with Jiraiya and gather sage chakra as he fought. Still, Shio was feeling the stress of her sage mode by being sore in every single one of her muscles. The price of going into sage mode too early is that the body cannot handle the strain, causing ripped muscles and other injuries. She was lucky she did not go over the limit or she could have been crippled. He perked up as he saw Naruto stirring and opening his eyes. Naruto's POV. Naruto opened his eyes to see the white room of the hospital. He looked around and saw his former father sitting there. He was surprised to feel none of the hatred he formerly felt for the man. He guessed all of his hatred was not directed at Madara, Inari, and the rest of the gods. Deep down he knew Minato was not at fault, who could resist the genjutsu of a god. Especially the god of foxes who specialize in illusions. He struggled to sit up, he was still feeling the after effects of using sage mode without training. By fusing with arachne she forces the process of transformation, which is very taxing on the body. He looked at Minato again and waited for the man to speak. Minato seemed to gather his thoughts together before he spoke, I grew up an orphan. My parents died during the second shinobi war and I was put in an orphanage. It was not a bad childhood, but living without parents is a very lonely existence. When I married Kashina I swore I would give my children the best childhood that I missed out on. Then you were born and we were so happy. I had just become Hokage and thought life could not get better. He seemed to grow weary and sighed heavily before he continued, then the Kayubi attack happened as your sister was born. Everything was such a mess, Kashina fighting for her life in the hospital, my daughter now a Jinchuriki for the strongest of the Biju and the third Hokage dead. He seemed to contemplate how to continue before he spoke again, recently, Kashina and I felt as if a Genjutsu was lifted. We cannot be sure who placed the illusion other that it must have been incredibly powerful for us to notice. Unknown to Minato but his words confirmed what Inari had said in his mindscape. 
Naruto looked out the window as he considered Minato's words, ever since I was five and I was locked out of the estate I swore revenge against your family. Minato winced at his former son's words but let him continue. I trained every day to prove that I was better than my sister. I knew she was going to get training from at least four cage level ninja. So I practiced what she would not expect, medical ninjutsu, poisons, and other subjects. But now I've recently learned that my parents were under a genjutsu the entire time and that it was not entirely their fault. He paused unsure how to continue before speaking again, I do not have any more hatred towards your family Minato-san. Minato looked resigned as he figured that Naruto was not done, he was correct. He continued, but I do not think that I can ever be a true part of your family. All those years of hating your existence cannot be erased so easily. Minato sighed resignedly, I thought as much. However know that you have the full support of our family if you need it. You can also come back to the estate any time you wish if you want to interact with the family again. However I would expect a visit from Kashina soon, she was nearly broken about learning that we had abandoned you, even unintentionally. He nodded, he had expected that. Minato stood up and was about to leave the room before turning back, I am proud of the man you are today, Naruto. He left the room. As the door closed Naruto closed his eyes a bit and thought of the situation, he felt so confused, should he hate Izanami for causing all of this? Madara for continuing her work. Or Inari for serving the greater good in separating him from his family. He looked around the room and saw a small spider on the window and smiled a bit, Arachne. In a poof of smoke Arachne was in the room sitting on the chair that Minato vacated, a concerned look on her face. He explained the situation and what he had learned from Inari as she sat there and listened quietly. When he had finished she reached out and hugged him as she stroked his hair, it is all right to be confused Naruto. However all you can do is look to the future and decide your own destiny. Even if the gods had planned your life does not mean you have to follow your path to their wishes. You can be whatever you wish to. What the gods never understood is that humanity's greatest gift is to not be bound by the strings of fate. You can adapt, grow, and gain experience to meet this threat head on. I have faith in the summoner of the spider clan that you can break the web binding you to the gods plan and find your own path. She kissed him on the forehead and sat with him looking out the window, thinking of the situation and how to proceed. On top of Konoha Monument, three day after being released from the hospital, Naruto's POV. Naruto stood on top of the third Hokage's head and looked out towards the village. It was raining lightly so he had his hood up. His entire life had changed drastically over the past few days. The fight with his sister, the revelation of Inari, and the visit from his parents while in the hospital. He closed his eyes as he remembered the conversation he had with his mother. Flashback. Minato had left an hour ago before he felt another presence though his chakra webs. He sighed a bit before the door opened and revealed his former mother, Kashina Uzumaki. She did not look well. Her hair was uncombed and her eyes were red and puffy. Before he could say anything she rushed at him and hugged him while crying. He didn't know what to do, I don't know how to deal with this he thought. Kashina managed to speak through her tears, Sochi I am so sorry. We never meant to abandon you. He awkwardly pat her on the back as she continued to apologize for his abandonment. Eventually she managed to pull herself together a bit to speak clearly, when I realized that you were gone I felt so horrible. Both Minato and I know how it is to grow up without parents, and to unknowingly bestow the same fate to our son. She seemed to lose a bit of her composure and started to cry again. Naruto's gaze softened a bit as he observed his mother. This was further proof that they did not intentionally abandon him. No wood could fake that kind of sadness. He sighed a bit and spoke, when I learned that you abandoned me due to a genjutsu, I did not know what to think. After Minato explained his childhood, I doubted either of you would ever abandon me purposely. He looked down and touched his web markings, if you had not forgotten me I would have never have become as skilled in the subjects that I am today. I would never have met the spider clan, or would I have met Anko. He looked at the hopeful face of Kashina, I used to hate you too. It was my purpose for growing strong. I swore when I was locked out of the house to become stronger than all of you. But now my hatred for you has disappeared. However, I doubt I can ever think of you or Minato as my parents. Kashina started crying silently again but nodded in understanding. Naruto lifted his hand and smiled a bit, but that does not mean we can't be friend. Kashina looked a bit shocked but laughed a bit and shook Naruto's hand, sure. 
End flashback. He was still in thought when he heard footsteps behind him and he opened his eyes to see his teammate Lee. Lee smiled a bit. I thought you would be here. Naruto returned to looking out at Konoha. I like to come here to think. Lee walked up next to him. You seem to be coming up here a lot. He snorted a bit and smirked. That just means I have a lot to think about. Lee grinned. I know how to clear some of your questions. He looked at Lee curiously as he followed him to a training ground. Lee spun around in the Goken stance, in the midst of battle you will be able to relight your flames of youth. Naruto looked confused a bit before he laughed, are you sure you want to fight me dead last? Lee grinned wider as he charged forward at blistering speeds, I am sure I can provide a worthy challenge Mr. Rookie of the Year. He grinned wider and reinforced his body with the numerous toxins in his blood and rushed forward to meet Lee's punch. One hour later, both Lee and Naruto are laying in the practice field exhausted when they both looked up to see Yukumo and Anko's smiling faces. They all started to laugh and joke around while Naruto was inwardly thinking, I can't see you guys as family because I already have a perfect one right here. Konoha Academy, day of the Chunin exams, five hours before exam, Naruto's POV. Naruto, Lee and Yukumo are walking through the hallways of the academy making their way to the third floor for the first test of the Chunin exams. They had arrived early to spy on the competition and find a good unnoticeable position. Over the past few days they saw many foreign genin teams from across the five great villages and nobles arrive in Konoha for the exams. It was a miracle that no incidents were reported besides a small altercation with Asuna and Konoha team. They all noticed the small genjutsu on the second floor but Naruto quickly whispered, don't point it out, the less competition the better. Team 9 soon arrived at the testing room and saw there were not many teams in the room this early. There was only teams from Kumo, Sand, Kiri, and Iwa. The Kumo team had a blonde with generous, er, assets alongside a red-haired tan skin girl and a tan boy with white hair sucking on a lollipop. The Suna team consisted of a makeup-wearing boy in a onesie, a blonde girl with a large fan on her back, and a red-haired teal-eyed boy with a large gourd on his back. The Kiri team had a boy wearing sound dampeners with a large fish-shaped two-handled sword on his back wrapped in bandages, a flamboyant-looking boy in a large blue coat, and a tan boy with a trident strapped to his back. The Iowa team was the same team they had seen on their first C-rank mission. Naruto assumed that Iowa held them back to participate in this exam to demonstrate their strength. None of the teams spoke to each other as more and more teams trickled in. Naruto recognized all of this year's rookie genin teams. Nothing interesting happened until Shio's team entered. Shio had been teamed up with Sasuke Uchiha and Kiba Inazaka. He kept looking around the room before he heard his name. I would like to know the information on Mito Gekko, Gara of the Desert, and Menma. He looked at the group again and saw Team 7 standing before someone he recognized. He walked over before Kabuto could say anything, Ah, hey Kabuto, never thought I would see you outside of the hospital. Naruto had met Kabuto while working part-time at the hospital. They often discussed different medical practices and theories. Shio looked up surprised at seeing her brother, Oh. Hey Nar I mean Menma how do you know Kabuto? Kabuto pushed up his glasses a bit, I know Menma kun from working at the hospital, we usually work shifts together. Anyway, the information. He pulled out a card, Mito Gekko, daughter of two of the premier swordsmen and swordswomen of Konoha, Hayate Gekko and Yaguo Uzumi. She was almost the kunoichi of the year last year but lost due to her lower marks in genjutsu and throwing skills. She has been on 5 C ranks and 48 D ranks. It says here that her kenjutsu skills are off the charts, as expected growing up with two masters of the art. Her teammates are Neji Hayuga and Tenten. Naruto kept an eye on the crowd as Kabuto listed the information and saw that the teams from Kumo and Kiri were interested in the kenjutsu information. As expected since those two villages were renowned for their kenjutsu users. Kabuto pulled out the second card, Gara of the Desert, not much information on him seeing as he is from a foreign village but I have here that he has come back from every mission without a scratch, even on a B-ranked mission. Everyone's eyes widen at that information. The white-haired medic pulled out a third card, Menma, one of the only orphans besides Minato Namikaze to become Rookie of the Year. Specializes in poisons and medical ninjutsu. He has been on 1A rank mission, which is very impressive, and 10 C ranks and 67 D ranks. His teammates are Yukumo Kurama and Rock Lee. Kabuto kept monologuing information but Menma had lost interest and was observing the crowd. 
Soon after a small incident with some sound genin in a poof of smoke several chunin and morino ibiki appeared out of a shunshin. He quieted the room with his mere presence and barked out orders, All right all you little brats, I am the examiner of the first section of the chunin exams. The first part of the exam is a written test. Everyone starts out with 10 points, if anyone is caught cheating they will lose half their points. Soon after everyone was settled Naruto found himself between Kuritsuchi and the boy from Kumo. 15 minutes into the test and Naruto could only answer three questions, each requiring about Jonin level poison expertise or doctor level medical knowledge. He discreetly glanced around the room at all of the Chunin watchers. Why would they go to such great lengths to try and detect cheating? Ibiki could probably tell if anyone was trying to cheat him by himself blindfolded. He glanced towards the competitors nearest him and widened his eyes minutely when he saw Shiori Nara a few places away from him. He knew for a fact that she had graduated from the Chunin exams last year. So why is she here? He thought back to Ibiki's words. Anyone caught cheating will lose half their points. Why not just remove the person who cheated immediately? That is what they did back in the academy. He paused. What if they want us to cheat? He discreetly looked around at some people and saw a few genin discreetly cheat, good for genin, but someone like Ibiki could easily spot it. He assumed that their cheating strategies were good enough for Chunin so the proctors did not point it out. He smirked a bit. Closing his eyes he spread his chakra web around him and latched onto the tenkatsu points of Shiori's hand and began to copy her hand movement on the questions. He was sure that at least one of the guards around him could sense his chakra being used, but he doubted they would call him out on it since it was not obvious. He glanced at Lee near the front sitting next to Hanada. He was sure that Lee was too honorable to cheat on the test so he decided to give him a helping hand. Acting as if he was thinking he bit his thumb and went through some hand seals disguised as cracking his knuckles and in a smokeless summon summoned two small spiders. One went to Yakuma while the other went to Lee. The spider landed on the desk and spun a small web detailing the answer to some of the shorter questions. Once three were filled for Lee he dismissed the spiders. That was enough points to pass the test. Soon after the dramatic tenth question the proctor of the next exam, their sensei Anko, led them to the forest of death. Anko began to scare the poor genins with her antics while she explained the test. Anko held up two scrolls, all right you maggots, the purpose of this test is to survive for five days in the forest behind me. While surviving the forest your goal is to gather a heaven and an earth scroll before proceeding to the tower in the middle of the forest. However, before we begin the test I would like all of you to sign these waivers, you know in case you die. There was some grumblings but everyone signed the waiver and was given a scroll. When Menma signed the waiver and got a heaven scroll for the team he smirked a bit as an idea came to him. He raised the scroll over his head and shouted, Hey! Our team has a heaven scroll. Nearly everyone around him looked at him as if he was an idiot but the proctors and judges of the test looked at him speculatively. What the genin around him did not realize is that he had protected his team from half the competition. No team would want to waste energy and a potential defeat on a team they knew had the scroll they did not need. With that stunt team 9 had become one of the best protected teams in the competition, while simultaneously luring only teams they needed to themselves. As they lined up at an entrance to the forest he smirked a bit as he felt the small chakra of one of his spiders attached to the two genin teams whose gates were closest to theirs. As soon as the horn blared he motioned for their team to follow the chakra signature that his spider was emitting and soon crouched on a tree above a rain village team. They observed the team a bit and smirked as one as the leader took out an earth scroll. Without having to be told Yukumo did some hand seals and trapped the team in a genjutsu. Naruto took out two syringes full of knockout venom and jumped down, landing on two of the genins and stabbing them in a major artery, effectively taking them out of the competition while Lee appeared behind the last member and chopped him in the back of the neck, knocking him out as well. Yukumo smirked as they took the earth scroll, that was easy. Naruto looked around suspiciously, too easy. I say that we start heading to the central tower before teams get desperate enough to surround it looking for people with both scrolls. After three hours of running, dodging wild animals, and avoiding teams with his chakra web sensing they arrived at a small clearing. Naruto looked around, we should rest here for now, we want to be at full strength if we encounter another team. Lee nodded, yes it would be best if we wait for our flames of youth to replenish before continuing on to the tower. Yukumo nodded, Already understanding youth speak to understand his meaning, we should lay some traps while we rest, 
even with your web we don't know if a team has the ability to counter or negate it. Menma nodded and his eyes glinted as he remembered one of the traps he wished to test, I have the perfect thing. Both Lee and Yukumo looked curiously as Naruto took out a black scroll and unsealed several, mushrooms. Yukumo looked hesitantly at the shrooms, and what do these mushrooms do? Naruto chuckled evilly, if anyone steps on one of these it will explode sending a cloud of paralytic poison into the air, forcing the person who stepped on it to inhale it. No one will be able to sneak up on us with these around us Kukuku, uncount to team 9, but in a different dimension every person classified as a jungler flinched simultaneously while a small yordle chuckled evilly as he waited for more people to fall to his shrooms of death. Three hours later 9 p.m., Team 9 had entered the tower and opened their scrolls which turned out to be summoning scrolls for a chunin to explain the scrolls to them and explained that they had to stay in the tower for the next three days. Time inside the tower moved slowly for the team as there wasn't much to do. They could not train in case they were spied on by an enemy team. After the five days were up the teams that had passed were Kuritsuchi's team, the Kumo team with the lollipop sucking boy, the Kiri team with the boy with sound dampeners, the Suna team with the red haired boy, Team 8, Team 11, Kabuto's team, and Team 12. Team 7 had arrived with only a few hours to go for the competition. He was slightly surprised that Shio's team was the last to arrive. However when he saw them enter Sasuke and Mito looked pretty roughed up and Shio seemed tired. He guessed they had fought a strong team and only barely won. Soon the proctors called all the teams to the arena in the tower and everyone prepared for the next event. Tower Arena, Naruto's POV. All of the teams were lined up in front of the Hokage and a group of Jonin. Minato stepped forward and explained the rules of the competition, I am glad to see so much potential in one room. However, we have too many competitors to make it to the final round. In order to resolve this we are doing a preliminary round. Minato then proceeded to give a speech about how the Chunin exams were a replacement for war. A sickly looking man stepped forward and spoke, I will take it over Ka from here Hokage-sama. My name is Hayate Gekko and I will be the proctor for the preliminary round. The rules are simple, each battle will be a duel against a random opponent. The first person to surrender or be unable to fight will be out of the competition. He pressed a button on a remote and a screen emerged from the wall, the first two opponents will be. The screen flashed with two names. Sasuke Uchiha vs Yoroi Akado. The fight was not that impressive to Naruto. He was expecting more from the Uchiha heir. Although it appeared as if he was injured from the forest so his injuries could be inhibiting his performance. Although the move at the end was impressive. It appeared as if Sasuke made a swordless copy of the three crescent slash that the Gekko family was known to use. The next match made many of the Konoha and Iwa members present wide in their eyes. Shino Aburame vs Kamazuro Suzumbaki. The feud between the Aburame and Suzumbaki clans was legendary. It was almost to the level of the Uchiha Senju feud. Ever since the Aburame killed most of the Suzumbaki clan members in the first war they have hated each other. Soon Shino and Kamazuro stood across from each other. Soon many bugs were swarming around both Genin. The battle was intense as neither side wanted to lose. Beetles against bees clashed in the air as both Genin directed them. However similarly to the last war, Shino's beetles were swarming each bee, taking them down due to sheer numbers over the larger bugs. Eventually Shino stood victorious over Kamazuro, the corpses of many dead bees around them. Masumi Sarugi vs Konkuro. The battle was quick and brutal. Masumi demonstrated his family skill of turning his arms to rubber and was prepared to break Konkuro's neck when it was revealed that, Konkuro, was a puppet that broke many of Masumi's bones in a twisted hug. Sakura Haruno vs Ino Yamanaka. This battle was pathetic to Naruto. Despite Sakura's good usage of genjutsu, probably taught by her sensei Kurenai and Ino's use of her family's jutsu, they were barely genin level with their taijutsu and ninjutsu. Tamari vs Shio Uzumaki Namikaze. Naruto raised his eyebrow at the matchup as the two girls walked to the arena. It was obvious that Tamari was a wind user with her giant fan. But he also knew that Shio was one of the best wind users in Konoha besides Asuma Serutobi. The match started like he suspected, Tamari opened her fan and unleashed a great burst of wind at Shio while she unsealed her nodashi and cut the wall of wind. It seemed both opponents were testing each other's wind affinity as they repeatedly blasted each other with wind. Naruto noticed that Tamari seemed to specialize in the force of wind while Shio specializes in the cutting aspect of wind. 
Soon Shio did one of her best moves, she used a wind cut to force Tamari to jump into the air, which is what the Konoha Genin was aiming for. Her sword glows green and she jumped into the air at great speeds and slashed at Tamari repeatedly with the back of her sword. Shio landed gracefully and sheathed her sword while muttering, majestic slash of the rising vortex. Tamari fell to the ground unconscious with many long bruises all over her body. All of the Konoha Genin cheered for their fellow Genin and waited for the next match. Shikamaru Nara vs Kinsuchi. The match was more a battle of brains than brawn as Shikamaru outsmarted the sound genjutsu using Genin with his shadow mimic jutsu. Shikamaru proceeded to slam Kin's head against the wall of the arena, knocking her unconscious rather easily. Kiba Inazaka vs Samui. Naruto wanted to facepalm as the match progressed. Kiba seemed more distracted by Samui's breasts than the actual match. While Samui displayed brilliant sword play she really did not need it with how Kiba was distracted. Eventually she countered Kiba's fang over fang with her storm release. Naruto assumed the storm release is a mix of water and air to create lightning clouds in the arena, which bombarded Kiba after he mistakenly grabbed Samui's chest. Then came the next match. Neji Hayuga vs Menma. Both Genin looked at each other, Neji hatefully and Menma emotionlessly. Neji had hated him ever since he had stolen his spot for Rookie of the Year. Any time they met up Neji would say he was doomed for failure due to being a clanless orphan. Soon they stood before each other and took their stances. Neji in the gentle fist style and Menma with his chakra scalpels. Once the match started they both ran at each other with high speeds and began a taijutsu battle. Neither put force behind their strikes and were extremely technical in their strikes. Up in the stands, Sakura who had recovered from her match with Ino when he turned to his teacher, Kakashi Sensei, why are they not trying to attack each other forcefully? Kakashi looked up from his book and spoke, neither of their styles of combat require forceful taijutsu. Neji is using his family's, gentle fist, style which focuses on striking the internal organs and tenkutsu points of the body by injecting chakra into the opponent's body. On the other hand Menma is using an uncommon medic fighting style that resolves around the medical ninjutsu chakra scalpels. Menma can use those scalpels to cut open the internal organs of the body with just a light touch. Shio shivered as she remembered two arms out of the lake clutching her ankles. Back in the arena, Neji and Naruto quickly separates. Naruto glances down at his arm and TSKED when he noticed several finger-sized bruises on his tenkutsu spots. Neji is clutching his arm as he had cut the tendons on it. Naruto went through some hand seals before thinking, acidic bubbles, breathing out copious amount of bubbles towards Neji. Many people in the audience snickered at the perceived weak attack until one popped near the wall and the concrete started to dissolve. Soon all of the bubbles began to streak towards Neji. Neji inwardly frowned. I haven't mastered this but I have no choice. He started spinning until a chakra dome surrounded him, preventing any of the acid bubbles from hitting him. When he stopped spinning he quickly had to duck as Naruto swung his arm at where his neck would have been moments before and twisted in mid-duck and struck four tenkutsu points on Naruto's chest. He frowned a bit as the Naruto started to melt in a purple puddle and jumped away as Naruto tried to jab him from behind. Unknown to Neji however is that medical chakra was surging into his locked tenkutsu on his previously closed off arm. As Neji charged forward Naruto quickly dodged the palm thrust and then quickly jabbed with his previously sealed arm, hitting Neji near the lungs with the chakra scalpel. Blood burst from Neji's mouth as he fell backwards. As soon as Menma was declared the winner he began to heal Neji's wounds. He looked up at the board and saw the next match and worried a bit. Gara vs Rock Lee Naruto ended his healing hands on Neji as doctors came forward to collect him and contemplated the matchup as he walked back to the second floor. From Kabuto's information Gara is either incredibly skilled or incredibly lucky to get out of all those missions without a scratch. Naruto knew Lee was good, leagues better than him in taijutsu. But if this guy had a move that could negate Lee's taijutsu, he worried. Lee's POV. Lee stood before the red-haired Genin and got into his Goken stance, Yash. Let us have a youthful battle. Some genin looked confused at what Lee was saying while Yakumo sighed. Gara looked at Lee emotionlessly while the cork on his gourd popped out at great speed at the Konoha genin. Lee caught the cork and smirked a bit, let's not be so hasty. Hayate looked between the two genin before raising his arm, Hajime. In a great burst of speed Lee disappeared and reappeared behind Gara with a drop kick. 
However before the heel could hit Gara's head Sand blocked the leg and Lee had to jump away before the Sand swarmed him. In the stands, Sand questioned Naruto to himself. The medic wondered if that was a mutation of the Sabaku magnet release. As Naruto watched the battle of Lee constantly using high-speed movement to dodge and try and hit Gara, he noticed that Gara made no move himself to control the sand. Is it automatic? Impossible. Even the third case cage was known to have to use great chakra control and focus to use his iron sand. He continued to watch curiously as Gara seemed to do the impossible and control his sand in an automatic defense. Naruto was shook from his contemplations when Anko yelled from beside him, Oi Gaki. Take them off. Arena. Lee separated from Gara and glanced at his sensei, but sensei, you told me not to take them off unless I am fighting an enemy shinobi. Anko looked down at him, what the hell do you think you're doing? Pound his ass dumbass. Some of the people who were not used to Anko's antics sweat dropped at the language she used. He nodded and quickly jumped to a safe distance away from Gara and unclipped his leg and arm bracers and held them to both sides, wanting to show off for the judges a bit. Konkuro looked at the leg bracers and commented, what will that do for him if he takes those off, she would have continued but Lee dropped the weights with an earth-shattering boom and severely dented the floor. Kakashi deadpanned at the scene and looked at Anko in a commiserating way, was that much weight really needed in his training Anko? Anko grinned savagely, it was Guy's original idea, I had my other Gaki draw up some chakra weight seals and apply them to his arm and leg bracers. He has been adding weight to them for over a year. Lee grinned menacingly at Gara, who seemed a bit flummoxed at the weight and disappeared in an instant. The automatic sand shield barely got there in time as Lee's leg hit, breaking through the defense easily and kicked Gara away. Konkuro looked shocked that someone had actually managed to hit Gara. Gara got up shakily as he looked at his cheek, which was heavily cracked and flaking as the sand shield around his body mended. Gara glanced back up only to see a foot that was too fast to be stopped by his sand and went hurtling backwards again only to be stopped by the other leg of Lee and sent him straight at the statue at the back of the room. Naruto looked upon the scene with a bit of pride. Guy had originally only wanted Lee to wear leg weights, but Anko insisted that he wear arm weights as well. This allowed Lee to increase his speed to mid Jonin level. Gara walked out of the dust that had kicked up from the kick and looked heavily cracked. Gara raised both his arms and sand started to shoot up from the ground and his gourd and rushed at Lee. Lee started to do some serious acrobatics as he frantically dodged the sea of sand rushing at him and kept trying to get to Gara. Lee took out his nunchucks and used them as a shield and a weapon against the sand as he spun them around to beat the sand away as he charged towards Gara. However, there was just too much sand in the arena for Lee to get through, frustrated he retreated to a sand-free corner and cross his arms in concentration. Kakashi widened his eyes at that stance and looked to Anko incredulous as said John and smirked widely. Lee uncrossed his arms and power exploded around him, first gate, gate of opening, open. Soon Lee was hurtling towards Gara and smashing through walls of sand before kicking Gara and in the chin and jumped up behind Lee and did a spinning flying suplex while shouting, primary lotus. When the smoke cleared from the move it showed a broken sand shell which vaguely looked like Gara. Lee panted a bit from the backlash of using the first gate but was able to barely dodge a wave of sand that came behind him as Gara emerged from a pile of sand looking a little haggard. Lee, knowing he had no choice, crossed his arm over his face and concentrated. Kakashi revealed his Sharingan eye, wide-eyed as he viewed Lee. Anko looked at him seriously, don't even try to judge me Kakashi, I allowed Guy to teach him the hidden lotus for one reason, that kid can take it. If anyone is worthy to learn that move, it's this kid. Lee uncrossed his arms as even more chakra exploded from him as his skin turned red and his eyes lost their irises. Second gate, gate of healing, open. Third gate, gate of life, open. Fourth gate, gate of pain, open. With those gates open it seemed as if there were multiple Lee kicking and punching Gara around the arena, battering the Suna Genin. Eventually Gara crashed into the ground, badly hurt as Lee could barely stand from using that technique. He looked at Gara and saw him still conscious, lifting his hand to surely crush the weakened Genin. Lee panicked for a second before remembering something before the Chunin exams. Flashback. Lee and Naruto were standing in a training field, resting after a sparring session. Naruto spoke up, you know Lee, if you face an opponent immune to Taijutsu, you need something to fall back on. Lee looked confused, but I have my nunchucks Menma, why would I need something else? Naruto looked at his teammate seriously, 
there are some opponents completely immune to physical damage, you need something that can damage people like that, here. Naruto handed a pouch full of what appeared to be smoke bombs to Lee. Lee took one of the smoke bombs out and looked at it curiously and Naruto explained, each one of those is a powerful knockout poison, if you fight an opponent who can stop your taijutsu, use it. Lee nodded, looking thoughtful as he stared at the smoke bombs. End flashback. Lee quickly unsealed one of the smoke bombs and with all of his remaining strength threw the small ball at Gara right before the sand hit him. Everything seemed to freeze as the ball exploded on Gara, allowing the red-haired sand user to inhale the smoke. Right as Gara went unconscious Lee muttered, I won, he could barely stand and he felt as if all his muscles were on fire but he won against someone who was clearly a natural genius. However before he could celebrate his leg and arm were brutally crushed by sand. Everyone looked shocked as they saw Gara shakily stand up, barely able to stand. Before Gara could do any more damage to Lee, Minato flashed with his Hiroshin and stopped the second wave of sand before it hit down Genin. Baki shouted at Gara, Gara, stand down. Gara glared up at the Suna Janin before all of the sand in the room converged on him, reforming his armor and gourd before slowly walking back up to the balcony. Naruto quickly jumped down to Lee with his healing palms already glowing a deep green. He did not understand how his knockout gas did not work. The stuff was designed to knock out large animals, Gara should have been out for at least three days. He winced as he examined Lee, there were multiple fractures in his leg and arm. He stood back and let them take Lee away, feeling slightly helpless. He didn't have nearly enough medical experience to heal Lee. He never felt more useless than at that moment. There was a 30-minute break as the judges fixed the arena from the fight between Lee and Gara. Lee had been taken to Konoha's hospital due to his injuries so Naruto and Yukumo could not visit him. The next match appeared on the screen. Hanada Hayuga vs. Yukumo Kurama. Naruto winced a bit, a Hayuga is one of Yukumo's worst opponents. With her Byakugan Hanada could see through most of Yukumo's genjutsu and was more than likely better at taijutsu than the genjutsu specialist. However as he looked at Yukumo's face he knew she was determined to win. It wasn't a secret that Kuranai Yuhi had basically raised Hanada. So Yukumo had always disliked Hanada who she perceived as her replacement. Yukumo's POV. Both girls stood across from each other in the arena, Hanada was slightly nervous under the steely gaze of Yukumo. For a usually docile and happy girl, Yukumo looked like she was prepared to kill. Hayate looked at the two girls and raised his arm, Hajime. Yukumo flashed through hand seals and Hanada soon saw her family, Kuranai, and her team berating her for being weak and useless. However Hanada activated her Byakugan and saw through the illusion and ran towards Yukumo to engage her in Taijutsu. However before she reached Yukumo, the Genjutsu user went through four hand seals and a wall of earth rose before the black-haired girl. Before Hanada could react a fist of stone emerged from the wall and punched her away. Behind the wall Yukumo was quickly painting a Genjutsu painting. She didn't care for quality she was going for speed as she painted a rough scene of the room they were in. As Hanada stood back up she quickly rushed to the collapsing wall but gasped as everything was reversed. The room was UPSI down and as she looked up she could see the roof but felt a severe case of vertigo as she tried to maintain her footing on the reversed floor. Yukumo chuckled a bit, how do you like my, real, illusions? With this genjutsu everything is reversed, left is right, right is left, and up is down. She took out her tanto and ran at Hanada. Hanada took out a kunai to block the tanto but felt a cut appear on her opposite shoulder and gasped in pain. Yakumi grinned evilly, also, every cut appears in the opposite direction. In the stands, Kuranai winced as she saw Hanada attack in the completely wrong direction at Yukumo. She noticed Yukumo painting a picture and figured that Hanada is now in an almost unbreakable genjutsu. She wished she had not given up on Yukumo that day. However she did not know that Minato could seal her Edo demon. And now Hanada is paying the price for her mistakes. Back in the arena, Hanada was breathing heavily as she had many small cuts along her body. Every time she tried to counter Yukumo she was cut. In addition any time the Hayuga heiress tried to attack Yukumo her attacks went right through her. However Hanada heard through the illusion her idol, Shio encouraging her. She had always admired the Uzumaki heiress for her bravery and courage and focused a bit and waited for Yukumo to charge at her. As she got closer she attempted something she had never managed to do before. She quickly spun in a circle while shouting, Kaden. Surrounded her, 
sending Yukumo crashing away from her. Hinata gasped a bit, the Kaden was a very draining jutsu, she would only be able to use it three more times before she passed out from chakra exhaustion. Soon the battle became who gets knocked out first as Yukumo tried unsuccessfully to get past the Kaden and was flung back before both girls were breathing heavily. Eventually, however, Hinata fell over exhausted but proud in herself for being able to stand up for herself. Hayate looked at the downed girl and spoke, Winner Yukumo Kurama. Naruto POV. Naruto cheered for Yukumo and helped heal some of her injuries from the numerous Kadens, you shouldn't be so reckless, you could have injured yourself by charging in like that. Yukumo grunted but didn't respond as her medic teammate continued to heal her. He looked at the board and saw the next match. Choji Akamichi vs Kaneda Dosu. The match was over fast as Choji used his partial expansion jutsu to try and crush Dosu. However when Choji crashed into a wall Dosu used his melody arm to knock the big bone boy out. The next match had him interested. Kuritsuchi vs Omoi. The match was interesting to Naruto. Despite Omoi's excellent kenjutsu skills, he was no match for Kuritsuchi's earth release and lava release. Eventually Omoi surrendered as he was surrounded by puddles of boiling lava. Gengeta Hazuka vs Akatsuchi. The battle displayed a wide range of water and earth jutsu. Gengeta seemed to constantly use water bullets to pierce the earth constructs that Akatsuchi created. The battle continued at a stalemate until Gengeta summoned a medium-sized clam that spread a mist over the battlefield, created mirages that Gengeta used in combination with his water jutsu to defeat Akatsuchi. Mito Gekko vs Chojuro. Mito's POV. Chojuro took out his double-handled fish-shaped sword and Mito drew her katana. Hayate looked between the two genin before calling out, Hajime. Chojuro sprang into action, unwrapping his sword revealing the Haramakare and jumped into the air while yelling, hammer form. The sword of the seven mist seemed to splash a bit before transforming into a giant hammer, crashing down on where Mito was seconds ago. Mito seemed calm and collected as she took a stance with her katana, first dance, sliver moon, she dashed forward and right before she reached Chojuro she spun around in a graceful arc and struck at his side. Chojuro seeing where the strike was headed yelled out, shield form. And the Haramakare formed a shield around Chojuro. Mito's slash didn't even scratch the surface of the bubble and she jumped back as Chojuro transformed his sword into a hammer again. She sighed a bit before channeled chakra into her sword, increasing the length by double with a blue glow. Up in the stands, Naruto raised an eyebrow and looked at his sensei, isn't that the chakra practices that the samurai use? Anko while still watching the sword fight, yup, what a lot of people do not know is that Hayate's father was a samurai. He thought Hayate everything he knew before they immigrated to Konoha. He must have taught the style to his daughter. In the arena, now holding her blue broadsword in one hand she rushed forward while whispering, broken crescent, and jumped around Chojuro swinging her broadsword widely making many cuts along the shark tooth boy's body. Chojuro twisted his sword around while yelling, longsword form and his sword turned into a huge sword when he swung it at Mito. Mito twisted around and swung her chakra broad sword with great strength while whispering, great moon slash, and the chakra from her blade sprang forward in a large blast that collided with the longsword form of the Haramakare creating a blast of dust in the air. When the smoke cleared Chojuro was on the ground with Mito standing above him, victorious. Everyone clapped for Mito as the last matchup appeared on the screen. Tenten vs Umi Tenten stood across from Umi as Hayate looked between them, Hajime. Tenten jumped into the air and started pelting Umi with all kinds of throwing weapons. However before they reached Umi he pulled out a scroll and went through some hand seals, wave style, great surf. Out of the scroll a great burst of water appeared and took the form of a wave and barreled towards the bun-headed genin. Tenten managed to jump over the wave but the ground floor of the arena was completely flooded. Umi went through some more hand seals, wave style, turbulence. Soon the once calm flooded waters of the arena suddenly had small waves crashing around the ground floor. Tenten tried to keep her balance with water walking but was unable to and fell in the water. As she fell a net covered her and she was held at trident point. Hayate, who had jumped to the balcony to escape getting wet, looked at the situation before calling, winner, Umi. Soon all of the winners except Sasuke were lined up in front of the Hokage and Hayate. The proctor had each person reach for a number before they all had one. Upon opening them they went like this. Sasuke Uchiha, 3. Menma, Naruto, 1. Shio Uzumaki, 4. 
Kuritsuchi, 2. Dosu Kaneda, 5. Umi, 7. Konkuro, 8. Yukumo Kurama, 9. Gengeta Hazuka, 10. Gara, 6. Shino, bye. Hayate reviewed the numbers before speaking, all rights to the matches are as follows, Menma vs. Kuritsuchi, Sasuke Uchiha vs. Shio Uzumaki, Dosu Kaneda vs. Gara, Umi vs. Konkuro, and Yukumo Kurama against Gengeta Kurama. Shino has a bye to the second round. The matches will not be held for a month to allow time for foreign dignitaries to arrive. So use this month to train and prepare for the third round. Minato stepped forward, we have provided hotel rooms for each foreign genin team and welcome anyone to use our training fields to prepare for the final exam. Congratulations to all of you for making it to the final round. Konoha Hospital, one day after the preliminaries, Menma POV. Menma and the rest of Team 9 were visiting Lee in the hospital. They had just learned the horrible news that Lee may never be a ninja again. Naruto felt so useless, despite all of the training in medical ninjutsu he could not heal Lee. He knew it was pointless to beat himself up over not being able to heal something that doctors with years of experience over him couldn't. But he could not stop thinking about how Lee trained harder than anybody in Konoha to be strong, only to have it all wiped away by the madness of that genin. His fist clenched a bit, Gara would pay. He walked down the hallways lost in thought, if Gara stole Lee's future away from him I will make him regret the day he ever gained that sand ability. However he was broken out of his musings when he saw his sister talking to Kakashi. His sister seemed to be pouting a bit as the Junin looked sheepish. As Kakashi left she saw him and a flash of guilt and surprise flashed through her face, oh. Menma, I didn't see you there. She seemed to be trying to find the right words of what to say, erm, can we talk privately, how about up on the roof? Naruto considered the option and nodded, he had nothing else to do so might as well. Hospital roof. As they arrived at the roof Shio looked like she was contemplating what to say, I talked with my parents a few days ago, and I realized I was a bit of a brat back at training ground 26. I was under a lot of stress learning I had a big brother. Ha ha ha, she cleared her throat a bit, I wanted to say I'm sorry for attacking you Naruto. She smiled sheepishly while scratching the back of her head. Naruto looked at her a bit and sighed, I am not angry that we fought, it was a good chance to test my abilities. Shio perked up instantly, yeah, some of those moves were really cool. The spider was a bit creepy but those chakra scalpels pack a punch. He looked at the still babbling blonde confusedly, is she bipolar? Suddenly it seemed as if Shio realized something and stopped her babbling, oh. That's right Ka-san wanted me to invite you for the dinner party this Saturday to celebrate everyone making it to the finals. He wanted to refuse, he really did, but he made the mistake of looking into his sister's puppy dog eyed hopeful look and he felt his control waver. This is the person I've hated since childhood, he thought as he stared at the teary eyed pleading expression of his former sister. He sighed deeply, fine I'll come. Shio cheered loudly before grabbing his hands, he could practically see the sparkles around her, yes. It will be so much fun. Make sure you come at 6 p.m. and wear something nice. Mom did some investigating and found out you like sushi so she is making that along with ramen so I will see you then. Bye. She ran off quickly, jumping from building to building. Naruto stood there a bit, she investigated me. Konoha Streets, Friday afternoon, Naruto's POV. Naruto was walking down Konoha's main street after talking to his sister. He was thinking of a training schedule for this month. He knew he needed an ace for the finals. His acid release was not really a secret. He was sure that most of the competition would try and find a counter for it. He did not show any of his hidden weapons during the test but he was sure that they would at least suspect he had something up his sleeve. He thought of his opponent Kuritsuchi and what he knew of her. From a bit of researching he found out she is the Suchikage's granddaughter. She also was one of the few people in over a century to combine two elements without a bloodline. The lava release was definitely one of the most powerful offensive styles he had ever seen. If you don't get directly hit by the lava you still have to be careful where you dodge so you don't step in the stuff. He definitely could not use his acid release against her. His toxic substances in the presence of lava. He would kill all of the spectators. He would have to rely on his tricks and medical skills to win the match. Anko had told him she was going to focus on Yukumo for the finals. He didn't blame her, Gengeta was the descendant of the second Mizukage and probably knew quite a few of his tricks. 
He doubted Arachne could help him, the rest of her techniques would take years for him to learn. He entered his apartment and went straight to the hidden wall where he hides most of his weapons and searches through them. He equipped his arm crossbow, his back crossbow, a blowpipe, his satchel full of poison supplies, poison claws, and quite a few of his poison sinbon needles. He exited the apartment to find a suitable training ground. Training Ground 18 Training Ground 18 is known for its obstacle courses. From bear traps to swinging logs, it has it all. Naruto was practicing his evasion as he knew it would be critical to have good reaction time against the lava user. The trick will be taking her out as soon as possible. The longer the match dragged on, the more lava will be on the ground. He jumped over a log and shot an arrow at the rope holding the other as he flipped over a couple of blunted kanai as he dropped on a wooden ledge and continued to traverse the obstacle course. It was not until around 5 p.m. did he leave the training ground and stored his weapons back into his apartment did he remember what Shio told him earlier, and wear something nice. He looked at his closet and saw nothing but training clothes in his casual clothes and scratched the back of his head. As an orphan he never had to go to a nice party before so he did not know what to wear. After making a meal of rice with roe on top and vegetables he decided to go shopping for an outfit tomorrow. Next evening, Namikaze Estate, Naruto's POV. Naruto was staring up at the house that he had called home so many years ago. It felt weird returning for such a mundane reason. He had always imagined returning to this house to burn it down, not to attend a party. He was currently wearing a black suite with a wine red button-up shirt underneath with no tie. He sighed and knocked on the door. Shio opened the door and beamed at him happily and dragged him into the house, you came. I am so excited for the party. We are hosting it in the back garden. Shio was dressed in a formal kimono but somehow made it look casual as she interacted with some of the guests. He saw Shikamaru with his parents talking to Choji and Ino. Shino was talking to Yukumo along with her parents. When he looked straight again he saw Kashina smiling at him, Menma. I am happy you arrived. I saw your match and was very impressed. He noticed she kept her promise to call him Menma. He remembered the conversation he had with her after the preliminaries. Flashback. Naruto was walked away from the hospital and saw Kashina waving at him and he sighed a bit as she walked over. She beamed at him, I am proud of you for winning Naruto. I was hoping I could see where you live, so I could come over sometime. Naruto considered a bit before nodding and they started walking to his apartment. His apartment would be considered Spartan if it wasn't for the plants. The apartment was more a greenhouse than living area. There were plants everywhere, on the window sills, on the table, hanging from the ceiling, and in pots scattered throughout the area. The only furniture in the apartment was a bed, table with two chairs, and a couch in the living room facing a TV. They soon began a discussion about light topics, the weather, the Chunin exam, and other such topics. Naruto was surprised how easy it was to get used to Kashina's presence. She was a genuinely likable person, she seemed to have this aura that made people around her happy. He felt sad for never being able to experience that when he was younger. However soon they started speaking of more serious topics as Kashina took a deep breath and asked the biggest question on her mind, have you, considered retaking the Namikaze Uzumaki name? Naruto looked down at his hands and thought about the offer. It was tempting, very tempting. With two clan names he could get many benefits around the village and more recognition in the other nations. He could get better positions in Konoha easier, and even have better prospects of becoming Hokage if he wished to. However he thought of Inari's words, I gave you the only gift I could in my weakened state, anonymity. He hated the fox more than he ever hated his parents. But, he was right that his actions probably saved him a life of always looking over his shoulder for his parents' enemies. He looked at Kashina and shook his head, I really want to have a family again, but I have worked so hard as Menma. In addition if I joined the Uzumaki family again I would attract too much attention. A son of Minato Namikaze who looks nothing like either of you suddenly being revealed. I just don't want to deal with that. Kashina looked sad but seemed to understand. Naruto continued, if you can, can you keep referring to me as Menma in public? I have grown attached to the name. Kashina nodded, I will. She stood up to leave and hugged Naruto, even if you aren't a part of our family anymore you will always be my son, and I will love you no matter how much you change. Naruto felt his eyes moisten a bit and hugged her back, smiling a full smile. End flashback. Everyone seemed to have a good time at the party.
There were platters of sushi and large bowls of ramen for the guests as well as drinks. Kiba had to be restrained from drinking alcohol by Shino and everyone gapped at Hinata because of the amount of ramen she could eat. Naruto had fun talking to Mito and Shio. Uncount to everyone at the party however, two figures were discussing plans on the top of a shadowy rooftop. In another dimension Hayate would have died, but he was allowed the day off to celebrate his daughter's victory in the preliminaries. Three days later, Naruto was visiting the local hot springs. He had been training on evasion and water ninjutsu and thought he deserved a relaxing soak in the hot springs. However as he was relaxing he heard an annoying giggling sound coming from the fence. He looked over and saw a large white-haired man that he recognized from the photo at the barber shop, Jiraiya of the Sanin. He had heard rumors of his perversity but did not know it was this bad. He sighed a bit before an evil idea came to him. Going through some hand seals he used a trick he had learned from manipulating the hidden mist jutsu. Using the steam in the air he manipulated them until the words, there is a pervert peeping on you, appeared over the fence, behind the pervert. Other side of the fence. Anko was talking with Kuranai before she spotted the missed message. She smirked a bit before looking at her fellow Kunoichi and they all nodded. Soon all of the civilians in the bath began to splash each other happily as they snuck around to the men's side of the bath. Soon screams of agony and pain were heard throughout the street as towel-clad Kunoichi beat the Sanin within an inch of his life. Naruto watched the scene amused, hidden behind a small application of the hidden mist as he watched such a famous person be beaten by towel-clad ladies. As the Kunoichi left he got dressed and approached the man snickering a bit, I hope you learned your lesson from this but knowing your reputation, you probably haven't. The downed man seemed to miraculously heal and in a poof of smoke summoned a large frog and kabuki music seemed to play as he hopped on one leg, I am the man known throughout the world. The man feared by men and loved by women. I am the Gama Sage, Jiraiya. All he could do is deadpan at the ridiculous man before turning around to leave. Jiraiya face planted behind him and shouted, don't just leave. Naruto turned around annoyed, what do you want perverted old man? Three arrows seemed to pierce Jiraiya each with the words perverted old man on them. Jiraiya sighed heavily as he looked at the genin and remembered his conversation yesterday with Minato. Flashback, Jiraiya's POV. You have a son, shouted Jiraiya as he looked at his student in shock. Minato grimaced a bit while rubbing his forehead, yes, it seemed that someone put a genjutsu on Kashina and I that would force us to gradually abandon him. Jiraiya still seemed to be in shock and said, can I meet him? If he really is your son he would be my godson. Minato nodded, he goes by the name of Menma. He registered himself as an orphan and graduated as rookie of the year last year. Jiraiya looked thoughtful, I remember that, I got a notice saying for the first time since my student and orphan gained the title of rookie of the year. I guess the apple doesn't fall far from the tree a eh, Minato. Minato smiled sadly, I just wished I could have helped him get there. Can you look after him during this month? Perhaps teach him some of your skills. Jiraiya brightened. Sure he'll teach the Gaki some tricks, perhaps he can sign the toad contract. Minato winced. He can't sign the toad contract, he signed the spider contract. Jiraiya looked downtrodden. That's too bad, not to mention there is no chance of him signing both due to the clan he signed. Minato looked confused. Why is that? Jiraiya looked out of the window solemnly. The spiders and the toads have been rivals for centuries. They are natural enemies in the wild and that reflects on their clans. Toads are known for eating spiders you know. Minato winced a bit but nodded in understanding, please just look out for him, there are rumors of San's discontent with us and I want to make sure this exam goes smoothly with all of the other cages arriving. End flashback, Naruto POV. Jiraiya leaned in a bit and whispered quietly, your father wanted me to check up on your training, see if you need help with anything. He would have helped you himself but he is very busy with the Chunin exam preparations. Naruto nodded in understanding, I have been fine training on my own but can I ask you a few questions about hypothetical situations? Jiraiya nodded and they began discussing strategies to defeat Kuritsuchi in the finals. After an hour of discussing the problem Jiraiya stood up, why don't we spar kids so I can see how good you are? Naruto nodded and they headed to training ground 9. Training ground 9. Naruto and Jiraiya clashed for over 30 minutes before Naruto coated his hand in spikes of poison and quickly tried to punch Jiraiya while calling out, acid spiked punch. Jiraiya quickly spoke out, Hari Jizo, and his hair grew into a shield around him and deflected the attack. 
Naruto called an end to the training spar as he saw that move, Jiraiya-san, what was that move? Jiraiya looked a bit confused, of all the moves he had shown his personal hair jutsu was the one he focused on. That was my personal brand of jutsu. I use my hair to attack and defend, no one ever expects the hair to be used as a weapon. Naruto pondered the uses of such a move. It could remove his weakness of his webs being intangible to the touch. If he could weave his hair into a web around the battlefield and direct it with chakra, he could mimic the spider's best moves, can you teach me how to do that? Jiraiya looked a bit more confused, are you sure? By the time you get it down it will probably be time for the finals. Naruto nodded, a determined glint in his eyes, yes I am sure Jiraiya sensei. Jiraiya laughed, sensei eh? I like the sound of that. Naruto's apartment, day of the finals, Naruto POV. Naruto equipped his wrist crossbow and smirked a bit as his hair unwove from its web position around his apartment, it was time to show the world what he can do. Konoha Stadium, day of the finals. The Konoha Stadium was packed to its limit. Packed with people from daimyos to peasants, everyone had come to watch the finals of the Chunin exam. The event was highly publicized because of the fact that all five great nations had genin competing in the tournament. In the highest booth the five cages sat side by side for the first time since the Chunin exam system began. On the far left was the rakage. Of the Raiden no Yoroi. He was a very large man, arms muscled like a bodybuilder or wrestler. He was famous in all five countries for his mastery of lightning ninjutsu and taijutsu. On his right sat the Suchikage. Onoki the great fence sitter. Compared to his counterparts he was a very small man. He had earned his reputation as being the oldest lasting cage, and for his mastery of earth ninjutsu and dust release ninjutsu. In the center sat the Hokage. Minato Namikaze, the yellow flash. He had earned his reputation by being the fastest man alive, and his actions in the third shinobi war. He is praised as the strongest shinobi alive for being able to go against the Kyubi alone and live to tell the tale. On the Hokage's right was the Mizukage. Mei Terum of the Poison Mist. As the first female Mizukage she made her name in the Kiri Civil War by defeating the third Mizukage in single combat. The last cage is the Case Cage. Rasa no Sabaku of the Gold Dust. Famous for his role in the third Shinobi War. He also became Case Cage after defeating the Aikibi in single combat and allowed Chio to seal the Biju inside a tea kettle. Each cage was extremely famous and well-respected individual. Each had gathered in the stadium to witness the finals of the Chunin exams. In the stadium, all of the genin were lined up in front of the new proctor. The man had a lazy appearance with a bandana around his head and chewing on a sanban. The proctor looked at the gathered genin and spoke, Welcome to the final rounds of the Chunin exams. I am your proctor for this event, Genma Shiranui. He pulled out a tournament sheet and showed it to the genin, the matches are as follows. Match 1. Kuritsuchi vs Menma. Match 2. Shio Uzumaki vs Sasuke Uchiha. Match 3. Dosu Kaneda vs Gara. Match 4. Umi vs Konkuro. Match 5. Gengeta Hazuka vs Yukumo Kurama. Match 6. Shino Abarame vs Mito Gekko. Shikamaru. Bye. The Sinban Chewing Janin put the tournament sheet away and turned to the Genin. The first match of the day will be Kuritsuchi of Iwa against Menma of Konoha. Everyone else please vacate to the viewing balcony. Kuritsuchi vs Menma. Genma looked between the two genin and raised his arm, Hajime. Right when he finished those words Kuritsuchi flew through some hand seals before shouting out, Lava Bombs. Menma jumped away and started weaving between the balls of lava as they landed on the ground, forming puddles of the burning liquid. In the cage box, Mei looked interested in the lava jutsu and turned to Onoki, oh. Lava jutsu from a genin. Impressive. Onoki looked at Kuritsuchi with pride. Yes she is a genius with mixing elements together. Although that kid Menma is definitely a genius himself. I remember that he, along with his team defeated Rogan the Butcher a year ago. Minato smiled proudly, yes Menma definitely is one of our strongest genin this year, I wonder how he plans to counter the lava ninjutsu. Back in the arena, the battle was going as Naruto had imagined it, constantly dodging lava while simultaneously watching out to not jump in the lava puddles. However what the stand did not know is that he had almost completed his trap. He looked around the arena and saw spiders weaving their webs across the arena. Kuritsuchi was annoyed, her opponent had been constantly dodging her attacks and did not seem concerned with counter-attacking. Did he think she would run out of chakra? 
Ha, she was the granddaughter of the Suchikage she had been increasing her chakra reserves since birth. Soon the field was almost full of lava beside the circle that Kuritsuchi occupied. She smirked. End of the line, she went through some hand seals for her best jutsu, lava dragon jutsu. Soon a massive Chinese dragon rose from the lava and streaked towards Menma, blasting his position with boiling lava. Many people in the stands gasped as they thought Kuritsuchi had killed Menma. But a voice called from above the field, Oi oi oi, are you trying to kill me? Everyone looked up to see Menma standing on air. Only a few people could see the interlocking web that stretched across the stadium that Menma was balancing on. He smirked at his opponent, Thank you for reducing the area you can dodge Kuro-chan. Kuritsuchi growled at the nickname while Menma took out the crossbow from his back, but it's time to play shoot the Iwa Genin. With that the role of the battle was reversed. Naruto repeatedly peppered the IWA Genin with arrows as he jumped from wire to wire, dodging any of the attacks from Kuritsuchi. Due to the pools of lava around her, she did not have much room to dodge the arrows. In the cage stands, a rubbed his chin, an interesting tactic. He played Kuritsuchi for a fool, allowing her to fill most of the arena with lava then taking to the air on his web. Rasa agreed with A, I wonder how he managed to set the wiring up in the middle of that storm of lava. Either the one who was dodging was a clone or he had helpers somewhere in the arena. Minato smirked, he may not approve of the spider clan but they were definitely proving their worth to his son. Arena. Kuritsuchi scowled as she continued to try and dodge the arrows fired from Menma. She felt like a fool, she had never considered that he may have been counting on her to fill the arena with lava. Luckily she had a backup plan, going through hand seals she called out, quicklime congealing technique, and spat globs of cement around herself, covering the lava pools with quickly drying cement. She now could better evade the arrows while countering with her own abilities. She smirked up at Menma, let's see you stay on you web with this. She went through four hand seals, fire release, great fireball. And blasted a ball of fire out of her mouth at the web, lighting it on fire. Menma frowned at his burning web, it seemed his first plane failed. He jumped down and activated his chakra scalpels. As he landed he sprinted towards the IWA Genin and engaged in a fierce taijutsu contest. Kuritsuchi broke away first and went through four hand seals, earth release, earthen body armor. Her skin darkened until it looked as if she was made of dirt. This jutsu was the earth style counterpart to the lightning armor. Much easier to use and gave the user great defense. Menma frowned, that jutsu would prevent much of the damage from his chakra scalpels. He pumped more chakra into his scalpels and they lengthened a bit and turned dark green. He darted forward towards Kuritsuchi as she ran forward as well and they clashed, fists of stone versus chakra scalpels. Menma swung his arm down, hitting the shoulder of Kuritsuchi, but only making a small scratch. The Iwa Genin smirked at him before sucker punching him into the wall of the arena. Menma felt the impact and gasped a bit, the spiderweb cracks against the wall was proof of how hard he was hit. He fell to the ground in apparent pain. Kuritsuchi smicked as she jumped to jump kick him. However right before she hit, Menma shifted and lifted his leg up and pressed against the food that would have kicked him. Kuritsuchi's eyes widened as she felt the prick of a needle in her foot. Her leg suddenly felt like jelly as she fell to one knee in shock. Menma smirked that his plan succeeded. On the bottom of his foot a small needle was shown, glowing with enough chakra to pierce the earth armor. He had paralyzed her with a potent enough venom to keep her down for a while. He smirked down at her and pressed a chakra scalpel to her throat, surrender. Kuritsuchi scowled but declared, I forfeit. The arena cheered for both Genin as Genma declared, winner, Menma. In the cage box, Onoki sighed as he watched his granddaughter be defeated, she underestimated him in that last second. Still, to manipulate the fight to that moment, he definitely shows enough skill to be a chunin. Minato nodded, I agree, however don't discount your genin out. She demonstrated enough talent to be given the title chunin herself. Mei nodded, I agree, it was a good battle, both sides made smart decisions and had backup plans when their initial plans did not succeed, I vote both for chunin. Rasa nodded in agreement, remaining silent for now. A grunted, both definitely showed skill in nin and taijutsu as well as planning. They earned my vote to be chunin. However I am interested to see how Menma does in the next round, he used up a lot of chakra in this fight. All the cages nodded in agreement, 
The real skill will be shown when they are tired from their previous matches. Arena. After a short break to fix the field, Genma stepped back in to announce the next match, the next match will be Sasuke Uchiha vs Shio Uzumaki. Sasuke Uchiha vs Shio Uzumaki. In the stands, Kakashi was sitting next to Kashina and the rest of the Janin. Asuma looked over, I'm surprised you're not late, losing your touch Kakashi. Kakashi rubbed the back of his head awkwardly, no, Kashina-san held my books hostage and threatened to burn them if we were late. All of the Janin sweat drop while Kashina cheers for Shio, yeah. Beat that Uchiha's ass. Arena. Shio stood across from Sasuke as Genma raises his hand, Hajime. Shio quickly unsheaths her sword and slashes a wind wave at Sasuke. Sasuke takes out a tanto and remembers what Kakashi said during their training. Flashback. Sasuke stood before Kakashi on a cliffside. The John and I smiled at Sasuke while explaining what they are going to be training in, Sasuke I know you have a fire and lightning affinity. We are going to train in your fire affinity for this month. Shio is almost a master of wind release in combination with her sword. Fire trumps wine so we need to teach you how to channel elemental chakra into a weapon to counter Shio. The Cyclops handed him a tanto, I once worked alongside Shisui Uchiha and know some of his tricks with fire release. We will work on some of his moves. Sasuke vaguely remembered Itachi's friend before the massacre. He had always thought he was an idiot. He looked at Kakashi doubtfully, Shisui. I saw him a few times and he acted like Shio when she eats sugar, is he that strong? Kakashi chuckled condescendingly and took out a bingo book from a few years ago and flipped to Shisui, Shisui Uchiha of the body flicker. High A rank. Bio. Prodigy of the Uchiha clan alongside Itachi Uchiha is widely known to be one of the best at genjutsu, fire manipulation, and the body flicker. Sasuke's eyes widen and he looked at the tanto in his hands, Shisui was that strong. Maybe I can use your skills to defeat your rival in life. Kakashi seemed to understand what he is thinking, yes, it is well known that Shisui was stronger than Itachi, if you master all of his moves you will be stronger than your brother. Sasuke gained a spark in his eyes as he turned to his sensei, please teach me Shisui's abilities Kakashi. End flashback. Fire burst from Sasuke's tanto and he disappeared in a body flicker, dodging the wind slash and shouted, fire halo. The Uchiha repeatedly slashed his tanto as he shushined around the field, waves of fire flying towards Shio. Cage stands. May Terum's eyes widen at the fire halo move, Shisui was infamous in Kiri after he defeated one of her best fighters, Aoi. Aoi had described the fight and spoke largely of Shisui's combination of the Shunshin and Fire Ninjutsu through a tanto. It seemed as if Sasuke is following his footsteps. She glanced at her fellow cages and commented, Impressive, fire manipulation at this level from a genin. Your daughter Hokage-san is also impressive, her wind manipulation is at a level not seen outside of Suna. Rasa nodded, Yes, her move seems to be a bit similar to our wind sword technique, but channeled through a real sword and pushed through a slash. Did you train her how to use these moves Hokage-san? Minato shook his head, no, I have a lightning affinity. Kashina taught her wind manipulation but she came up with most of her sword techniques on her own. Neither Kashina nor I use much ninjutsu so she got creative. When she said she would create her own ninjutsu series we were skeptical but she managed to make something powerful. She calls it the Majestic Slash series. Rasa nodded. Fascinating, I wonder if we can do similar jutsu with our fans. It will be interesting to test out when we return to Suna. Back in the arena, Shio's eyes widened at the fire before she sent a blast of air at her feet to jump to a great height to avoid the burning cuts. She spun in midair and sent another wind cut at Sasuke before crouching on the ground, pumping chakra into her legs as she prepared one of her best moves. Sasuke easily dodged the slash but widened his eyes when he saw her crouched. He remembered that move from the wave mission. Flashback. They were surrounded by mirrors on top of a bridge but suddenly, all the mirrors in front of Shio were cut apart as she blasted through them. End flashback. Sasuke tsked and channeled more fire chakra into his tanto. He also started to put a little lightning chakra into his tanto to increase the potency of his flames and dashed forward to counter Shio's slash. Shio prepared enough chakra in her legs and jumped forward, releasing all of the chakra in her legs as she surged forward, using her wind chakra to remove the air pressure against her as she thought in her head, majestic slash of the wind god. 
Sasuke prepared enough fire chakra into his tanto and jumped forward in a downward swing at the cut while also thinking, flame fall. The resulting explosion nearly encompassed half the arena. Cage stands. Minato covered his eyes away from the dust of the explosion and was worried about Shio and Sasuke, that explosion was huge. A whistled in appreciation for the giant explosion, that was one large attack. I assume they didn't intend to do that. Onoki nodded thoughtfully, I assume the Uchiha used lightning chakra to enhance his fire chakra enhanced Tanto. When in contact with Shio's wind ninjutsu, the flame reacted to the lightning and then enhanced with the wind, causing the massive explosion. A similar process is done with Bakudan ninjutsu. In the arena, as the smoke cleared everyone looked to at the walls of the arena as Sasuke and Shio were standing on opposite sides, safely away from the explosion. Although they were definitely worse for wear. Shio's nodaki had shattered and she had removed the hoodie she was wearing to the event, revealing a black skin-tight black top with mesh armor underneath it. Sasuke's tanto was fine but his black turtleneck clothing was burned and tattered in different areas. Shio jumped down and pointed at Sasuke angrily, what the hell? You do some awesome move then jump away at the last second. What kind of fighter are you? Dadbeo. Sasuke jumped down too and scowled at the blonde Uzumaki, you jumped away too idiot. They glowered at each other before Shio looked at the huge crater their attack had caused, well it seemed it was a good idea to dodge, that attack went way out of control. Sasuke glanced at the crater too, it was about 10 feet deep and covered about a third of the arena. Sasuke nodded but dodged a punch from Shio and the fight was back on. Despite the loss of her sword, Shio continued to use wind-enhanced taijutsu to counter Sasuke's tanto attacks and supplementary taijutsu. They clashed. Wind against fire for a while before Shio jumped back and a blue ball swirled around her hand. She looked at Sasuke yelling, I will win this. Sasuke scowled and struck his tanto forward swirling fire chakra around the tip making a drill of fire. He jumped forward with the drill shouting, fire spear. Shio jumped forward while also calling out, Rasengan. The two ninjutsu clashed until another large explosion occurred. Everyone was on the edge of their seats to see the end of the battle. As the smoke cleared it was revealed that a tattered Shio was standing over an unconscious Sasuke. The crowd cheered for the Uzumaki as she ran around yelling in victory. Genma smirked at the jumping Genin while thinking, even after all of that she has the stamina to jump around, what a stamina freak. He raised his hand at Shio while shouting out, winner of the second match, Shio Uzumaki. The crowd roared in approval. Shio looked up at the fighter's balcony where she saw her estranged brother looking at her and she smirked at him with her eyes sending him a message, I want to fight you next. Fighter's balcony. Naruto looked down at his celebrating sister, not sure what to feel. He felt proud that she won but it was strange feeling these emotions for someone he has hated his entire life. He looked down at her again and saw him staring at him, sending him a message that he understood, I want to fight you next. He smirked a bit he could not wait for that confrontation. In the cage box, Onoki spoke first, well, they're definitely skilled enough for Chunin, however neither of them planned that far ahead. It was all reactionary, plus if they made that kind of mistake with the explosion in a real situation they could get their entire team killed. Minato nodded, he was proud of the genin but neither showed the necessary mental prowess of a Chunin. He looked to his fellow cages and spoke, so Sasuke will not be promoted, but Shio still has a chance to show that she is eligible for Chunin. Everyone nodded at the assessment. Dosu Kaneda vs Gara. Dosu and Gara were standing across from each other. Genma looked between the two genin and spoke, the third math between Dosu Kaneda and Gara, Hajime. Dosu chuckled as he prepared his melody arm, I wonder which one is faster, my sound or your sand. Gara stared at Dosu apathetically before speaking monotone, your blood will be unsatisfactory to mother. Dosu shivered a bit but rushed forward, preparing to end this in one shot before the sun darkened overhead. He looked up and his lone eye widened before he was completely engulfed in sand. Gara raised his hand and spoke in a monotone drawl, worthless, and clenched it. It was silent in the arena as blood seemed to drip down from the floating pile of sand. In the cage box, all of the cage were silent as they viewed the scene. May cleared her throat a bit before speaking, your genin seems to be unstable case cage san. Rasa nodded solemnly, I told him not to kill any of the competition, I will have to discipline him after this. A shook his head in apparent disgust, he is definitely skilled, but he definitely does not have the mentality to lead. 
If he can kill a fellow Genin in cold blood like that, he has no place leading a team of Chunin. Minato nodded, agreeing with A's assessment. In the arena, Gara walked slowly back up to the fighter's balcony, not reacting to the lack of any applause or recognition to his victory. All of the genin in the box were staring at the red-haired shinobi in anger. However Konkuro was sweating internally, if I win my fight I have to fight Gara. Baki-sensei told us we can't forfeit to prepare for the invasion but if I win this match I will be killed. Umi stood there in contemplation as he reviewed the previous match. If he won he would be facing the red-haired menace. He frowned as he remembered the beaches of his childhood and smirked a bit, he had a plan against Gara. He glanced at the puppet user, but he had to win this fight first. Umi vs Konkuro. Umi and Konkuro stood across from each other as Genma raised his arm, Hajime. Umi jumped back a bit and rushed through hand seals before taking out a sealing scroll and shouted, Great Flood. A rush of water exited the scroll into the arena. He threw the scroll to a safe distance and kept dodging Konkuro as he kept unrolling water scrolls to flood the arena. He stopped after his fifth scroll and the water was now knee high. He jumped on top of the water and glanced at his side bag, I have ten more scrolls left filled with water. I hope that's enough for the next match. He looked at his opponent and saw him unravel his puppet. Konkuro sneered at his opponent, it doesn't matter how much water you use, you won't be able to dodge this. He flexed his fingers a bit and Karasu opened its mouth, puppet secret art, poison bomb. Three purple orbs were shot from Karasu's mouth and exploded where Umi was, filling the area with poison smoke. However Umi was already under the water, using an old diving ninjutsu to draw the air from the water around him into his lungs to breathe underwater. Normally he wouldn't be able to go underwater in knee-deep water but the crater from the last match was more than 10 feet deep, perfect for going underwater. He went through some hand seals and thought, wave style, great tsunami. Above the water a large wave suddenly formed and barreled towards Konkuro. Alarmed he dived under the water along with his puppet to avoid the giant wave. However before he could surface the water around him became choppy and violent and started to rise further. In the crater Umi had another open scroll and kept his hands in a hand seal to keep the water violent. In the cage stands. Mei watched in pride as Umi used one of his wave-style combinations to trap the Suna Genin. Minato rubbed his chin as he considered the move, it is a deadly combination to anyone below Haichunin. Water walking on rough water like that is impossible unless you have Janin chakra control. Even if Konkuro has good chakra control as a puppeteer, he will still have to focus on water walking, leaving him open to Umi. Mei nodded, yes it is for techniques like this is the reason that some in Kiri call him the Tittikaler. Rasa nodded as he observed his genin be hammered by different waves, a fitting title. In the arena, Umi decided to end this and took out his trident, using a small water manipulation to propel him through the water he calmed the waves and put the trident to Konkuro's throat. Konkuro sighed, slightly happy he lost since he didn't have to fight Gara. I forfeit. Umi nodded and took out some empty storage scroll and absorbed the water into four different scrolls. In the cage stands, a nodded in approval, a quick but insightful battle. Umi outmatched Konkuro since the start. I doubt many of the genin here could counter that wave trick effectively. I vote to promote him to Chunin. The other cages nodded in agreement. In the arena. Yukumo Kurama vs Gengata Hazuka. Yukumo stood across from Gengata as Genma raised his arm once again, Hajime. Gengata smirked arrogantly, you should surrender now, you stand no chance against me. Yukumo scowled and went through some hand seals, well try this on for size then, great forest of death. The scene shifted in an area of black sakura blossoms as Gengata found himself in the center of a forest of black sakura trees. He looked around a bit confused by the genjutsu until he saw something at the corner of his eye. He spun around but saw nothing. He started to sweat in fear before he felt a shadow loom across him. He turned around sharply and saw a different Yukumo. This one seemed to be a demonic version of the girl as she wielded a huge scythe made out of human bones. As the scythe came down he shook off his fear and broke out of the genjutsu just in time to dodge a slash by a tanto. He frowned a bit as he observed his opponent, using a genjutsu to increase the user's fear to make them forget they're in an illusion while you sneak up on them with a tanto, man I underestimated you. Yukumo smirked as she gripped the tanto tighter, HMPH, well I am soon to be the best genjutsu user of Konoha, I can't lose in illusions to you. Gengata frowned before he gasped as he felt a cut on his shoulder. He looked behind him and saw nothing. 
He widened his eyes before he clasped his hands together and said, Kai. The arena soon broke and reappeared to another arena where Yakumo was holding a bloody Tonto smirking at him. He scowled, he had drastically underestimated this girl. She used a two-layer genjutsu, the first one would make him too scared to realize he was in a genjutsu, if he broke out of it he would enter the next one, which would show a normal arena. Due to his arrogance he did not realize he was still in a genjutsu. In the cage box, Onoki nodded in understanding, impressive genjutsu. Using a double-layered genjutsu is extremely difficult. You have a talented brat there Hokage-san. Minato nodded eye pride as he watched his son's teammate outsmart the cocky Kiri Genin. May covered her eyes and sighed, she had repeatedly told him to not let his arrogance blind him. But it seemed like it had happened anyway. Arena. Gengata ignored the pain in his shoulder and went through some hand seals, whipping a bit of blood off his shoulder as he did so and called out, summoning no jutsu. A giant clam emerged from the large poof of smoke. The clam opened its shell and released a green tinted mist throughout the arena. Yukumo looked around carefully, fully prepared for anything. What she was not prepared for was a blast of lava to emerge out of the mist. She dodged quickly and looked behind her, the lava had disappeared into the mist. Was this a genjutsu? She dodged again as Sasuke with his flaming drill sped past her. She felt the heat from his jutsu and wondered how this was possible. She heard Gengata's laugh through the mist as he explained his jutsu, this is my own special technique. I use the mist around you to create a mirage of past events that happened in this arena. The mist will automatically respond to the mirage and make the damage real. She frowned as she heard the monologue of her opponent. That was a very dangerous genjutsu, on the level of her paintings. She continued to dodge different attacks from the past matches. She dodged swarms of arrows from Menma, wind slashes from Shio, and waves from Umi. She was panting a bit at the excursion against the Kiri Genin. She glanced at the watch on her wrist and smirked a bit, about five more minutes, if she survived for that long she would win. And so the game of cat and mouse continued, Shio working herself to exhaustion to dodge many of the best techniques of her contemporaries. She also got hit by a few water bullets from Gengata. Soon the clock ticked for five minutes and she smirked as the mist started to clear. The mist fully cleared to reveal Gengata, on the ground paralyzed. If one observed her tanto they would see a gleam of purple substance dripping off of it. In the cage box, May sighed, her genin did well but lost in the end to his own arrogance. Rasa frowned, he should have paid more attention to his wound, with a poison specialist as a teammate he should have known she would be well versed in different poisons. Minato nodded in agreement, I agree, he was too arrogant to make a good chunin, I do not doubt his skill, but perhaps he should wait till next time to be promoted. I agreed but commented on the Konoha genin, I do not believe we saw enough from Yukumo to tell if she is chunin worthy. She had good strategy with the double laid genjutsu and poison tanto, but she did not show much else in her match. All of the cages nodded and prepared to watch the last match of the first round. Arena. Shino Abarame vs. Mito Gekko. Shino and Mito stood across from each other as Genma glanced between them before raising his arm for the last match of the first round, Hajime. Shino lifted his arms and a swarm of bugs started to fly around him in a black mass. Mito drew her katana and prepared to counter Shino's first strike. Shino dashed forward with a punch towards the purple-haired sword's women. Mito dodged the punch and countered with a slash at Shino. The blade passed through Shino and the Abarame dissolved into insects which swarmed the girl. Mito scowled and jumped back from the swarm while sending a chakra slash at them to cover her escape. She continued to dodge pockets of the swarm until she was surrounded on all sides. She looked across the field and saw Shino directing the swarm. Soon all of the bugs swarmed her. However, as they started to absorb her chakra she poofed into smoke revealing herself to be a cage bushin. Before Shino could react a katana was pointed at his throat and he nodded silently and announced, Proctor I forfeit. In the cage stands, a nodded, smart, she knew she could not avoid the bugs forever so she hid underground as a cage bushin looked for the real Shino. Once it dispersed the information would return to Mito so she could attack the Abarame without fear of the insects. She has my vote for Chunin. Mei nodded, happy that so many females were proving their worth in this competition. Arena. Genma stepped forward and an announced to the arena, that concludes the first round of the Chunin exam finals. We will have an hour long break to fix the arena and give the Genin time to heal. 
Please return soon for the second round of the exams. Konoha Ariana, day of the finals. Samui vs Shikamaru. Samui began to walk down to the arena but Shikamaru sighed heavily, what a drag, why do I always have to fight females? Maybe I should just forfeit. Shio glared at Shikamaru, you can't just forfeit Shikamaru. Prove to Kumo that Konoha is great. Beside there is one good reason you must compete. Shikamaru turned to her, back facing the balcony and raised a lazy eyebrow, why is that? Shio grinned evilly, because. She lifted her foot up. I, her eyes glinted, say so. And Sparta kicked him down to the arena. Arena. Shikamaru stayed there for a while just staring at the clouds, ignoring the crowds booing, troublesome girl. Genma sweat dropped at Shikamaru while Samui grew a tick mark. The Sinban Chowing Jonan sighed, Hajime. Samui dashed forward and drew her sword, intending to cut the lazy coward in two. However when she slashed down he disappeared and landed on two kunai stuck to the wall above where the slash cut down, well, I really don't want to do this but oh well, I don't want to fight a girl but I can't lose to one either. Samui growled angrily, then just die you sexist pig. She slashed the wall where he suddenly disappeared, cutting into it deeply. She turned around to the trees and smirked, you are quite good at running away. Lightning sparked off her sword dangerously, then run away from this. She began to rain lightning bolts from her sword at Shikamaru's cover while he thought of a strategy, crazy girl, shooting me with lightning. He glanced around the arena for an advantage and noticed the pit where Shio and Sasuke fought was still there, and Samui was not far from its location. Samui stared at the grove of trees in the arena annoyed, if you are not going to come out, then I will have to make you. She was about to dart forward when Shikamaru jumped out and ran towards the pit from two fights ago. She did not know what his plan was but she was going to stop it. She darted forward to intercept him when suddenly she froze. She stood there wide-eyed as one of the kunai that Shikamaru had stuck to the wall poofed back into the lazy Naro with a shadow connecting to Samui. She was completely trapped as they walked towards one another. She was not naive enough to think he wouldn't be able to do something to her even if they were connected. She closed her eyes as they reached one another and felt her arm being raised, Proctor, I forfeit. What? The? Hell? Samui opened her eyes to see the lazy boy in front of her rubbing her shoulders looking bored. He began to slouch away while explaining, it took a lot of chakra to maintain the kajmane no jutsu from a henge while baiting you wish a bush and also using the cageman jutsu to produce a shadow, I am tired. Cage stands. Mei chuckles into her hand, what a unique boy, despite almost winning he decides to forfeit due to being tired from almost doing nothing. Onoki snorted, and to think I thought the legendary Nara laziness was over-exaggerated. Minato chuckled awkwardly, well even if he did not win the match, he would have won the war if he had a full team. The minute he caught her with that unconventional tactic his teammates could have ended it. Despite being a bad solo player, he would do well in a team situation. A nodded, yes he had good potential to be a leader if he broke out of his lazy habits. Maybe forcing some responsibility on him could make him grow more. Minato nodded, yes so Shikamaru will be promoted. Everyone nodded in agreement. Rasa frowned, however, Samui I do not believe demonstrated enough to be Chunin, she showed skill yes, but was not able to plan accordingly to the Nara's tactics. Onoki nodded, yes, let's wait for the next match to see if she is worthy to be a Chunin or not. After the hour intermission, arena. Genma walked out to the middle of the arena, welcome back to the final rounds of the Chunin exams. Once again I would like to thank all of you for coming to this event. I will now announce the next round of the exams. Menma vs Shio Uzumaki. Umi vs Gara. Yukumo Kurama vs Mito Gekko. Shikamaru Nara vs Samui. Genma closed the tournament brackets and spoke to the crowd, would Shio and Menma please come down to the arena. Soon Shio and Menma stood across from each other, both thinking about their last fights. Shio clenched her fist as she stared at her estranged brother, in the last fight we were completely even. However this is a tournament so I can't use too much chakra. Menma started at his sister in contemplation, I may not hate you anymore, but this is my chance to prove my strength to the world. I will use this fight to find my path again. Genma raised his hand and everyone in the arena seemed to hold their breath as the clash between the two strongest genin in Konoha was about to begin, Hajime. Naruto exploded into action, Flashing through hand seals his hair suddenly spiked in different directions and he shouted, spider silk encampment. His hair grew ridiculously fast, 
fastening into the shape of a spider web around the arena. Soon near invisible strands of hair were all around the arena. If one looked from an aerial view, they would see a very complex spider web pattern around the arena. Naruto flashed through hand seals before his sister could react and shouted again, Dokukiri no jutsu. Soon a purple tinted mist spread inside the arena. In the cage stands, Mei widened her eyes at the jutsu, how interesting, he seemed to have copied our mist jutsu and added his own poisons to it. It is a weaker version of my own poison mist. Minato nodded, yes Menma is one of the most premier poison specialists in the village. He has figured out how to turn his chakra into different toxins, creating a new style of ninjutsu. Everyone looked interested in this information, including a dragon-masked Anbu directly behind the Hokage. Arena. Shio had already prepared for her brother's poison mist jutsu. She unsealed a gas mask and put it on. She walked to the side a bit, holding her spare nodaki at the ready but felt a cut on her shoulder. She looked closely and noticed that a taut piece of hair had cut her in the shoulder. She felt her eyes widen, if all the strings around her had the power to cut her with just a simple touch, she could slice herself to ribbons just trying to find her opponent. She sighed, she will have to reveal her secret technique to the world. She did not want to show this to her parents yet until she had finished it. But an incomplete version should do. Soon four glowing blades appeared at her back and started to spin, cutting down the wires nearest to her and separating the mist a bit. She suddenly dodged to the left to avoid an arrow that flew her way. How can he tell where she was? He should be just as blind as her in this mist. She felt one of her blades snap another strand of hair and had to dodge another arrow. Was he reacting to where the strings are cut? She used her sensing ability to detect chakra running through each of the strings. What a frightening technique. Since he was not a natural sensor like herself, he had channeled chakra strings through her hair, if she tripped one he would know instantly where she was. She decided to test one of her new moves she made over the past month. She pressed her hands in a prayer position and focused on her emotion sensing. Soon she sensed through the mist and passed the wires at Menma standing near the wall of the arena, crossbow at the ready. She could sense his emotions. He seemed to be very focused on the match, but underneath that she felt confusion, hatred directed at someone else, and sadness. She frowned a bit, it seemed as if he still hated something, but at least she could tell it was no longer focused at them. She shook her head and focused on the match. The four chakra blades suddenly launched at his position at fast speeds. Menma stared at the cloud of poison mist, knowing that it wouldn't be enough to stop Shio. He focused a lot of chakra into the mist to prevent it from blowing away again with a wind jutsu. The real threat to the mist were his threads. He shot two arrows in the mist when he felt one snap. He was right, it seemed she did have something to counter his poison mist. However before he could prepare to fire another shot four glowing blue blades shot at him from the mist. He quickly dodged the blades recognizing them from his last match with Shio. In the cage stands, Minato's eyes widen at the chakra blades, he did not know Shio could do that. Onoki looked at the blades interestingly and turned to the Hokage, interesting, they seem to be similar to your wife's chakra chains. Uh, agreed with the Suchikage, yes it is interesting, it seems she can hone in on an opponent's chakra signature and have the blades follow him or her. What a frightening ability. Rasa nodded, yes and with Menma's mist and wires he can't break her concentration because she is protected by his own trap. She is definitely showing Chunin potential. Arena. Menma was inwardly cursing as he continuously dodged blue chakra blades. She had cornered him with his own trap. He had to break Shio's concentration. He had already ended the stream of chakra into his mist, but with the amount of chakra he had pumped inside, it could take over 20 minutes to dissipate. He blocked a chakra blade with a chakra scalpel and had an idea. He flashed through some hand seals into the chakra threads that were still inside the hair wires, paralytic morning dew. He doubted it would paralyze her, the jubi chakra inside of her would prevent it, but it would provide enough of a distraction to end the chakra blades. Shio smirked as she directed the blades at her brother, she was definitely being promoted for this stunt, who would think to use this situation to their advantage. She frowned when she felt a raindrop on her shoulder. It was sunny how could it be raining? She felt more raindrops and lifted a hand and examined it. The raindrop seemed wrong, the color was a very light green. She could also sense Naruto's chakra in the water and her eyes widened, it was not water, it was poison. She remembered this move when he beat Mizuki. 
She knew the poison wasn't strong enough due to the Kyubi but enough of it could slow her down, she started navigating the web to get out of the mist, poison drops continuing to fall on her. She eventually managed to make it out of the mist, drenched in the poison. She used a small wind ninjutsu to dry herself but knew she would be a bit slowed down due to the poison. Cage stands. Rasa nodded. A wise tactic, to break her concentration and drive her out of the mist he transformed the chakra in the wires into his toxins. They are definitely proving themselves in this match. The rest of the cages agreed with his assessment. Arena. The mist had finally dissipated and everyone could see the wires still covering the field. Shio knew she would have to get rid of the wires if she wished to engage her brother at close combat. She planted her sword in the ground and went through some hand seals, wind style, cutting breakthrough. Instead of the traditional great breakthrough, she had altered the jutsu to cut instead of push. All of the wires in the path of the jutsu were cut down. However Shio had to quickly pick her nodaki back up to block a chakra scalpel. Soon they were in a fierce contest of sword versus scalpel as they used their respective styles to try and gain an edge over the other. Menma frowned as they separated. He could not drag this fight on too long, he needed chakra for the next round. He noticed Shio did not bring back her chakra blades and assumed they took a lot of chakra to use. He glanced around at the many cut wires around the field and had to hold in a smirk. Checkmate. Shio mentally reviewed her chakra, it was about three-fourths empty, for her about enough chakra for a janin to last an entire A-rank mission. Her chakra blades were very chakra intensive so she decided not to use them to save chakra for the next match. The Uzumaki was about to attack Menma with her nodaki again before she froze, she couldn't move. She glanced around herself and saw the many wires that were littering the field wrapping around her, forming a cocoon. She looked to Menma and saw him directing them with chakra strings. She sighed. Looks like he won this round. She called out before he could complete the cocoon, Proctor, I forfeit. Genma nodded and raised his arm, winner, Menma. The crowd was a mix of cheering and booing. Which is to be expected since Konoha's golden girl lost. Menma looked around the arena and felt something heavy that he never realized was on his shoulders be removed. He had finally proved himself to everyone. He smiled while leaving the arena. In the stands. Kashina was clapping and smiling proudly for her two children. She was sad that Shio lost but proud that Menma had gotten so strong alone. Despite his style not even being remotely similar to their own she was proud, proud of the fact that he can now create his own legend outside of their shadow and prove to the world that he is strong. Kashina knew she would never be able to support him as a mother, but she would be behind him all the way, supporting him in any way she could. She continued to smile as she clapped for Menma, her forgotten son. Cage box. Rasa spoke first. Impressive, to come from the brink of defeat to use such an unconventional strategy to defeat the Uzumaki. Not many people would think to use a failed trap to ensnare their enemy. Onoki nodded. Yes he is a skilled brat, however the blonde Gaki proved her worth today as well. She managed to show the aptitude of a chunin during this fight. Minato agreed, proud for both of his children, yes, they both are definitely chunin material. Arena. After the noise from the previous match died Genma spoke up again, the next match of today will be Umi vs Gara. Umi vs Gara. Umi stood before Gara, mentally preparing for this confrontation. The genin in front of him had crippled and killed his way to this point in the competition. He wouldn't be another number added to that list. Genma raised his hand, Hajime. Moving quickly Umi took out five water scrolls and unsealed them, causing water to burst forth at Gara. Umi went through four hand seals, wave style, great tsunami. The five bursts of water converged and became a giant wave, seemingly engulfing Gara and the bottom of the arena with water. The water continued to rise until it was ten feet deep. Umi continued to go through hand seals until he clasped his hands as if in prayer and the water became choppy and stormy. He started to speed through the water, searching for the red-haired Suna Genin. He looked through the entire water but couldn't find him. Where was he? Umi's eyes widened as he dodged a meteor of sand streaking from the air into the water, seemingly homing in on him. He looked around the water and saw an eyeball in the water, staring at him. He sped towards it, dodging sand, now mud, missiles until she slashed through the eye with his trident. The sand stopped in the water and fell to the bottom, but he knew where Gara was now. He surfaced and stared into the air where Gara was standing on a platform of stand, arms crossed and staring at him. From the sky. He cursed, 
he never had guessed that Gara could fly on his sand. However, he had no access to any sand other than on his back, he had the advantage. Umi flashed through hand seals and bubbles started to rise from the water around him, lifting into the air around Gara. Only some of the Jonan in the arena could see that the bubbles were actually highly concentrated pockets of water. He went through four more hand seals, dodging small missiles of sand from Gara as he did so and the bubbles all started to swarm Gara from all directions. Gara in response surrounded himself in sand, becoming a floating orb in the sky. The bubbles of water all rammed into the ball, denting it slightly but not penetrating the hard compacted shell. In the stands, Baki stared at the floating orb and thought, the fool, he can't transform now, especially not against a non-Konoha genin. Cage stands. The dragon masked Anbu directly behind the Hokage glanced at the other guards around the cages, especially the case cage. He had planned to have the invasion a bit later but with this new development he would have to act sooner. He pressed on his right arm a bit before shifting back to his normal position, ignoring the questioning glance from the puma-masked Anbu beside him. Arena. Umi knew he needed something with piercing power and a lot of thrust to pierce that sand shield. He dove back under the water and reached the bottom and held his arm straight as water started to swirl around it. As the water gathered he thought to himself, water style, sea king's drill. He channeled the water around him to launch him out of the water at high speeds, piercing the drill directly at the orb, hitting the fleshy shoulder of the genin within. Gara started in open-eyed shock at the large wound on his shoulder. He had never been injured before. He felt himself going into shock as he muttered, blood, is this, my blood, blood, mother my blood, I am bleeding. Umi's eyes widened as he heard the voice inside the ball and jumped away quickly and jumped on top of the now calm waters. The sand ball seemed to spike in several different directions before exploding, leaving Gara standing on the water, clutching his shoulder. However before anyone could react, feathers dropped down from the sky and everyone below high Chunin level fell asleep in the arena except for a notable few genin and experienced Chunin ninja. Umi looked around, having released the genjutsu before an explosion of smoke erupted from the cage stands. Cage stands. The dragon Anbu grabbed Minato before anyone could react and dragged him up to the roof, the Suna cage's guards separated into four figures and erected a barrier around the two, trapping them inside. The Anbu chuckled darkly before removing his mask, revealing himself to be Orochimaru. In the cage box below, Rasa quickly grabbed A and Mei and Shushined away before they could react. Arena. It was chaos, Konoha's veteran Jonin and Haichunin ninjas clashed with sound and sand ninja as the invasion began. The foreign ninja that visited for the Chunin exams were unsure what to do. Arena Roof. Minato stood across from the revealed Orochimaru with a Harishin Kanai at the ready, I do not see how this trap of yours can succeed Orochimaru, I can just flash right out of this barrier. Orochimaru licked his lips and chuckled again, Kukuku, that would be true if this barrier did not prevent any foreign chakra from entering or leaving this field, your Hiroshin Kanai are useless around Konoha. Minato gritted his teeth, that may be so but I will defeat you here Orochimaru. Orochimaru would have continued but outside the barrier a large white square suddenly ate through the translucent field around the roof and Onoki floated in. The small man seemed quite ticked about something, does everyone just forget me because I'm old? The Suchikage glared at the snake, Orochimaru, S-ranked criminal in every country, number one on the most wanted list in the land of stone for illegal experiments on bloodline users including the Jintan. Onoki looked at Minato, I may not like Konoha, but I would be damned if we let such a monster slip through the cracks. Orochimaru looked darkly at the Suchikage, you would help the sworn enemy of Iwa against someone trying to do what Iwa attempted three times. Onoki lifted his hands up and a small white cube formed, I have been through three wars. I've fought Madara Uchiha and Hiroshima Senju and lived to tell the tale. I have ordered massacres and performed massacres on more people than this Gaki beside me. I did not become known as the great fence sitter for being a hypocrite. Onoki lifted himself to his full height in the air and shouted out in a voice full of power, chakra amplifying his voice, people of Iowa. Fight against the sound and sand, let's show these tree huggers how true shinobi fight in a war. Around the arena unsure Iowa shinobi felt invigorated by the voice of their Suchikage and started fighting alongside the Konoha ninja for the first time in history. Center of the arena, Mayana stood across from Rasa, preparing for the inevitable confrontation. Mei glared at the case cage, why are you doing this Rasa? 
You stand no chance against the both of us. Rasa crossed his arms and gold dust started to gather around him, that may be true normally, however I have no choice in this situation. He released a henge and revealed himself, his skin was grey as a corpse and his eyes were black. He had been resurrected by the impure world resurrection. A clenched his fist, I read reports that Tobarama created a jutsu to revive the dead, but I did not believe it. Rasa lifted his arms and the gold dust started to gather threateningly, I have no control over my actions so I will tell you this, my gold dust has no normal weaknesses to fire or other elements. The only thing that can break its defense is brute force. Mayana nodded and shouted together to the arena, Shinobi of Kirikumo, join with Konoha and Iwa in defeating the invaders. On the roof, Orochimaru glared at the arena where Konoha were fighting side by side with Kiri, Kumo, and Iwa. In none of his plans did they help Konoha. He had assumed they would be at least neutral. He had sent the resurrected Rasa to delay A and Mei from helping Minato. He had not bothered with the Suchikage because of his age. He did not assume he would be a threat. However as he looked at the large white cube in the diminutive man's hands he knew he made a mistake. Arena stands. Menma and Shio were battling some nameless sound Chunin when Kakashi flashed in, killing them all in seconds. The Cyclops turned to the two genin seriously, You two, I have an A-ranked mission for you. Your job to follow Gara and the other San Genin and stop them from unleashing their Jinchiriki, Umi and Sasuke have already began the chase, you are to act as their backup. Shio and Menma saluted and said in unison, understood, and jumped through a hole in the wall to the forest, following the chakra signatures of Gara. The battle lines were set and the invasion of Konoha had begun. Arena roof. Minato and Onoki stood and floated across from Orochimaru. They were about to engage when Orochimaru flashed through some hand seals and three coffins rose from the ground. The coffins had the letters 1, 2 and 3 in kanji. Onoki stared at the coffins, what are they supposed to be? He glanced at Minato and saw him pale, what was this jutsu? The lids of the coffins opened and Hashirama Senju, Tobarama Senju, and Hiruzen Serutobi stepped out. Onoki gapped for a second seeing his old rivals, what is this jutsu? Minato grimaced. Impure world resurrection, the blackest of fuinjutsu arts. Forcefully dragging a soul from the pure world via fuinjutsu in exchange for another soul. It is one of the worst S rank secrets of Konoha. Onoki snorted and stared at the now aware previous Hokages, HMPH, well, if they died once, they can die again. Minato shook his head, from the reports of the testing of the jutsu, they can't be killed by physical means, you either have to completely obliterate the body or remove the soul. Tobarama spoke for the first time, a Konoha shinobi fighting alongside an Iwa ninja. Now I have seen everything. Hashirama looked at Tobarama, come now Tobi. It has been nearly a century since our deaths, surely Iwa and Konoha have made peace by now right? Here is inside a bit, actually only ten years ago we ended the third great shinobi war against them. I feared relations would never recover. But I see they are starting to mend. Orochimaru chuckled. Well this is interesting but I think it is about time to get killing each other. The snake-like man produced three kanai with sealing tags attached and inserted them into Hashirama and Tobarama's heads, but before he could put it in Hiruzen, the old monkey swatted the hand away and kicked the startled Sanin away. Sarutobi jumped to the other two cages and explained to their amazed looks, a person who has given their soul to the Shinigami can only be controlled by the Shinigami. The one weakness of the impure world resurrection is if the soul is not in the pure world, they cannot be controlled upon resurrection. He continued seriously, I will distract the first and second Hokage, you two defeat Orochimaru. Minato and Onoki nodded and they separated, preparing for the battle ahead. Arena floor. The battle between the three cages was fierce in the center of the arena. A had already equipped his Raiden no Yoroi while Mei had gathered a toxic mist around herself as an armor while repeatedly sending high-powered water and lava attacks at Rasa. Rasa used his gold dust as a shield and sword, defending against the enemy's attacks while counter-attacking. He explained his moves before he used them to his contemporaries, my gold dust is slow compared to my predecessors, but heavier. Gold is one of the heaviest metals but also one of the softest. Gathered in large amounts they make a good defense but enough brute force should be able to pierce it. I do not recommend trying to channel lightning ninjutsu into my metal, gold is an excellent conductor of electricity. A nodded and charged forward full throttle and jumped high into the air over Rasa, heel drop. He yelled as he smashed into the top of the golden dome with the force of a meteor. 
The gold was smashed inward like tin foil and the rakage blasted straight through Rasa, killing any normal man. Unfortunately Rasa was still affected by the resurrection technique and soon reformed. May flashed through hand seals and her cheeks expanded and she thought, lava release, lava globs, the technique sent large balls of lava into the air before hurling themselves at the gold dust. The gold stood no chance against the molten earth and melted into liquid gold. A called across to May, keep melting his gold, even if he can regenerate he can't fight nearly as effectively without his primary weapon. The Mazukage nodded and she kept flashing through hand signs, blasting the gold dust with lava while a provided defense and protected her from any stray blasts of the heavy metal. Rasa flashed through hand signs and he seemed alarmed as he viewed his hands, you must dodge this technique, it is the technique I used to defeat the Aikibi. The technique compresses my gold dust into a large gold bar, this bar then blasts into the earth, completely flattening it. If you are caught by it, no defense will be able to protect you. The fourth case cage finishes his hand seals and calls out, Imperial Gold Coffin. A grabbed his Mizu counterpart and flashed away with great speed, breaking through the gold dust that had surrounded them to prevent them from escaping the technique. The rakage was right in time as the sand was quickly sent into the earth, creating a perfect square hole in the ground. May saw the hold and went through some hand seals and spat lava into the hole, melting all of the gold dust inside. Rasa looks at his fellow cage, congratulations, you are the first two shinobi to escape that technique, and to remove my primary weapon. Rasa takes out two daggers and wind gathered on them until they formed scimitars, don't think I made case cage for my magnet release alone. Konoha Forest. Menma and Shio were running through the forest at top speed. Shio could sense the signatures of Sasuke and the San Genin and they were rapidly gaining on them thanks to her, wind tunnel technique. Menma glanced behind him, there are six sound ninja following us. They are gaining on us so I assume they are at least high chunin. The blonde genin nodded and was about to unseal her nodaki when Menma shook his head, Sasuke and Umi stand no chance against all three of them at the same time. This isn't an enclosed arena, Umi can't use his tricks here. I will stay behind and take them. Shio wanted to argue but before she could Menma used his hair to create a web between them, I will defeat them and follow after you, go. Shio nodded and jumped off after Sasuke and Umi. When he was alone he ran through some hand seals and bit his thumb, summoning four large spiders, around the size of his head, attack on my signal. The spiders chittered and scuttled off. He extended his chakra web and felt the incoming enemies and grimaced a bit, this would be tricky. Deep Konoha Forest. Umi and Sasuke had caught up with the San Trio and were chasing them through the forest. Tamari glanced over her shoulder, we can't keep running from them, one has to be the distraction. Konkuro nodded and unwound Crow and turned to the approaching Konoha Genin and glanced at Tamari, go. The fan user nodded and jumped off. Soon after she left Umi and Sasuke landed on a branch across from him. The Tittikaler glanced at the Uchiha, you follow after the other two, I'll cover you. Sasuke nodded and jumped around the San Genin. Konkuro pulled at his chakra strings, like I would let you. Before the puppet could impact Sasuke a ball of water impeded the puppet and Konkuro had to dodge a thrust from the trident and Umi shouted, your opponent is me. Umi drew water from the area and with some hand seals he launched condensed spheres of water at Konkuro, the puppet user tried to block with Crow, but the water cannonballs blasted through the chest of the puppet and Konkuro had to dodge several more spheres of water. Konkuro grimaced at the remains of his puppet, I didn't bring more than Crow with me to Konoha, what a mistake. I never figured I would face an opponent with such mastery over an element. However he saw the head of his puppet behind Umi and had to keep a smirk off his face. Umi ran forward prepared to deal a finishing blow when the head of the crow puppet pierced his chest from behind. He was wide-eyed with shock as it pulled out and into Konkuro's hand. The Tittikaler knew he didn't have much time so he would have to use one of the techniques that earned him his title, his hands glowed green a little as he flashed through hand signs, healing spring of the mountain. A jet of water excited his hands and hit Konkuro in the chest and bounced back to him, enveloping him in the water. Konkuro flipped back onto a lower branch and held his chest. That water had hurt. However Umi should be dead by now. However before Konkuro could move he was knocked down by a sphere of water and he glanced up to see Umi fully healed. He managed to gasp painfully, H how? Umi glanced at the fallen puppet user. I earned the title Tittikaler after summoning a wave onto a battlefield that healed my allies while damaging the enemy severely enough for the Mizukage to gain an opportunity to sneak through and kill Yagura. 
I have discovered how to channel healing chakra into water jutsu. This allows me to damage my enemies while healing people I perceive as allies. Konkuro passed out and Umi began to breathe heavier. What he didn't tell Konkuro is that his healing abilities do not heal poison. Soon Umi passed out as well and fell down on the branch he was on. With Sasuke. Sasuke eventually caught up to the two Tsuna Genin but it appeared that Gara was awake and arguing with the fan user. Gara shoved Tamari away, get away from me. Tamari started to panic a bit, Gara, we have to leave, you're wounded and the Shukaku could escape. Gara shoved Tamari away with his sand and turned to the Konoha Genin, your eyes are the same as mine. My mother will savor your blood. Sasuke couldn't help but shiver at hearing the sand user's voice. It was devoid of life and utterly lost to hatred, is this the cost of fully giving oneself to hatred? Garazin rushed at Sasuke at top speed and he was forced to shunshin away to a higher branch, the tree he was on was demolished. My fire will barely dent that sand, earth trumps fire after all. I have to find a way to pierce that shield, he remembered Umi's move with the water drill, Kakashi's Chidori, and the lightning fire combo he used against Shio. He looked down at his arm as he hid behind a tree, it would be a gamble, but if the same concept applies as those three jutsu, I could replicate it for fire. Sasuke clenched his hand around his wrist and a ball of fire appeared in his palm, more, he thought as the fire started growing around his arm, scorching hot but not burning him. More, 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 he kept thinking as he held a huge ball of fire in his palm. He lifted the huge orb of fire and pointed it at Gara's back and sparked lightning chakra into it. Gara kept destroying trees as he looked for Sasuke when he felt a massive buildup of chakra behind him. He glanced behind him and widened his eyes as he saw a huge pillar of white fire hurtling towards him. Sasuke released lightning chakra into the orb and it fired out in a beam of white fire, I have no idea what it will do but, by echo. He screamed as he used up most of his chakra into his attack. Gara barely had time to react when he and the entire path of trees behind him were engulfed in the white beam of fire. When the light died down there were holes in many of the trees in a straight line, so hot it didn't even spread the fire and a sphere of glass in the center of the point of the beam. The Uchiha looked upon the scene, did I win? However before he could react the sphere of glass shattered and a deformed Gara walked out. The new Gara appeared to be half covered in sand in the form of a tanuki-like monster. Sasuke felt nothing but dread, I used up all my chakra in that one shot, I can't beat this monster. Gara laughed insanely as he looked at the Konoha Genin, that was close Uchiha. Now die already. The insane Genin launched a massive assault of sand at Sasuke. However before the sand could hit it was interrupted with a large blast of wind and Shio stood there with her nodaki over her shoulder and she struck a pose while shouting, and the hero arrives. With Menma. Menma stood in the center of a clearing with his eyes closed and hands in his pockets, waiting. After a minute he tilted his head to the side to dodge a kanai that had been sent at his head. He opened his eyes a bit and glared at the six sound ninja in the trees above him. The enemy ninja snickered as they saw him and the apparent leader spoke, Menma, Orochimaru-sama wants you alive so you have two options, you can either come quietly or come gravely wounded. Menma smirked a bit and disappeared in a cloud of smoke to the shock of the sound ninja. Before the future victims could react Menma was behind the leader and decapitated him with his chakra scalpel, I choose option 3, you die. Two of the Jonin jumped to stab him from behind but froze in midair as they were stuck in a spider's web, nothing but flies, Menma muttered as he jumped and shot both of them with his arm crossbow. He landed on the ground and cut a sword that was aiming for him with his scalpel and stuck the man's heart with his scalpel, not even looking at his victim as he ran towards the fifth ninja, going through hand seals as he did so, Doku Kansen Jutsu. And his arms grew a sickly purple and his chakra scalpel turned dark green as he struck at the sound ninja. The sound ninja blocked Menma's thrust with his arm, careful not to touch the glowing palm but started screaming as his arm grew purple and the infection started to spread. Menma barely glanced at the dying man and looked around the battlefield, searching for his sixth opponent. He felt one of his webs snap in the forest and fired three bolts in that area, but didn't hear the signature sound of an arrow hitting flesh. He continued to search for his prey, this one seems stronger than the others, he isn't rushing in blindly underestimating me because I am a genin. He saw four kanai rushing at him and he blocked them with his scalpel returning fire with his crossbow into the space where the kanai were, but once again heard nothing, he is fast, he is probably a janin. 
He felt a web break behind him and he quickly jumped out of the way, barely dodging a sound ninja who sped past, what the, that was as fast as Lee after opening the first gate. The sound ninja seemed to be a white line as he jumped around the forest around him. Menma observed the pattern of the ninja and dodged when the man rushed at him, he can't control his own speed so he has to jump around the place before being able to rush at me. There is no way this speed is natural, he must have been experimented on by Orochimaru to be this fast. Soon the man stopped jumping as he was revealed to Menma. He was a giant of a man with a huge amount of muscle mass. Menma observed the man, I was right, there is no way that someone with that amount of weight on them can be this fast naturally. He must use steroids. He glanced at the man's bulging muscles, if what I know of steroids are correct, he must use them to build up his muscle mass, increase his speed, and also I assume he used steroids to block his pain receptors. Menma took out a Sinban and waited for the man to attack, I have to time this right or I'm dead. The man crouched down in a runner's stance and sprung forward at Menma at top speed, now. He yelled and six strands of web shot from the forest behind the steroid freak and slowed him down enough for Menma to slam the Sinban down directly into the man's nerve cluster in his leg. The sound ninja's leg spasmed and he began yelling in pain and agony. Menma sighed in relief, he was right the man had never felt pain before. He was similar to Gara. any amount of pain is enough to take him out of commission. He walked up to the still crying man and walked past him while slitting his neck with his scalpel and dashed into the forest, I have to get to Shio, she can't win against Gara alone. Arena Roof Orochimaru bent out of the way of Minato and his Rasengan and dodged a white cube from Onoki. The two cages made an excellent team, Minato relentlessly attacking while Onoki provided support with his Jinten Ninjutsu. Orochimaru had already drawn his Kusanagi blade and was able to dodge most of Minato's ninjutsu. Hiruzen was doing an admirable job distacting his former senseis. The two previous Hokage seemed to have a little control to prevent them from doing their most powerful moves so Hiruzen had the advantage with his adamantine staff. Minato had spread his Hiroshin Kanai around the barrier and was relentlessly assaulting Orochimaru with his attacks, you shouldn't have come here Orochimaru, you are at a severe disadvantage. Orochimaru scowled, even if this battle is not in my favor Konoha will still fall today, the Shukaku will be released and bury this wretched city in sand. Minato smiled and thought of Shio and Menma, I have faith in the next generation to defeat your Jinchuriki. They continued to battle until they felt a dark presence behind them and they turned to see Hiruzen disintegrating along with the two Hokages, a familiar seal on his stomach. Minato's eyes widened, he used the Death Reaper seal from beyond the grave. Hiruzen seemed to struggle to talk and turned to the fourth Hokage, Minato. Dot ha, protect the will of fire of this village, I died with no regrets. I died protecting the future generations of this village. Always, believe, in, them. With those words the third Hokage died a second time and crumbled to dust, revealing the sound genin Kinsuchi. However while Minato was distracted by the Hokage, Orochimaru extended the Kusanagi and managed to cut off Minato's right arm. In spite of this Onoki had already sent a Jinten beam of light at Orochimaru, disintegrating the snake Sanin's arms to dust. Orochimaru screamed in rage, lower the barrier, retreat. Onoki was prepared to give chase but the Sanin had already retreated in a reverse summoning ninjutsu. The Suchikage turned to the Hokage and saw him bandaging his arm assisted by the Anbu who were watching outside of the barrier. He looked down upon the arena and saw that the other two cage were wrapping up their fight as well. In the arena, Rasa had used up all of his kanai and shuriken and Ace shouted to Mei, Mei, disintegrate him. Do not let him regenerate. Mei nodded and flashed through some hand signs, lava style, disintegrating sinkhole. She punched the ground and underneath Rasa the earth turned to lava and the former K's cage was disintegrated in lava. The two cage looked around the arena and saw most of the battles over, the brief alliance between villages had defeated the sand and sound. However before anyone could do anything far in the distance the shape of Shukaku could be seen. Onoki floated down and shouted to his ninja, everyone, gather a squad and come with me to take care of the biju. The other cage did the same and they rushed to the biju, hoping they were not too late to save the genin fighting the beast. In the forest, Shio stood on a branch staring at the massive form of the Shukaku. She had defeated his first form by spamming shadow clones and hitting him in the ass with an explosive note but not it looked like she could use some help. Menma landed next to her, I see he has released the biju, we should work together with our summons to defeat it. 
Shio nodded and they both flashed through hand signs, summoning jutsu. In twin massive clouds of smoke a large red toad and a giant black widow spider appeared. Gamabunta glanced at his opponent and ally in this battle and spoke, Shukaku ha. Been a while since I fought a biju. And to think I would be fighting one alongside the spider clan. The black widow spider spoke in an echoing chittering voice, likewise toad, I, the second in command of the spider clan Akraya, will show the world the might of the spider clan. Gara on top of the Shukaku laughed and spoke madly, mother will have your blood Uzumaki, Menma. The mad Suna Genin ran though some hand seals, sleeping possum jutsu. Gara fell asleep and the Shukaku was fully released from the seal, woohoo. I am free baby. The San Tanuki looked at his opponents, and I already have people in front of me to kill, talk about service. Akraya arched her back and prepared to fight the biju, you shall be the one to perish here Tanuki. Gamabunta drew his giant tonto, I won't get shown up by yesterday's dinner, you're going down sand rat. With those words the three titans fought fiercely. Akraya using her acid to support Gamabunta's water attacks and both of them using their abilities to counter Shukaku's wild swings and wind jutsus. Eventually after fighting a titanic battle and reshaping the landscape, Gamabunta ran forward and Shio transformed the giant toad into the Kayubi. Shio jumped off of Gamabunta and ran up the Shukaku's head, trying to reach the Suna Genin. As she neared Gara San sprang up to stop her but each was blasted by a chakra-covered arrow. Menma stood on the head of his summon with his large crossbow and called out, Go Shio. End this. Shio nodded and dodged more sand until she headbutted Gara and they Shukaku cracked and fell apart and the two genin landed on ground, both summons disappearing into clouds of smoke as they fell. Menma arrived to hear the end of the conversation about fighting to protect one's loved ones by Shio and jumped down next to her to show his support. Gara looked contemplative as he was carried off by the other two sand ninja. Menma sighed and collapsed back to back with Shio. Shio laughed softly, rough day at work huh? Menma snorted, I could have worked a few more hours. Shio smiled and nodded, I'm sure. They were silent for a few moments before Shio spoke up again, you really worried me with that stunt with the sound ninja. You shouldn't risk yourself so needlessly like that. Menma was silent for a few moments, it was a necessary risk, you were better equipped to help Sasuke and Umi with your faster speed and I am better against multiple opponents. It was logical. Shio sighed, I don't mean it like that. I was worried about you. Not the logic of the situation. Menma was surprised at that, we have only known each other for a short time. I do not see why you would be worried about my safety. Shio sighed exasperated and turned the spider summoner around, it doesn't matter that we haven't truly known each other for long. We may not be family anymore, but I still love you, maybe not as a brother but as a friend. You are one of my precious people and I want you to remain safe. Menma was speechless but before he could respond a bunch of ninja jumped around them. The two genin were relieved to see a bunch of leaf headbands among the ninja. The cages stepped forward and Minato, with a bandaged stump for his right arm spoke first, Shio. Menma, what happened here? Menma and Shio looked around the area, large patches of sand, broken trees, huge ponds of water, acid eating away at some trees and both turned around and Shio rubbed the back of her head sheepishly, well, it is a long story.